Up next, we take you to the U.S. Capitol for today's hearing of the House Rules Committee. The panel met to determine the guidelines for floor debate on H.R. 776, the National Energy Policy Bill, which is expected to be debated on the House floor later this week. The energy bill was passed by the House Energy and Commerce Committee in March, but in the last two months, eight other House panels have revised that measure. More than 40 members of the House were scheduled to testify about those revisions and about the amendments they'd like to introduce on the House floor. The committee chairman is Congressman Joseph Moakley, Democrat from Massachusetts. Any objection? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Right to object. And uh, I do so simply to uh, ask of my uh, friend of Texas. The mission has not been given the cameras at all until we describe it. Excuse me? All right. Is there an objection? I'm reserving the right to object. Gentlemen from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do so simply to ask of my friend of Texas, uh, Mr. Frost, whether or not he, he believes that this bill is more or less technical than the line item veto um, issue that we were debating. Mr. Chairman, I do make a point of order. The cameras are on and the commission has not been received. Gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, I, I withdraw my reservation. I withdraw my reservation. Without objection. So ordered. Uh, all the, the cameras will be allowed. Uh, the sound is on in all these microphones, and uh, we're ready to proceed. The subject matter before us is H.R. 776, uh, Comprehensive National Energy and Policy Act from the Committees on Energy and Commerce, Agriculture, Foreign Affairs, Government Operations, Judiciary, Interior and Insular Affairs, Merchant Marine and Fisheries, Public Works and Transportation, Science, Space and Technology, and Ways and Means. And, uh, where are our witnesses? Well, the, the committee would be glad to hear from, uh, Mr. M Mr. Uh, Scheuer. <coughs> the committee will operate under the five minute rule because there's over 50 people going to testify today. I oh, I see Norm Lent just come in. Uh, so Norm and I would think you'd... Is Dingle here? Um... Is John Dingle here? Anything sure new? You have to step aside. Yeah, Jim, I think you may have to step aside because he's... Pardon? He's on the main committee on the NEC and Commerce. As I am. Which Are you I too? Yeah. I'm ranking member of NEC and Commerce. I'd be happy to yield to my colleague to avoid any further discussion of the matter. Where's Mr. Dingle? Yeah, Mr. Dingle is on his way anyway, so. All right. Mr. Lent. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would ask uh, unanimous consent that the uh, 
I would ask Mr. Chairman unanimous consent that my statement be included in the record in its entirety. Without objection, the gentleman's entire statement will appear on the record. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm pleased to join with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle today to support H.R. 776, the Comprehensive National Energy Policy Act, and to urge that this legislation be brought to the House floor under a fair rule that preserves the good bill passed by our committee and promotes its enactment. I want to emphasize a point that rules ought to protect the good bill that was produced, and to that end, the Rules Committee should make H.R. 776, as reported by our committee, the vehicle for floor consideration. Matters that are within the jurisdiction of the Energy and Commerce Committee, but were in many cases deliberately not acted on, ought not to be included as original text. I'm referring now specifically to the Interior Committee's titles on nuclear power plant licensing reform and low-level radioactive waste, which I understand Chairman Miller of Interior would like to make original text. If the Rules Committee honors Mr. Miller's request, it will have a very chilling effect, in my opinion, on the passage of the legislation. It will mean that whenever two committees share jurisdiction, the second committee can insert into the first committee's bill provisions which are jurisdictionally uh, jurisdictional to both committees, but not acted on by the first committee. Uh, for example, if we took the converse of today's situation, energy and commerce, by acting on uranium enrichment legislation, could have inserted that legislation into an Interior Committee nuclear bill, despite Interior Committee's lack of action on uranium enrichment and despite Interior Committee's opposition to the energy and commerce legislation. In other words, this is a hostile act and should not be permitted by Rules Committee. Second, I believe that the rules, that the Interior Committee should definitely not get special treatment in this in energy bill. The Interior Committee majority has gone out of its way to act in a partisan manner, culminating in their request at one point that the Republican staff be excluded from the committee staff negotiations. No other committee majority took this position. The Speaker and Chairman Dingell opposed this request, and the negotiations uh, then proceeded productively. The Rules Committee, I would request, should follow this lead and continue to treat the Energy and Commerce Committee bill as original text. Interior Committee should have to offer its changes in nuclear energy policy as amendments on the floor so that all members get a chance to decide what America's nuclear energy policy should be, not just the majority members of the Interior Committee. John. John. One uh, additional point, I would urge that the committee adopt a rule that allows the Clement Barton Bill, H.R. 4488, Nuclear Reacting Licensing Act of 1992, to be considered as a substitute or as an amendment to the Interior Nuclear Amendment. The Clement Barton Bill has over 150 co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle and would re revitalize the nuclear energy option. While Mr. Miller's proposed amendment to H.R. 776 would take us backward to a case-by-case -case trial and error uh, licensing process. Clement Barton, on the other hand, would move us forward to a safe, standardized nuclear power plant design. I would also urge the committee to adopt a rule that would allow the Rostenkowski Amendment to strike the Strategic Petroleum Reserve set-aside fee. Despite assertions to the contrary, and I very seldom disagree with my chairman on something this important, but this, uh, this fee is a tax. Uh, moreover, this is a tax which will cost the U.S. economy a billion dollars and approximately 45,000 jobs. The Ways and Means Committee, I think, properly recognized this set-aside fee as a tax and struck it. Now full House action should be allowed on this issue. I would urge against a rule allowing a Miller Amendment to uh, limit 
presidential review of proposed agency regulations. This provision is a serious infringement of the President's authority. The President has already stated in a letter to the Speaker dated April 20th that this would cause a veto uh, <coughs> on this particular bill. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me say in conclusion, I'm uh, proud of the role that our President and House Republicans have taken in working to develop the comprehensive energy strategy before us today. Enactment of this legislation, along with passage of the Clement Barton Amendment, will move America forward toward a stronger and more efficient and cleaner energy future. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, since, since, uh, Chairman Dingell is here, I, I would think the Chairman would... I, I've offered to right, thank yield you. to Chairman. Mr. Lent, don't leave. Yeah, can we keep... Uh, I, he would, I'll just, Mr. I'll Lent, you can stay up there, sir. Mr. 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 Chairman, can we just have a point of order here? Uh, okay. We, we want to be able to ask questions of both the Chairman and the uh, exactly. ranking member. That's, that's okay. what the Chair intended. I, I think, it, uh, with, with, with respect, I think we're well at Chairman Dingell. I think you're right. Because I'm addressing myself to an amendment to the energy I, I think bill. The gentleman, he can speak. The gentleman shows great wisdom. <laughs> That's what we're trying to Especially when the chairman's looking over his shoulder. Mr. Chairman, could we have uh, Mr. Sharp up at the table? Absolutely. He is the subcommittee Mr. chairman, and, and it is his responsibility to let the record well that I yield. The legislation on the floor, and it would be immensely helpful to us. I think if, we'll if join he were here, and it would save the time. Who, who is his counterpart? Uh, the ranking member, um, Mr. Moorhead's here, and, and and I'd be delighted to have Mr. Moorhead here. Sure. Certainly, well, certainly, yeah. no, certainly no complaint to have him uh, before us. Nice. In fact, uh, if you got one more, why don't we just move down there? <laughs> <laughs> we. Uh, <laughs> Our purpose, our purpose today is to minimize the controversy and, and, to, and to help get a bill to the floor in the most expeditious fashion in a way that, it, that the matter can be uh, handled speedily. It would be my hope we could do it in a way which would permit us to complete the handling of this bill before we go home for the Memorial Day recess. And that is, and that is with the guidance and the assistance of this committee, a real possibility. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I, I thank you for the privilege of appearing here today in support of a rule for the consideration of H.R. 776, the Comprehensive National Energy Policy Act that was reported from the Energy and Commerce Committee on March 30, 1992. Uh, I think at this time, it would be proper for me to commend the entire committee. The subcommittee chairman, Mr. Sharp, and the ranking minority members on the uh, committee and the subcommittee, my friend Norman Lent and my friend Carlos Moorhead, for their extraordinary efforts and remarkable cooperation in bringing this legislation uh, to the point where it is today. The subcommittee began its hearings in January last year. And from that time until June, held more than 20 days of hearings and eight days of markup, culminating in an October 31 uh, completion of the bill uh, reported by the subcommittee with a vote of 21 to 1. The subcommittee's efforts proved remarkable because they enabled the full committee to consider the bill in one day and report it out in a bipartisan fashion with a vote of 42 to 1. So good work has been done in terms of narrowing the controversy. We now need your assistance in narrowing those controversies still further. Since then, the Speaker has referred the bill sequentially to nine other committees, eight of which have filed their reports earlier this month. The prior reference to this bill was, of course, solely to the Committee on Energy and Commerce. At the urging of the Speaker and my good friend and colleague, Mr. Butler Derrick, the, uh, the sequential committees and our committee have worked vigorously uh, both last week and over the weekend to resolve our differences and to help speed floor consideration. The effort has been fruitful and, and has, made a major effort, uh, has made a major success in terms of simplifying the complicated procedural problems which affront us. Uh, as we have been able to reach many agreements, all of which propose for inclusion in our committee's amendment to H.R. 776 as the original text, and we have come to agreement with a large number of committees on many, on many difficult issues and have only just a few remaining which uh, you have to address in terms of the differences which exist between the several committees. The aim, as I have mentioned to you before, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, is to facilitate the process and to help ensure passage of an energy bill in this Congress. And quite frankly, one on which the Congress can agree, one which can be dealt with in an expeditious fashion, and very frankly, one which the President can sign. I would therefore request that the only text of the amendment as reported by the Committee on Energy and Commerce with the provisions worked out by an agreement with the sequential committees be made in order as an original text. Uh, 
and that that text be considered as uh, considered by title for purposes of amendment with the exceptions indicated in the attachment to my letter to you of May 18th. Mr. Chairman, I request that the rule provide that the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is the lead committee on this legislation, have one hour for general debate, and that each of the sequential committees have one half hour for the same purpose. Now, I would stress that this time would be divided equally between the chairman and the ranking minority member in each case, as is the ordinary practice of the House. To the extent that the substantive agreement on a matter has not been reached with a sequential committee, I request a regular order that allows that a sequential committee's amendment, as reported by that committee, if germane to the text of our committee's amendment, and I stress, if germane to the text of our committee's amendment to H.R. 776, and within the jurisdiction of that committee, uh, be made in order under a five-minute rule. I also ask that our committee's majority or m minority floor managers be permitted the opportunity to offer amendments thereto if we so choose. Uh, I think the reason is, is, is clear to, to all of you that that would enable us to perhaps negotiate and possibly to come to agreement with other committees or other members who were offering amendments uh, pursuant to these matters and sort of work things out so that the process could move more speedily and more harmoniously. I reiterate this request for an amendment opportunity is made because some of the reported provisions uh, which have uh, now surfaced have never been considered by the Committee on Energy and Commerce, either originally or sequentially, even though our committee shares jurisdiction on these matters. These amendments, which uh, include matters within our jurisdiction and which were never considered by our committee, should not be made a part of the original text. With respect to the floor amendments sought by individual members, uh, through the guidance of, of Mr. Derrick, uh, the notice was sent out that, that those amendments had to be printed uh, by last Friday. And I uh, note that uh, more than 150 amendments have been filed within this, this time limit. I urge you not to make in order any amendments which are not germane to a title. I see no reason why anyone should, should get authorization of this committee to add complexity and to get around the germaneness rule uh, in, in a situation which is already as difficult from a procedural standpoint as this happens to be. Uh, and, is, and also not to afford such waivers in any instances where they are not germane to the title, which they would have meant. Quite frankly, uh, Mr. Chairman and gentlemen of the committee and ladies, it is my hope that you will limit the number of amendments which can be offered. Uh, members of the committees that considered H.R. 776 should have to follow the regular order and should not be permitted to offer on the floor any amendment within the jurisdiction of that committee if they were never offered uh, in that committee or before our committee or before any of the sequential subcommittees or committees. Mr. Chairman, I am concerned about the extent to which your committee may include as original text provision from the sequential committees that are entirely within their jurisdiction or provisions where the jurisdiction is shared by them with our committee. I am concerned that there may be, uh, that some may be treating this process as if the bill had been referred jointly to all the committees and these committees are now free to add anything that they want within their jurisdiction. Uh, that is not consistent with the understandings which were reached a few days ago in the office of the Speaker when we discussed that matter with him, all the committee chairmen, uh, or with the theory underlying sequential referral by titles that the Speaker made on this particular bill. And there are such amendments floating around which will add enormous controversy, confer little amendments, a uh, little benefit, and can be offered separately as separate legislation by the Committee of Jurisdiction. In this regard, I request that some provisions which were apparently added to the original text at the insistence of the Interior Committee over the weekend, uh, provisions from Title VIII of the Interior's Committee's reported amendments, not be made a part of the original text. Uh, they are not germane to the bill uh, uh, or to the Energy and Commerce Committee reported amendment to H.R. 776. They are not within the jurisdiction of the Committee on Energy and Commerce. They are not in the Senate passed bill. The provisions are not related to energy. And most importantly, neither I, Mr. Sharp, nor our committee have agreed to either including these uh, substantively non-germane amendments and uh, 
I would note that they are amendments which not only are non-germane, but that they would significantly complicate the handling of this legislation and would add great difficulties to the handling of the bill in conference. Other committees did not have the opportunity to include matters on which there was no agreement. Uh, it is my understanding from discussions with the Speaker, with Mr. Derrick, who ably represented you, Mr. Chairman, that matters, on, uh, that matters on which there was agreement by the committees, including this committee, would be added as an original text to our amendment to H.R. 776. I applaud that, and I continue to support that view. As to matters on which there was no agreement between the committees, my understanding is that a decision was reserved pending the outcome of negotiations. The whole impetus for reaching agreement in these negotiations was the implication that the provisions as to which there was no agreement would not receive a free pass to the floor. The purpose of this, clearly, was to simplify the process, see to it that we have made it more, uh, more possible and more certain to ultimately overcome the different challenges, the difficult challenges of presenting the Speaker and that he could send to the Senate and send us to conference with and present ultimately to the President a package which he could adopt as an energy bill which meets his concern and which meets the concerns of the Congress. Now, uh, if, the, if it had not been the case that if there were no agreement that, that amendments would not receive a free pass to the floor, why was it that we uh, negotiated or were called upon to negotiate? I therefore request that the rule not include in the original text matters where agreement amongst at least some of the affected committees and our committee is lacking. And I refer very specifically to ones which I find most difficult to accept under that particular uh, understanding. I want to stress that our committee is the lead committee on the legislation, that we reported out a bill that can become law, can pass the Congress, and can be signed by the President. We appreciate the magnitude of the task that's been laid before you, and we will continue to work with you in an effort to simplify and expedite the consideration of this bill on the floor. I also appreciate the cooperation that, that our committee and I have received from your staff in preparing this difficult legislation for the House floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Phil Scott of Indiana. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll just try to take a few minutes. I first want to thank you folks for focusing on what we understand is procedurally very complex, uh, not to mention the substance behind the various proposals. And then secondly, to thank my chairman, Mr. Dingle, and Mr. Lent and Mr. Moorhead, who all of whom worked very, very diligently over the last year uh, and I must say we had uh, great bipartisan support on our committee in working out some very thorny issues. We have a few differences, but uh, we have a number of very important things. Indeed, you have very little criticism before you and very few amendments on some of the most important parts of this bill. And I just want to fast say that because I'm afraid that your discussion, the House discussion, and the media discussion will only focus, uh, as a, is necessary, on uh, these differences, missing the fact that we have very significant conservation efficiency proposals in this legislation on which we have very broad base agreement, and that's going to be very positive for the country. Secondly, we make some very significant changes in the, uh, the regulatory system of our electric utility industry. We believe this will bring about new competition, new opportunities uh, for consumers and for the production of uh, and distribution of electricity in this country. Uh, and third, we have very significant provisions to help stimulate the market for alternative fuels to gasoline. Uh, and, uh, and this is going to be uh, very important from an energy and environmental and an economic perspective. These are not in high contention before you or, or the uh, House floor. I would just uh, mention two other items before we uh, take your questions and suggestions, Mr. Chairman. But one is that uh, I hope you will try to uh, follow rules of germaneness. All of these issues are complex for members to deal with, and uh, it becomes more difficult and more complex when people are confronted with issues that had no committee uh, consideration, and certainly not by the committees of jurisdiction, Republican or Democrats have had an opportunity, and not had an opportunity in that case to truly analyze them. Uh, secondly, um, I would urge you to accept in the original uh, text uh, a, a compromise agreement that we've worked out between uh, uh, Interior and uh, Commerce Committee on the Uranium Enrichment uh, title. All the Uranium Enrichment, you must realize, deals with is who's going to foot the bill. And the law has been very clear on this for years, that the users of the domestic, the civilian power plants that use this 
federally generated uh, source of power uh, have to pay the full freight of it. And uh, while there are some arguments over to how to allocate that cost, that fundamental principle is there. And that fundamental principle could be lost if we do not make it clear that the nuclear uh, utilities in this country must pay a share of the cleanup costs. If they don't, you and I and others will have to vote the appropriations over the next five and ten years, and we all know financially what the situation of the federal government is, and we're about to vote for a constitutional uh, balancing the budget amendment, which is going to uh, uh, make that even more difficult to, uh, to pay those bills. And so I would strongly urge that we've worked out this agreement. It takes into account uh, some major provisions the uh, Ways and Means Committee offered. The two committees of principal jurisdiction over uh, uranium enrichment are the Interior and the Commerce uh, Committee. With that, Mr. Chairman, I uh, wish you well in your endeavors. Thank you very much, Mr. Shaw. The Honorable Carlos Moorhead of California. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would first like to say that uh, the minority, Norm Lent and I, are totally in agreement with the statement that was made by our chairman, John Dingle, and the statement that was made by uh, our subcommittee chairman, Phil Sharp. We've worked very closely together on this bill. Uh, it's a bill that was uh, virtually unanimously supported by our committee. We believe we have a bill that can get the, uh, the president's signature on when it comes to him. We believe that we have one that we can work out the differences with the Senate on very easily, and we'll be able to get a bill that's passed into law. We think this is a very, very important piece of legislation as far as the country is concerned. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you. Uh, I think that uh, we need to move forward rapidly on this legislation designed to increase America's energy independence and competitiveness, create jobs, and fuel the economic growth of the country. As reported by the Energy and Commerce Committee is, I believe, a model of effective bipartisan cooperation and compromise. Members and staff reached across the aisle in our committee to cooperatively and almost unanimously develop legislation uh, which will reduce energy demand through improved efficiency standards and integrated resource planning. One thing we're concerned about is that many of these amendments that are being offered by other committees uh, reach into the Energy and Commerce Committee jurisdiction and make it much more complicated and much more difficult to get legislation adopted by the full Congress and uh, by, by the, uh, uh, the committee between the House and the Senate, uh, which will be formed later. Uh, I think that it's important that in those areas where uh, we have jurisdiction in the Energy and Commerce Committee, that the Energy Com and Commerce Bill is the bill that is presented to the Congress and other amendments may be offered, but uh, unless they're, uh, they're within their own jurisdiction, uh, I think they should be considered in, in that manner and uh, uh, rejected. Uh, I firmly support the, uh, the amendment that is being offered by Mr. Barton and Mr. Clement uh, to H.R. 4488, uh, which is an amendment that I think will make the, mo the nuclear licensing process one that can work and encourages standardization of plant design. Without such an amendment, it would be very, very difficult as we move down the line to ever get a, a nuclear plant authorized in this country. Uh, one of the, all of these measures, I believe, will help enhance America's competitiveness and energy independence. And working together, I think we can get a bill that will really help our country. And once again, I want to compliment uh, Phil Sharp as the chairman of the subcommittee, John Dingle, who did a tremendous job in the full committee in getting this bill through, and certainly Norm Lent, who has been a, a, a great um, part of this action all the way through and has done a marvelous job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to commend all of you for, for getting this far with it. And, and you know, although there are some a uh, number of controversial issues that have not been settled at this point. Uh, many, many of them have been settled, and I thank all of you, together with the other committees, for sitting down and working. Let me ask you a couple of uh, questions. On the uh, <coughs> nuclear uh, licensing uh, provision uh, and the Clement uh, Barton uh, Amendment, 
Uh, there is some talk, I don't know whether it's true or not, that we're, we're trying to reach an agreement where uh, the uh, interior provision on licensing would be withdrawn provided Clement Barton were not made a part of the uh, original text. Can you repeat that? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, there is, and I don't, I don't know that this to be entirely true, but I, I think so, that uh, the Interior Committee's uh, provisions on uh, nuclear licensing uh, would be uh, withdrawn provided that the Clement Barton Amendment were made a part of the original text. Uh, of you mean that neither would be offered? No, no, I do not mean neither would be offered. What I mean is that uh, the Interior would not be offered. Well, that's right. Neither would be offered, but uh, the, the converse of that is there are certainly a, uh, many of us, and I'm one of those that feel that Clement Barton, whether the interior is offered or not, should be a part of the uh, original text. And I'd like to know how you might feel about that. I, I think that's in some variance with my understanding, but I think Mr. Sharp can address the matter. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, I don't think Clement Barton uh, under any scenario would have standing as part of the original text since it was not considered in any committee. Or at least uh, uh, make it in order. Then. You mean make it in order right. to be offered I, I as, an amendment. As, as an amendment? As an amendment. I, I as an amendment. I misspoke. I misspoke. I'm sorry. You're correct. Mr. I, I, I'd have, I think, I think Mr. Sharp and I would have no objection to it being made in order as an amendment. But not, having it, but not have it made in order as part of the original text. And I, I, I'm not sure that, that that could be sold, even if I were in favor of that view. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to comment. Uh, that was not offered in, in the in Commerce Committee. It had two opportunities, and, and Mr. Barton did indicate he might want to offer it on the House floor, so this does not come as a surprise uh, uh, that this is an issue. Uh, but I might, I, I'd just like to quickly indicate that what has happened, as I understand it, at this point is that amendment simply takes up what the Senate did, and therefore finalizes the, the Senate action. I don't think that's either procedurally or substantively a good thing to do at this point. I believe the licensing system must be fundamentally changed. It has been fundamentally changed by the NRC, and what we're dealing with is one of the remaining issues as to whether or not there'll be an opportunity at the end of the process to raise serious safety issues before you contaminate the plant. That's what the remaining issues on the table is. How to define what's a serious issue and what are the procedures that will be used at that point. This is significantly different, and I support it being different, than the current system which all issues could be raised again at the end. And that's been a, a serious uh, and uh, a problem in the process. Uh, so I think we, we're, we're talking about something that's pretty narrow, but well, the, the, of course, issue, as, I, as, I, as you I'm stated, not, the uh, the objective of those who uh, support the Clement Barton would be to lock it in for, for conference. Right. And, well, no, that locks it into the law. Uh, it will be in the conference no matter what. Whether yeah, Clement but it Barton, would lock it into the house uh, house version right. of the conference, and, and so it couldn't be changed. I mean, the, you that's right. Go there could be no change. Parameters. But I'd suggest to you that the Senate uh, didn't come to this particular language after long and lengthy consideration. They they had to go through some very quick final negotiations, and they came up with this. And and what's being locked in is not something that. Uh, I, I think the normal course of events, you would want to have more sort of thorough discussion of it. Well, I'm, I understand there are about 240 members of the House who have agreed to support uh, that Clement Barton. I'm not no, sure. I, I think it's more like 150, I think. <laughs> Maybe they think they have 240 votes now, I doubt it. Well, uh, <laughs> I think you'd be surprised. I can't believe it'll be 240. Okay. Um, I, I would like to reserve the right to ask maybe another question later, but that's all I have right now. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, let me just commend these. Let me commend these four gentlemen for the fine work that they do, and um, and say that I'm I'm a little concerned uh, at what's happening here. Uh, I I foresee the the results of what will come out of this committee as being a a replay of what we went through last year with the uh, with the so-called banking reforms, uh, in which case we ended up with nothing. And my good friend Mr. Dingle said that uh, his committee is the lead committee. You're not only the lead committee; you are the committee, and you should be the committee. And I don't know what all these other nine committees are doing in here. Here is a 1,300-page bill, accomplished, uh, accompanied by hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of reports. And uh, uh, this committee is being asked, Mr. Chairman, to 
to do what we did with the banking bill, to rewrite the whole uh, energy bill. And that's wrong. That's not what we're here for. You know, the difference between us and the Senate is, and the reason that traditionally over the years we've produced excellent legislation coming out of your committee, out of the Foreign Affairs Committee, is because we have rules that we operate under. We are, uh, there are four times more uh, members of, of the House of Representatives than there are senators. Yet we operate under germaneness rules. And that's why we are so much more credible than the Senate. They produce trash over there. And usually we have to go to conference and, and clean it up. Right, Mr. Dingle? And, and it's because... <laughs> I, I yeah. want you be <laughs> but, um, but, but I will say there's enormous merit to your position. I, 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 I thank, thank the chairman. And uh, uh, this just leads me, Mr. Chairman, to a uh, hearing we're going to hold in this committee uh, tomorrow on, uh, on the Hamilton Gratison uh, congressional reform legislation. And if there's anything points up a need for it, other than what we did back in 1974 with that unbelievable budget reform act that we passed, uh, which has gridlocked this Congress for years now, it's this situation here. So l let me just, for example, uh, read the, the, uh, a phrase from the administration's statement, which I will submit for the record. With your permission, Mr. Sim. But uh, it says the president will veto this bill uh, if the bill contains, and this has to do with all of these other committees that got involved in your bill. It says uh, he will veto it if the bill <laughs> contains the imposition of new provisions, which would, uh, are, are uh, the imposition of new taxes, the imposition of inflexible and burdensome regulatory review procedures, provisions that would effectively prevent the construction and relicensing of nuclear power plants, restrictions on oil and gas development on the outer continental shelf, mandating market shares for certain fuels, and limiting the greenhouse gas emission levels. If these provisions are included, added to your bill, the bill will be vetoed. So what are we going to do? We're going to spend two or three days we're wasting everybody's time here and we'll be right back where we started like we did with the bank bill. So uh, I have a lot of other questions to ask too and maybe I'll reserve the right while you're here. But um, you did a good job. You did a great job and we ought to be considering your bill and hopefully we will only make an order germane amendments from whoever from these other committees want to offer them and let's deal with the subject of energy of your committee. So um, I salute you for the job you've done and I hope we come out with a product that will uphold your end of it. Thank you. Thank you. Could, Thank I, you could, I, could I just briefly respond? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. First of all, Mr. Solomon, you and I have been good friends, as you know, for a long, long time. You have great respect from me and great affection. And I thank you for your kind comments. We have sought to present you a responsible bill. And I'm, I'm saying Mr. Sharp and Mr. Moorhead in the subcommittee did a superb job. Mr. Glenn and I were able to help a bit in the full committee. And we have tried to present you with a process and procedure, which we've suggested to you, which I believe will come up with the best both procedural results and substitute results. And it will give us a chance to get a bill. Uh, we have, a, on, on our committee, as you know, we have a history of, of taking nasty, difficult questions uh, and, and working them out, both on the House floor and, and in the conference. And I think that the suggestion we've made about negotiating out the, the differences amongst the several committees not only will make your task easier in this matter, but will also expedite the process significantly so that we won't have as much aggravation on the floor. And you won't have quite so much aggravation in terms of dealing with the difficult questions that, 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 you're going to, that we are all going to confront individually and separately. Now, Mr. Solomon has, has commented on, on the fact that the House has rules. Thank God we have the rules, but thank God we also have the Rules Committee to help us see to it that we get an opportunity to function under a rational and an intelligent procedure when we get the bill to the floor. Now, we have presented you here in, in, in the options before you, not the nicest uh, from your standpoint. You have some difficult issues that you're going to have to confront. But, the, but, you, but you can in carrying out that difficult responsibility, give us uh, on the House floor, and I'm speaking now for the membership in total, 
an opportunity to consider a bill under, in, in a way which I think will be fair. And I think if you look at the at the agreements that we have arrived at in the other committee, they, with the other committees, they do neither neither jurisdictional violence to the to, to us, nor do they do substantive <coughs> violence to the bill or make it obnoxious. I think from the standpoint either of our colleagues on on the minority side, or quite frankly from from, from the majority side. Now we haven't included everything that a lot of enthusiastic members would like to have in this bill, uh, and perhaps you should thank us for that. Uh, and, and we will thank you when you exclude it uh, and exclude some of those things which are going to have an enormously mischievous consequence both from the standpoint of our relationship with the administration but also quite frankly from the standpoint of the, of the substantive quality of the legislation. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bielinson. Thank you Mr. Chairman. You all have done obviously a very thoughtful and good job with a very complex piece of legislation and I joined with my colleagues here already have commended you for your obviously good work on it. Let me just ask two or three little questions about one particular area. Well, an area which you yourself, Mr. Chairman, both the Chairman and Ranking Members, in your report uh, refer to as our nation's largest oil problem area. The nearly 200 million cars and trucks on U.S. highways that each day consume a volume of fuel equaling all our oil imports, or about one-seventh of the entire world's oil production. My, my questions really just have to have to do, as I said, with respect to that particular area, which is a big problem area and obviously a very difficult one for us to, for, to, to deal with. Um, try to elicit from you whether or not our response to that particular very large area has been strong enough. Uh, first of all, you speak of, and, and, the, and the bill, as I understand it, sets a goal of 10 percent alternative fuel use in automobiles by the year. 2000, I think it is. Uh, is that stringent enough? Is it strong enough? Or is it simply a goal, Mr. Sharp? I mean, do we, is there any enforcement there? Does it, or is it simply something we're aiming at? Well, first of all, there are several mandatory provisions. Uh, all of the fuel providers in this country will have to have their own... You could push your little button. Uh, sorry. Um, There it goes. Uh, now we don't have anything. First of all, the goal of 10 percent then and 30 percent by the year 20, uh, uh, 2020 is in, um, I mean, I'm sorry, it's 30 percent by the year 2010, yes. I believe. I've forgotten the exact date. But uh, is a goal which the administration could come up with proposals to help insist that we meet uh, if we fail to meet it and we would have to reconsider in Congress because to meet that goal would require all kinds of mandatory interventions in the marketplace that very frankly most people are uncertain what will work and which fuels we ought to really be focused on. We have tried to leave this reasonably fuel neutral. Some people are going to go with uh, compressed natural gas, some with ethanol, some with methanol. Uh, they're going to be alternative, uh, electric vehicles is going to be a very important part of what we're doing here. The most important thing I think is the uh, fleet mandate on fuel providers. People who provide fuel in this society are going to have to have their own vehicles fueled by an alternative fuel. Probably electric utilities will use electric vehicles where they can, and the oil companies, uh, uh, natural gas powered vehicles where they can, that sort of thing. Uh, this is the, the mandatory part of the bill, not to mention the federal uh, fleet mandate. What, what happens? Uh, none of us can guarantee that will happen. If, they, if it looks like we're not reaching that goal, the administration does have to go through a rulemaking activity, does have to come up with very explicit proposals and submit them to Congress, but we would have another vote in the Congress before we embark finally on, uh, for example, uh, fleet requirements on all private fleets in the country. That's one. Uh, but if it becomes theory. pretty obvious sometime, perhaps shortly before the year 2000, that we're not going to meet even our 10 percent goal, the administration in power at that time is required to respond in some way, uh, and then, then we ourselves will. I think they have to, they actually have to be, report back to us on a regular basis as to whether or not we're meeting that goal. Uh, uh, Okay. I think you answered my second much, question. Much of this is sure. going to be driven, frankly, by environmental concerns. For environmental concerns in Los Angeles, in New York, and in Houston, uh, where you folks are requiring the, uh, the uh, emission-free vehicles, that's going to push electric vehicles stronger than we probably are in our legislation. We're trying to make everything here compatible with those state initiatives in Texas on compressed natural gas, for example, uh, in trying to accelerate But, you're not, but you're, you're not making the choices. You're allowing whatever... 
We are leaving a reasonable amount of choice. The market to, to make those That's choices correct. for us. We cannot get you, substantive agreement among people, and we certainly can't get political agreement about picking a replacement fuel. In other words, picking natural gas, some would love to, or picking ethanol, or picking methanol. There are different characteristics or electricity of these fuels, and uh, I think you'll have a very hard time finding uh, more than uh, sort of the fuel provider of that particular fuel but, who could but, agree. But included in that choice of alternative fuels is, of course, electric. Absolutely. Electric automobiles. In fact, we have special incentives on electric to yeah. get uh, to push the uh, the commercialization of electric vehicles. I'm beginning to suspect that we may have more success in that area than than we, you know, than we thought we had till recently. I think so too. We're probably going to have automobiles that are are dual, uh, multiple yeah. fueled in terms of uh, electric. They may be fueled by electric most of the time, and then gasoline perhaps part of the time. Let me ask you this, if I may, just as a friend and someone whom I have a great deal of confidence, as I do the other three members. But this was your subcommittee, I suppose, mainly. That's right. Um, Phil, are you, are you optimistic relatively about the, uh, about the possibility of our obtaining uh, or reaching our goal of 10% of alternate fuel use in the next eight or nine years? I frankly think it's quite unknown. Uh, my optimism derives more from the Clean Air Act than what we're doing, that uh, the Clean Air Act is going to push very, very hard on people to come up to emission reductions. They'll have to go resort to uh, uh, natural gas or ethanol. They'll have to resort to electricity. Uh, and I think that's going to accelerate that. We've try to be compatible with that. I think we simply do not know. May I ask one final very brief question, Mr. Chairman? Well, and oil prices, of course, are, are the underlying sure. key to this thing. If you project rising oil prices, it would be dramatic the change in our energy picture. But, but there's no, patterns, but but there's no proposal, but there's no proposal here to, to increase energy prices. That's correct. That's correct. Basically, although, although the administration and, and, and most parties have withdrawn from trying to change the price level in this country, which would have the greatest impact of all on conservation or production. I'm only moved because of comments from my friend from upstate New York over there to, to point out again that Americans pay on the average about 34 cents in taxes per gallon of gasoline. The average European pays about two dollars and forty cents. And there's I like America better. I know you do, and so do I. So do I, Jerry. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't raise energy energy costs a little bit to sort of push this thing along. One final question, if I may, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Is, am I correct in understanding, Phil, or or, or Mr. Big chairman there, Mr. Dingle, um, that the bill that the bill has no language in it that, that mandates the efficiency of new gasoline-powered automobiles. We're not no cafe provisions. Is that what you mean? Yeah, right. or whatever. Uh, that's correct. Uh, we why, have, is, why is that? If I may, uh, first of all, when we first started out this process, I thought we would, and, and I thought we should. Uh, I have revised my opinion as we went along the process. Uh, a couple things happened. One is the industry uh, became more clearly in trouble, and uh, the concern about the what we'd done to them on the Clean Air Act and the new requirements uh, was an economic concern about jobs and, and the general status of a, a key industry in this country. But I think even uh, a more enduring uh, problem was we had great difficulty coming to any conclusion in our subcommittee on either side of the aisle as to what was the most effective technique. In the absence of an increase in the cost of gasoline, uh, CAFE worked very well in my view, not everybody agrees, uh, during the uh, late 70s and early 80s because gasoline prices were also going up. So the market and the CAFE were headed in the same direction and helping. We're now having to fight the market more so. I believe the industry must continue to make fuel improvements. I think there are going to be various improvements that come into play that will put them at competitive disadvantage if they don't. But still, they aren't going to do as much as if they had strong cafe or high gasoline prices. I think everybody agrees. The National Academy of Sciences just finally completed what we thought we were going to get last December from them, which our subcommittee was hoping to get some guidance on. And basically, they came to the conclusion, yes, with current technology, and yes, without too much uh, greater investment, you can make some improvements, but nothing like the level of improvements that, for example, the Bryan bill uh, was claiming you could get yeah. at low cost. Uh, and they also said the problem is the current structure of CAFE is outmoded. Uh, it's based on an industry that was, you know, big three and domestic foreign was quite different than it is today. We have a highly integrated industry internationally that's much more difficult to, to regulate. So we'd have to regulate in a different fashion in order to do it. And frankly, we did not have the political will to do that. I, well, I appreciate very much your, your thoughtful response, and, and I understand and I share your concerns about the industry and preserving it here in the United States and so on. The thing, one thing that worries me is that one of these days when the OPEC nations get their act together again, the price of oil shoots up, 
uh, that American that American car manufacturers won't have on the market cars with with adequate uh, miles per gallon, and and uh, Americans are going to turn again as they did in the past to some some foreign produced ones. I would like to keep the pressure in as sensible a way as possible on American car producers so that, that we remain in the ballpark. And when people start again demanding, as I'm sure they will sometime, cars that get much better mileage than they do now, that we here at home are able to produce those cars and, and we'll have them ready and available on the market. Well, I might add, I, I ask every member of our subcommittee practically his or her, and we only had hymns on it, <laughs> view of the uh, uh, of what to do about the, the fuel economy. And there were many different opinions, but almost all of them agreed that the industry ought to make progress and could make progress to some degree in terms of improving fuel economy. So uh, this issue may but, but there's nothing here. But there's nothing there's in the nothing bill here that, that, that mandates them. that. That's right. That's correct. Uh, but I don't want to leave the impression that everybody was just satisfied with the status quo uh, and that there won't be political pressures in the future or crises in the future or other things. Now, the industry argues that they will make improvements in the natural course of things. Well, I certainly could hope I, you're could right. I, could I comment? Of course. Just, Thank just you. from a standpoint. Today, the American automobile industry is subsidizing its small cars. I know. When you buy an Escort or a small car manufactured by an American manufacturer, that car is subsidized by up to $1,000. The Clean Air Act, which we passed in the last Congress, and all of you remember the bitter fight we had over that, has required significant increases in fuel efficiency that have to be made to meet those clean air standards on automobiles. And those automobiles are going to be cleaner when they're going down the road at 50 miles an hour than a pre-controlled car will emit, and, and they'll make less emissions while they're going down the road at 50 miles an hour than a pre-controlled car will while it's sitting on the curb, sitting by the curb with its engine turned off. Now, Ford and, and GM and Chrysler all have enormous advances in, 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 in fuel efficiency that they're making. Uh, and, and they're enormous costs. I looked at one car that's being made by Ford, and it's going to get them about a tenth of a mile a gallon in additional fuel efficiency. It also is going to have to meet a lot of additional safety standards are going to add the weight to it. It's going to cost $900 million just to put that car in the market and to get a tenth of a mile a gallon. It, it costs as much as two or three billion dollars to save a full mile a gallon. I mean, we are not talking about peanuts. The easy things that we can do both on clean air and on efficiency are now well behind us. And one of the one of the curious consequences, if you handle this matter badly, is that all you do is send jobs to Mexico uh, by requiring simply that, that U.S. manufacturers manufacture cars in Mexico or manufacture cars overseas, and, and they get they then get they, the, the big cars out of their fleet, and with the result that you're both costing yourself jobs and doing nothing with regard to fuel efficiency. If you want to deal with the fuel efficiency question, it's a simple thing to do, that's raise the price. Uh, because gasoline today is cheaper than bottled water. So you go in and look at bottled water in a, in, a, in, a, in a supermarket, and you'll find it costs you less than the gasoline that you get down the, down the road at the gas station. No, I, I understand. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, Mr. Chairman. I just I, I want us to keep the pressure on as nicely and as properly as we yeah. can with respect to it. Yeah, I, I, I misspoke. I understand. Myself. The gasoline costs, costs less, less than, than the, the water. Because I, 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 I am, I am worried, as I said just a moment or so ago, that it'll hurt us in terms of competition. You're speaking to somebody who, as a matter of principle, only buys American-made cars. Always has. I mean, <laughs> even at times, though, I didn't think perhaps they measured up quite so well. I think they do. They now do, as a matter of fact. The new ones are far better. Well, I think, I think we share this concern. Right. Because I've been grappling around. But I'm just scared to death that one of these days, soon as I said, when the when the oil, when oil prices shoot up again, as they they're about to sometime, that that our people will be caught short. And I want us to keep as much proper pressure on them as possible so that we, well, we remain in the I'll marketplace. Give, I'll give you a couple of thoughts so that are important on this. First of all, our fleet now, the American fleet, under corporate average fuel economy, is now more efficient than most European and, 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 and indeed the Japanese fleet. Most people don't, don't realize that. You can speak up. The American, the American automobile fleet is more efficient than the European and the Japanese automobile fleets. Because, because, because of fuel efficiency. And, but if you look, and if you want to get ready for that next crisis, which is going to hit you when, when we have an Arab oil shutoff or something of that kind, again, 
The only way you can do is to deal with the way the Europeans do. Gasoline over there cost you, uh, cost you now about three dollars to as high as four fifty a, a, a gallon. I agree with you completely. And, I mean, that's and, and, and then when you, then when the marketplace is 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 screwed up by the situation that you get with an embargo and prices start rising, what the Europeans do is they start backing off the amount of money that they tax. That, in good part, is really their strategic petroleum reserve. We have chosen a different way. It's much less efficient and much more costly. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. If I might remind the members that we are trying as best we can to operate under the five-minute rule so we can get a rule out today, and there are about 50 witnesses. Mr. Frost. I'll be brief. Uh, just two points. I just want to make sure I, I understand correctly that uh, Mr. Dingell and Mr. Sharp, that uh, you don't have any objection to the Clement and uh, Barton Amendment being made in order as an amendment. You, it might not be your choice of an amendment, but that you have no objection to it being made in order and there being a vote on that on the floor. I have no objection to that. I, that I want to make it clear I may or may not support it. But. I understand, and, that's, uh, the, and that was what I gathered from Mr. Sharp's comments also, but in terms of the deliberations of this committee and permitting it to be offered as a floor amendment, you have no objection. I guess my, my preference would be different. My preference would be to avoid the entangled fight over a, a narrow range of, of an issue here and let us negotiate it in the conference committee, but that, that's... Uh, I understand. Uh, Secondly, uh, the only other thing I would ask about, uh, and this is directed to Mr. Sharp, is the prorationing amendment to be offered by Mr. Markey and Mr. Scheuer. Uh, and Mr. Scheuer, of course, is here, and Mr. Markey's here, and they'll be testifying. Um, the producing states uh, feel very strongly about this, um, this issue and feel like that it should be left uh, to them to determine. Uh, Mr. Sharp, could you... Uh, State for your position as to, as to why I gather you support this amendment. Why you feel this amendment should be made in order? Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Frost, under the general principle that I've articulated, I cannot support making it in order. My principle of articulation has been: if it not offered and considered in committee, it should not be offered and considered on the House floor. Uh, and I might say it would apply to the Clement Barton Amendment as well, uh, because I think that uh, these are complex issues. On the substance of the issue, it depends on what you're talking about with prorationing. I think the states are clearly within their rights in Oklahoma and Texas to protect what we call correlative rights. When four people have a straw in the pool of, of, of oil or natural gas, they, you, you have to have a system to defend the different property rights of those people. And as long as that's what Texas and, and Oklahoma are engaging in, uh, we have no difficulty with that. Our concern is the new drive, particularly in the state of Oklahoma, I've talked with your commissioners as well as the governor and others in <laughs> Oklahoma, is that this may be taking a step farther, and that is to try to actually control uh, the amount of production in hopes of controlling the price in this country. And that, of course, goes against the philosophy articulated by folks in your state in Oklahoma, which it took some of us a while to come to, um, of leaving the market competitive. I might also say from your perspective that if that is engaged in an intense way in Texas and Oklahoma, I think they do long-term damage damage to the oil and gas market and to their own interests because there are electric utilities and industries around this country trying to decide whether or not to move to more gas, primarily to meet the Clean Air Act requirements. Their greatest fear is whether that market is going to be available to them transportation-wise and production-wise. And if your state or Oklahoma take actions that are not, excuse me for arguing the substance, uh -huh. but my own view is I'm happy to let that argument laps over as we watch your state and Oklahoma to see how aggressive they are in pro-rationing. But I must tell you, if, if, if in our judgment you've overstepped the bounds where you're trying to control the market instead of protect correlative rights, then we would feel compelled uh, to try to get the federal government to override those and, state actions. And you understand the concerns of our Railroad Commission, which regulates uh, uh, oil and gas in our state. And I know that you have met with uh, uh, members of our Railroad Commission, right. very able individuals who are very concerned about the rights of the state in this matter. And uh, this will be a matter of uh, some controversy when uh, uh, both within this committee and when it reaches the floor. Well, it seems to me it's a regional fight we could avoid now as long as everybody on both sides understands that, that it has the potential of being a very serious problem in the country depending on the actions that are taken in various states. Uh, are you suggesting that uh, 
that it doesn't necessarily have to be addressed in this bill and that uh, you could look and see what's happening in the next year or two in those states and then come back and revisit the issue rather than making the uh, shoyer markey amendment in order? Well, because of my general proposition of not allowing in order things that were not committed, <laughs> considered in committees, I would, I would uh, uh, agree with that. But I must tell you, we would have hearings almost instantly if your Railroad Commission... Uh, and we would anticipate that. We, we would anticipate that, and we, as I said, you've had an opportunity to meet with members of our Railroad Commission who are very serious-minded serious and able people. They're, they're very able. Yes, thank you. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The expertise represented by the four gentlemen at the table is remarkable. I commend all of you because this is, this is one of the most controversial bills probably we'll have this year unless it is contained, unless it's worked out where it won't be. Did you know that we have scheduled today some 60 people to testify before this committee, a record and if that is generated on the House floor when this bill is under debate, I don't see how we can ever get it through this week. Mr. Chairman, how, uh, uh, have, have you asked for a rule and how many hours of general debate? I'm not, sure I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, how many hours of general debate are you going to ask for? Uh, we're asking uh, on debate. We're asking an hour for the Energy and Commerce Committee as a principal committee, be shared equally between Mr. Lenton and uh, Mr. Sharp. Uh, and we're asking that each other committee get a half hour. That gives you a total, I believe, if I've calculated correctly, of five uh, hours uh. of debate. Uh, and then, of course, the consider the amendments within the, within the bounds of the suggestions we've made to you under the, under the five-minute rule, allowing the committees of jurisdiction to have an opportunity to offer, a, offer one amendment to that. What do you think on, under the rule requested that you'll have an opportunity to finish it this week, this being well, Tuesday? Mr. Quillen, we are in an awful thicket here. Yes, I think Mr. Sharp and I would make a major effort, uh, assisted by our two good friends here, who I know would make the same effort, to get you a bill concluded by the time we go home. I think it'd be nice if the Congress had something we could talk about when we went home. And having, having said that, we have laid in your lap the difficulty that you've just described of addressing these things with other members who have amendments that they want to offer, but amendments which are going to both take the time of, of the House, but also add complexity not only to the consideration and, and, and divisive debate, but very frankly, which will complicate our affairs in terms of negotiating with the Senate and Conference, because the last... The last energy bill, which I remember we worked on in this place, took us 18 months to complete. And I hope and pray that I never have to go through another experience like that. Well, I commend you, and I, I think you need to turn off one of these if you're going to use the other one. It's been my observation, at least. I, I would just, uh, <laughs> if, the, if the chairman would yield to me, I, I just want to underscore what... Uh, the chairman said, and I also said during the main uh, testimony that we gave before this committee, we have a bill, it passed, I think the chairman said by 17 to 1, I just correct him, it was 42 to 1. In the full committee. In the full committee, it passed. So we have, uh, we have a pretty broad consensus bill here. It's a good bill. The place where uh, we're going to get ourselves bogged down is if we uh, start the Rules Committee permits material that comes out of the Interior Committee unrelated to our bill to be made original text. I think it is entitled to be heard by uh, individual committee amendments, and I think we could all agree to that. And excepting, we, excepting where they go beyond the germanus. Excepting where they go beyond the germanus. And, and also, I would add, original text where agreement has been reached and there's considerable agreement that has been reached during this negotiating process, which has been going on now for a week or ten days. But once we get beyond that, I think a great mistake would be made if we open Pandora's box here. We'll be here uh, until the cows come home if we're not careful. And uh, therefore, the, uh, I would underscore what the chairman has said. He, I think he's given you a way out of this thing. 
uh, to go with the committee bill and then anything else that wants to come in provided it's germane from other committees would be offered as separate amendments and with respect to the nuclear amendment which uh, would pr then be offered by uh, presumably by chairman miller of interior that a substitute would be allowed on the uh, uh, on the language uh, to be offered by uh, Representative Clement and Representative Barton. I think that would give a, a very fair choice to the members of the House to vote up or down on which route they chose to go on a very thorny issue, that of uh, nuclear licensing. Whether we wanted to encumber the procedure even more than it's already encumbered or whether we wanted to simplify it somewhat. Gentleman Mateo? Yeah. Be glad to yeah. I might just say to, to uh, Mr. Lint that, that that's the normal uh, traditional scenario that we would go through and that would give the House the opportunity to work its will and, uh, and to operate under the rules of the House and uh, uh, I for one would hope that's the way that we could go and uh, uh, it, would, it would certainly speed it up. Thank you. Well, one thing that's involved here also, it, uh, of course it depends how many amendments are allowed but it also depends upon whether any limitation is placed on the length of time that the debate will take place on, on each one of these amendments that are, that are supported, because some of them could go on forever. Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, back in the late 60s and early 70s, we tried developing alternative uh, energy and fuels and things that would make this nation greater. It just all fizzled out and went down the drain. I'm hoping this bill has the solutions that we, we just sorely need in this nation to be uh, energy dependent on this country and not on foreign sources. Let me ask one question and that I'll conclude with that. I'm realizing that our propane uh, supply is very limited there's some concern in industry if uh, it is shifted to uh, in lieu of gasoline that it's going to deplete the fuel stocks of our many industries in this country. Anything in this bill that alludes to that? Well, I'm aware of the problems to which you um, refer. I'd, I'd like to get Mr. Sharp to uh, answer the question after, after I give you this comment. I don't look with kindness on the idea of artificially creating problems for industries that would be dependent on something like propane. And there are a lot of people like chicken farmers, to, uh, tobacco farmers, uh, and a lot of people in the chemical industry who have feedstock problems. And if you start tinkering around with your artificial, with your uh, uh, alternative fuels, you run into exactly that problem. I think Mr. Mr. Sharp would answer the, the, the question on the points that, that uh, uh, Mr. Quillen, uh, uh, our bill does allow uh, propane to be included among four or five other uh, fuels as an alternative fuel. Uh, in that regard, it simply means that if propane providers wish to make their alternative fuel fleets um, propane, they would meet the requirements of the law by doing so. They could also make it electric or natural gas or something else. Frankly, propane is already the, one of the most widely used of the alternative fuels uh, in the country. Uh, we do not set it up in any exclusive way. Uh, there is some argument between propane dealers and, and uh, the chemical companies, chemical companies fearing uh, that the price of propane may be driven up uh, if it's used more as an alternative fuel and uh, as you might expect, propane dealers liking very much it becoming an alternative fuel. We don't settle that question. We leave that for the market to settle it. But it is included uh, as a, one of the possibilities, but it is not dictated or selected out or focused on in any way. I think studies should be made in that regard. Maybe we should increase our supply of propane. That's all, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to remind the members that we are trying to operate under the five-minute rule. Mr. Solomon suggested that we give the Southern members six minutes and everyone else five, so whatever. <laughs> so that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, encompasses you and, and me both, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I just have two questions. It shouldn't take very long. Uh, the one probably is for Mr. Sharp. 
has to do one of the miscellaneous sections on geothermal heat pumps. And, and uh, <coughs> there's only about three sentences there, and the first sentence says, under this section, the Secretary of Energy shall encourage the use of geothermal heat pumps. That's about all it says. And um, what, what's, the like purpose, <laughs> what's the purpose of a, of a statement like this if we're not really going to get involved in this when we, we really are blessed in this country with a lot of potential here? Well, first of all, there are some very useful informational and uh, uh, even participation in regulatory hearings around the country and state commissions that the Department of Energy can do to be useful to this or any other fuel, and that's why the directive it does have some value. One of our difficulties with this kind of an issue is, like all others, we don't have the money to subsidize heavily, we don't have the ability to regulate the market effectively, uh, and we aren't going to raise the price of basic fuels in the country, so without those tools available to us uh, to use, uh, what we can do to help push uh, heat pumps or anything else uh, becomes rather limited. But we hope to focus uh, the department um, more aggressively on this issue, and uh, and we think they can do some very useful things both in the market and in the state regulatory systems uh, uh, in hopes of, of uh, helping to generate this market. The private sector. Uh, frankly, is getting into a more positive uh, position on this issue to make the sale, and that's what we want the private sector to do. Well, I hope in the future that we we consider doing more for this particular part of of our of our environment, and, and certainly take advantage of what we already have. Um, I'm not sure who this question would go to, but it's under subtitle B, the Federal Agency Energy Management, and. Uh, I, I guess I wanted to know what effect this section would have on on military bases, on buildings, on military bases. What are we trying to do here with this? Uh, I think the, the, all there is in this, there are a couple items in here. One is to require the administration to continue an aggressive effort that was made a decade ago and then was dropped to get all of our buildings more fuel efficient. But no non-cost investment has to be, I mean, uh, uh, no investment has to be made that would not be cost effective. Uh, but there is an effort to try to, uh, th but it will be governed by the appropriations process, give the opportunity for an agency that makes improvements in energy efficiency to, to recapture the savings in their budget. Now that will take the approval of the uh, Appropriations Committee to make that work, but there's no new mandate or requirement on a military base or anywhere else, but it is try to say, look, we can save a lot of money for taxpayers and we can save the country energy if we'll take the most, the biggest energy user in the world is the U.S. government now that the Soviet government's collapsed, and, uh, and so, you know, we ought to be able to do a much more effective job than we can. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Wade. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and recognizing your admonition to be brief, I will just compliment this committee for its excellent work. And I believe the other committees have also done commendable work. Uh, the entire uh, product is one that deserves expeditious uh, hearing on the floor, and I hope that the Rules Committee can be helpful in this process by trying to, as much as possible, limit the decisions to the very clear-cut, uh, significant philosophical differences between some of the committees and their approach to this matter. Uh, recognizing that we're on C-SPAN and uh, in the morning as opposed to, uh, but that the, at the rate the hearing is proceeding, we may be on at our usual time at 3 in the morning. Uh, I will hold my comments to that. Thank you. Mr. Dodd. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to inquire of you as a representative of Southern California whether I qualify for the six or five minute uh, time. <laughs> Mr. Dry, we'll give you five and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I don't plan to take that, but I want to uh, join in extending compliments to all four of these very hardworking members of the Energy and Commerce Committee, but I'd like to single out the Dean of the California Congressional Delegation, Mr. Moorhead, uh, with whom I've had many lengthy discussions on our transcontinental flights on this uh, particular bill, and uh, he has done uh, an excellent job representing the interests of our state. Let me say that um, uh, I sympathize with Chairman Dingell on the, the question of jurisdiction. I say that as a former member of the Banking Committee, and uh, some questions which we tried to raise had been taken on by other committees. I don't remember which ones, but I mean, there have been uh, jurisdictional disputes in the past, and I would simply like to ask Chairman Dingell uh, if, if, uh, if, I mean, knowing that 
the Energy and Commerce Committee now has such limited jurisdiction, uh, if he is supportive of the concept of uh, major congressional reform of uh, the committee process? Well, I'm always, I'm always open to discuss questions of that kind. My experience is that reforms around here have usually left us worse off than before we reformed. And if you'll just look back before we had the budget uh, reforms, everything went very fine around here. We finished our appropriation bills in good order, and, and, and we were usually ready to adjourn sometimes either late in the summer or early in the fall. Uh, we have not achieved that purpose since we mm -hmm. concluded that reform. Well, tomorrow we begin the process of consideration in this committee of the, uh, the Gratis and Hamilton uh, reform package, and maybe uh, you, Mr. Chairman, might have some recommendations. But let me just ask one substantive question here on the issue that, w that we're addressing. The question of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is uh, a difficult one, and I think there are some unanswered questions there. Uh, there is a disparity in the cost of production for those in the industry. And uh, I'm wondering how you plan to determine exactly what the value of the contribution that will be going to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, whether it be cash or oil, is. Phil? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is really, in my view, one of the most important provisions of the bill. And unfortunately, we have a difference with the administration over this because historically we've had strong bipartisan support for filling the reserve as the only real tool available for us in the crisis. What we have created is a backup provision that if we do not appropriate the funds, as increasingly we're having trouble doing to fill the reserve, then we would require the oil industry, the refiners and the importers, not the producers, although some producers own refining. It's refiners and producers to set aside what could amount to as much as 1% of their uh, annual production if that's what the Appropriations Committee uh, follows through with uh, here in the House and Senate. Um, now, the question that you're raising is, well, California uh, heavy oil is uh, more difficult mm -hmm. to market and that therefore right. you don't get as much money for it. We believe there's flexibility for the Secretary of Energy because we let him choose between receiving oil or receiving money to work out this difference. Frankly, it's not likely to be very large. It should not affect production at all. We're only talking about less than 1% of the entire market. The costs are going to be passed through to all of us as consumers, a half a cent. This, goes to, this is the only thing in the bill that has an impact on price of gasoline. And frankly, this is an insurance policy that ought to be worth paying for the pr half a cent a gallon in any day of the mm -hmm. week may the uh, price that you and I pay the pumpkin chain. I think you've, you've addressed it very well. I, I think that flexibility is important for the Secretary and to be able I, I to. I might add, we, we can't get people to focus on this issue in the details that you're uh, willing to focus on here. We are quite open to working with the administration, to working with the Senate when we get to uh, the, the uh, thing. Conference, on, yeah. The conference on ways to improve this. We're not wedded to that. The one thing I'm absolutely wedded to is trying to fill the reserve. And if we can appropriate the money, great. But you and I are running mm -hmm. out of money to appropriate. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dyer. Are there further questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Gordon. I beg your pardon. I... Just very briefly, as one who cast a very difficult vote last year to um, allow the president to send troops to the Gulf if he felt that it was necessary, uh, I'm particularly sensitive uh, to this energy bill. I think we all realize that uh, one of the primary reasons that we sent 500,000 troops there was because of our dependency on foreign energy. And I think that this country has a responsibility to come up with an energy policy. It can't be just additional production, it can't be just conservation, but it's got to be the best of all of those. And I thank you for trying to put us on the road to trying to have a little more interdependence here uh, in our country. Chairman, could I add just one comment to what Mr. Dreyer said? And when he mentioned Mr. Moorhead, Mr. Moorhead has never gotten the full credit he deserves for enormous work on this bill. They're in the conservation section, he and Mr. Markey in the electric utility section, and indeed those sections aren't going to be controversial, in part because of his work, and I just wanted to get a chance to say that, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I'm, I'm aware of Mr. Moorhead's work over the years. I've served with him for many years, and he is an outstanding member. The committee recognizes that. Will you finish, Mr. Gordon? Yes. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if there are no objections, we're going to go out of order just a little bit at the request of Mr. Rowe. He is negotiating a settlement on another uh, piece of legislation and uh, has requested.
Chairman of the uh, Public Works and Transportation Committee before us, Mr. Rowe, we'll be glad to put your entire uh, statement in the record and have you summarize if you uh, uh, wish to do so. And we're also pleased to have Mr. John Paul Hammersmith, who is a ranking uh, a member of the Committee on Public Works and Transportation. Mr. Rowe. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. At the outset, let me thank uh, the committee for allowing us to go earlier. We have the Aviation Bill, as you know, on the floor in about an hour. And in addition to that, we've made great progress from our committee's point of view in working with the other uh, committees, particularly, uh, particularly Energy and Commerce, uh, because we have many items that are similar. My statement is a short statement, but it's to the point, and we do have some recommendations we'd like to make to the committee. So, uh, development of national energy policy strategies must be given the highest possibility of priority, which we all agree to. Our nation's interests require a truly balanced policy, which we all agree to. Now, we have been working vigorously with the other committees to reach an agreement on the provisions to be included in the bill. We have reached agreement on many uh, of these issues. However, there's some we have not as yet. Specifically, we have forwarded to the Rules Committee a list of items on which there is agreement of all the committees of jurisdiction, and we request that the matters on this list be included in the revised text of H.R. 776 that will be made in order as the original bill for purposes of amendment. A second list, Mr. Chairman, identified as Attachment B, consists of items reported by other committees in effect matters in the jurisdiction of Public Works and Transportation Committee. In most instances, instances these provisions were included uh, over our objection or were included without our consultation. And in part, that goes to, uh, to the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee also. Therefore, we strongly urge that items on Attachment B not be included in the text of H.R. 776. It is our belief that matters in our jurisdiction to which we object should not be given the endorsement of inclusion in the original text. And it is not just the issue of the jurisdictional issue that we're speaking to. There are substantive issues here that are a policy of nature and do affect other areas of the committee's uh, jurisdiction, other areas. If, however, the items on attachment B are included in the text, I would request that the Committee on Rules make an order amendments to be offered on behalf of the Public Works and Transportation Committee either to strike these provisions in our jurisdiction or to limit their application. Lastly, a number of members have submitted amendments to the bill. We have reviewed these and concluded there are at least three which we may have problems with both in terms of substance and jurisdiction. And for the record, these, and I specifically want to bring these three up, include the following. There is an amendment number 148 by Mr. Dingle, a substitute amendment to section 122, the Energy Savings Performance Contract, as reported the, uh, by the Committee on uh, Government Operations. <coughs> Item number 2086, Mr. Richardson, uh, to direct federal agencies to conserve energy by utilization of energy performing service contract and number 27 by Mr. Sinor, uh, Agency Energy Conservation Revolving Fund, etc. These three amendments which fall under our committee's jurisdiction impact on the Federal Buildings Fund and the responsibility of GSA to operate and manage federal buildings and to encourage government-wide contracting competition. We have opposed and continue to oppose these both on procedural and substantive grounds and accordingly we must also oppose uh, these three amendments. Amendments 110, 111, Mr. Owens, will be modified, we understand, to reflect our concerns. And finally, I will not be pursuing my amendment number 126, which um, it would ask at that matter has been resolved and has been resolved, the Merchant Marine provisions be included in the revised text as part of the original bill for purposes of the amendment. And in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, uh, we spend far too much time on our judgment uh, uh, disputing jurisdictional issues, the sponsor of those positions should use the normal legislative route instead of attempting to circumvent the Committee on Jurisdiction. Uh, may I say that uh, the value to people letting the committees know, the committee's jurisdiction know what the issues are in advance, gives us a chance to not only perfect the item with them, but also to spell out for them and let them understand the impact it has on other uh, areas uh, of the government and areas of responsibility. 
So it is essential that we establish a comprehensive national policy, which energy policy, which we, by all means, thoroughly communicate. Our meeting today, before we defer to John Paul, is upbeat. We're making great progress. The other committees involved. The items on item B, we're still working on them to try to resolve them. But uh, and according to our original agreement, if they can't be resolved at that point, then they should not be included in our judgment as part of the original text for the floor. Mr. Hammersmith. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'll put my statement in the record and just say that Without uh, objection. I support fully uh, Chairman Drew's statement and also the committee's position on H.R. 776 was set forth in the Chairman's letter to Chairman Moakley of May 15th. So I support the position, won't take the valuable members of the committee's time. We appreciate both of your hard work in, in trying to reach agreement in this bill. Mr. Bielison? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate the gentleman's testimony. I think that we have a list, Mr. Chairman. Yes, we've already submitted it. Okay. Thank you. Are, are there one quick further question, Mr. Chairman. Um, are any of the things that you mentioned, sir, perhaps still in discussion between yes. yourself and others, so there may still There's be some still resolution of some of those? Well, we have okay. high hopes for that. Okay. Sir. So to, to the extent any of those are resolved to your satisfaction, you'll, you'll let us know. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We will. Thank you. Uh, if you can please. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll say to both of you gentlemen, uh, your points are well taken. It's terribly important we reserve, preserve the uh, uh, jurisdictional system of our, our standing committees, and uh, we're certainly going to do what we can to help you. And we, we certainly are going to miss the two of you who uh, are retiring and have done such great jobs in your committee. Thank you. Mr. Frost. Mr. Gowen. Mr. Regardless of whether it's or not, I still want to add my thanks for the work you've done to bring the bill to the Mr. Dyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to extend congratulations to these uh, hardworking members and say that uh, we'll miss both of you come January of next year. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen, very hey, thank much. Thank you very much. Mr. Shoya, uh, and uh, would you... Uh, Care to have Mr. Block? Would Would you like to have anyone appear with you, or, or you? Mr. Block, he was here. I don't know if he was here. Okay. Uh, uh, so, it, uh, would you like any member of the minority to appear with you? Apparently not. Mr. Shoy, we'd be delighted to have you put your entire statement in the record and have you summarize. That's and if you'll proceed, that's what I'll do, Mr. Chairman. We'll I'll let be Mr. very brief. We'll let, we'll let Mr. Markey join you when he yes. arrives. Uh, what we're doing is to create a sort of an insurance policy, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, against possible future abuse of a state's rights to engage in pro-rationing uh, policies or procedures. We have no intention of impinging upon their uh, right to prevent waste of energy. We have no intention of impinging upon their uh, right to establish correlative uh, policies in the case where two drillers for natural gas are seeking to, uh, 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 to exploit the same pool. The only thing that we're a little wary about, uh, and we've read the lessons of history, is uh, an occasional effort by the states to ration natural gas in order to jack up the price. That's all we're worried about. And the remedy is that uh, we would give the right to a uh, utility or to a manufacturing corporation to go to a federal district court and ask them to have a look-see to see if this was an abuse of the uh, state's rights to engage in pro-rationing policies. It's as simple as all that. It's a life insurance, it's, a, it's an insurance policy against the possibility of future abuse. Now, in, we, we do have a national policy of establishing alternatives to in constantly increasing use of, of, uh, of, of uh, gasoline of natural get of uh, fossil fuels we want there's a national policy <coughs> in encouraging and promoting and and uh, assuring the viability of natural gas it's we it's safe it's convenient it's cheap uh, and above all it's here in unlimited quanti quantities especially uh, up in Canada so we we want to secure and enhance uh, the flow of gas and we want to secure and enhance the ability of corporations and of utilities 
to make an expensive changeover to natural gas, and for them to do that, they have to have a feeling that their supply is uh, secure and that they can look forward to reasonably uh, secure prices over the long pull. Fluctuations, yes. Upward uh, gradual trending, yes. Uh, but not sharp fluctuations that would come from an improper ability, uh, an improper use of the state's rights to engage uh, in uh, uh, regulating the flow of gas to other than appropriate for other than appropriate purposes, which would be to save energy and, and uh, to uh, uh, protect her relative rights. Thank you, Mr. Shoya. Mr. Bielison? No questions, but I appreciate the gentleman. Mr. Solomon? <coughs> Jim, I've, uh, I've read your letter both to me and to Chairman Moakley, and um, we understand your point. We'll do what we can to help. Mr. Frost? Now, just briefly, uh, Sure, you were in the room when I was asking the questions to uh, Mr. Sharp. Uh, yes, you sir. understand there are strong feelings on the part of the state regulatory officials in Texas that uh, they feel like they uh, uh, that this intrudes on their ability to uh, uh, handle the matter within their state, uh, and that uh, they are concerned about what's happening with multiple owners in the uh, same reservoir. Well, that we protect. Their ability to protect the relative rights is untouched, and their ability to protect uh, uh, to protect the waste of energy of any kind is untouched. The only uh, <clears throat> the only act of the states that we go to is they're messing around with uh, uh, with pro rationing policies in order to ratchet up the price of natural gas to create scarcity and ratchet up prices. And I understand their sensitivity in the three states uh, that are thinking about uh, these policies, thinking hard, but uh, there's a tremendous interest in the rest of the country in preventing abuse. There, there is all a, we seek is the right to appeal to a federal district court uh, judge if we think there's perfectly clear and abundant evidence of abuse. There is a, a difference of opinion in the reading of your amen, amendment on the part of the state regulatory officials in Texas. They, they do not read your amendment uh, as narrowly as you read it. Well, if they want to chat with us about the language of the amendment, I'm sure that Mr. Markey and I would be perfectly ready to, to uh, reason with them and to talk to them and hear their views. They haven't gotten in touch with me directly. To my knowledge, they haven't gotten in touch with Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, as I understand it, you and Mr. Shaw are here on the That's same matter. Would you care to make a statement? I will, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank you very much for allowing us to testify today on this uh, legislation. We'll be glad to put um, your entire statement in the record and have you, you summarize if you can. Thank you, Mr. Do Chairman, so. very much. Um, the heart of this uh, issue um, is that uh, historically, over the last 50 years, um, there has been some a concept called pro-rationing, um, which essentially means that there is, has been a system put together um, that makes it possible for there to be an allocation of rights amongst those parties who abut a large oil or natural gas reservoir. So, for example, if a, if a reservoir uh, would uh, span a 30 or 40 mile radius, uh, then the, t the one or two or three or four parties around it would then have to have <coughs> their rights determined in, in, uh, with regard to the other parties in terms of how much of that natural gas was theirs. And so something called pro-rationing has developed. And it's based largely upon geology in order to determine the rights of each of the parties. It's a very good and important uh, system that has helped to resolve many uh, potentially uh, volatile conflicts. However, uh, after the Energy and Commerce Committee on March 30th completed all action on the legislation, uh, the state of Oklahoma on April 7th, the state of Texas on April 28th, with Louisiana now conducting hearings, have, begun, have developed a new way of looking at this issue. Rather than just dealing with the correlative rights of all the parties that might uh, abut that reservoir. Now what they're saying is we're going to give each one of them a quota or a ration as to how much they can produce. Now, 
in the state of Oklahoma, they're going to do it on a statewide basis. In the state of Texas, they're going to do it field by field. But nonetheless, it's a dramatic change from geology to economics in terms of the methodology which is going to be used. Now, if gas price increases continue at the rate at which they have uh, since the beginning of April, uh, we're looking at an increase of upwards of $6 billion, $6 billion a year in gas prices uh, to the rest of the country. Uh, I'll give you some numbers as to what it projects uh, out to. Uh, in Massachusetts, it would be $85 million more a year. Uh, for South Carolina, $43 million a year additional. California, $496 million additionally. Michigan, $224 million additionally. Ohio, $196. Missouri, $79 million more. Tennessee, $72 million more. New York, $141 million more under this new system, which they've put in place, beginning to put in place since we have finished consideration at the full Energy and Commerce Committee level. So, the goal that I have, along with Mr. Scheuer, is to ensure that there is, in fact, an amendment put in order because of the emergency nature of this situation that only developed after the full committee completed consideration and in recognition of the um, several year interval that tends to develop uh, before the Congress returns to major energy uh, legislation. Um, otherwise, our parts of the country that have already suffered a tremendous economic hit from the beginning of August right through February of 1990 and 91, during the height of the Persian Gulf War, in anticipation of it and the buildup, oil and ga gas prices went up to $30, $40 a barrel. Now that economic hit on our regions is still reverberating and has caused a deepening of the recession and in fact has made it much more difficult for us to come out of it. Other regions of the country inadvertently, we admit, benefited from that. We can't afford to have some artificial price support here that keeps prices high indefinitely. We have to have our consumers, our businesses, our industries have lower energy prices so that we can come out of this recession in our parts of the country. We urge that you make this uh, amendment in order. We thank May you. I add one Sorry. short point? The capability of ratcheting up, ratcheting up prices on the part of these states, if there is a will to do so, uh, is enormous. OPEC controlled 30, 35 percent of all the oil around the world, and by ratcheting down supply, they have always been able, uh, almost always, have, have been able to increase prices, and sometimes catastrophically from the point of view of the West. And they did that with 35% control of supply. Uh, the, these three states that we're talking about control 90, excuse me, control 60% of the supply, almost twice as much as OPEC demonstrated you really need in order to have very adverse effects on price increases, uh, should the will be there. Um, yeah, Mr. Frost. Mr. Shoyer uh, mentioned that uh, he had not had any direct contact with the Texas state officials. I would ask Mr. Markey if he's had the opportunity to discuss this matter with uh, some of our officials. I have, and as usual, they are the most fascinating people in American government today. Well, that would stand to reason, because one of them is a former member of Congress. Well, in this particular Bob instance, Kruger. the former member of Congress happens to agree with our view. Uh, and it's uh, Bob yeah. Kruger happens to agree. He's in disagreement. It's a minority view of the three votes, and Bob Kruger happens to agree with us. But I did meet the other, uh, <coughs> I, I met the chair, and she is a very impressive person, no yeah, question. Very, uh, Ed, uh, I, I, don't, I assume you don't mean to uh, uh, say that the wellhead price has been going up. Uh, you're familiar with the fact that I said that the price producers have been well, receiving for it. But that the price producers have been receiving for natural gas has remained very, very low. 
and the uh, the increases that uh, your consumers have had to pay or may be paying is uh, somewhere else in the production chain uh, and that uh, uh, those people engaged in the production of natural gas in Texas have not been receiving additional additional amounts and in fact uh, uh, you've had a lot of people uh, oil and gas business particularly the natural gas business in Texas who are are not in the business any longer because of the very low wellhead prices for natural gas I appreciate that, but we think that what's happened is, is, a, is a speculative bubble, which is building. It's only been since April 7th, again, in Oklahoma, April 28th in, uh, in Texas. This is a very brief period of time. It's only uh, May 17th now. So this is moving very, very quickly. Uh, prices are skyrocketing in natural gas right now across the country, and it's all uh, post uh, deliberation in Oklahoma and uh, and uh, I think that it would be very very foolhardy for those of us in the rest of the country uh, to believe that uh, this was not uh, related in some way to the uh, to the new laws which are being put on the books but in those yeah, states. But, but Ed you should not leave the impression that the producers in those states are the ones that have benefited from this because that simply has not been the case. Okay. Well again uh, the acknowledgement that this is a price issue is very important to us. Okay. As long as you can accept the fact that we have some really serious problems here. And unless there's some other uh, basis upon which we can uh, attribute these large increases over a very brief period of time, um, then, uh, then we're going to have to look back at these decisions and, be, and, and ask some very tough questions. Now, as we move along... You may be looking in the wrong place, is what I'm suggesting. Uh, we're more than willing to be flexible in terms of what language uh, might be put in in order to ensure that we don't uh, uh, deal with this in, a, in, in an improper way. But on the other hand, I think it would, it would be too risky for us not to have something in the bill right now as we move further on down the line. And then with Mr. Bennett Johnson from Louisiana and others who we can discuss it with in conference, I'm sure that we could reach I'm, a... I'm sure you will have some uh, uh, elucidating discussions. I'm sure you will enjoy the experience. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Quillo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you all appearing here this morning. I do have one statement. Back in the 70s, I introduced a bill on geothermal energy. I got a nice write-up in the Geothermal Energy magazine. My bill would carve up the United States into districts and allow free enterprise to dig for geothermal energy and to sell it uh, in a substitute for heat and air conditioning. You know, in Iceland, a whole city up there is heated with geothermal energy. We have croppings throughout the country, and it died uh, deader than a doorknob. It seemed to me that it made sense seeking out for additional and alternative energy sources. That might be the godsend that we're looking for. Any consideration ever been given that in the committee? Not my bill primarily, but geothermal energy. I'm, uh, I'm told that in the ways and means portion of this legislation, that they have ex that they have extended the permanent uh, geothermal uh, tax credit, and that is included in this bill. Uh, until this point in time, it has been a temporary in recognition of, I think, your uh, appreciation of the important role that it can play. It has now been made permanent as part of this bill as we bring it out to the floor. Well, that's minuscule, but it's the beginning, maybe, but I thought I had a good idea. Maybe good ideas don't get anywhere. Well, I, I do think that you're correct that geothermal has a large role. Um, uh, but uh, and Mr. Sharp has inserted language. He had a colloquy with uh, the gentleman from Ohio. Uh, on the committee, uh, Mr. Hall, with regard to the role of geothermal, and, and he as well is very interested in it, and pressing the Department of Energy uh, on the subject. Um, but uh, again, it uh, in the back of your mind, sometime you know, if we have that energy in the depths of the earth, we should use it. 
other countries are using it, and maybe we would have a we would have a an abundance of supply. Well, well I'll just I'll give you this one additional piece of information, which I think, okay, I'll give you this one additional piece of information, which we think is going to be critical in the development of geothermal and all other alternative energy sources. What we do in the legislation is, for the first time, uh, mandate uh, that there be uh, transmission of electricity from independent power producers uh, from region to region in the country. If you think of the whole country as a natural grid. Uh, so that there's now going to be a, hu a huge incentive uh, built in for independent put out power producers and for utilities to develop alternative energy sources, including geothermal, because they will now have the capacity to transmit that electricity to other parts of the country using the national electricity grill. Thus far, each region of the country has basically, each city almost of the country has turned into a local monopoly. And you can't, in other words, move your electricity, sell it 250 miles away. And I think now these more isolated areas where geothermal is more plentiful will see um, uh, 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 almost the the, the energy equivalent of the Oklahoma Sooners now moving out, trying to find where these locations are, and with smaller 200, 300, 400 uh, megawatt capacity, be able then to use that and to transmit it across the rest of the country, even though it may not be near an urban or a densely populated area. That is a major, major cha a change in American law that has been 20 and 30 years overdue. Well, I think that's very commendable. Uh, does, it, your, does this legislation give authority for these independent sources to transmit over existing yes, facilities? Yes, it does. It, it, exactly. I know we're having a problem in TVA area. Uh, sometimes TVA will let you do it, and sometimes they will not if it's in competition with, with that utility. Henceforth, they will have to allow for the use of their wires for transmission, and TVA will be compensated for the use of their wires, but they won't be able to block smaller independent producers from developing their own natural gas, geothermal, conservation, uh, hydropower, at smaller quantities, and then uh, uh, cutting economic deals for energy with, peer, with uh, other uh, states or other utilities that may be hundreds of miles away and using the wires to that get it to is them. very commendable. Does it give authority for each uh, present utility to set their own rate for carry through? No, it is set by FERC. It will be a national standard. It will be monitored on a national basis in order to ensure that you that we don't see disparities developing or utilities acting yeah, in anti-competitive fashion. Are carry through rates high enough for that would kill it dead too. That is correct. That is that is why FERC is mandated to ensure that there is uh, fair and equal uh, rates which are charged for that transmission capacity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would like to once again remind the witnesses as well as the members that we are trying as best we can to operate under the five-minute rule. Uh, Mr. Gordon. Well, I'll just uh, assume that Mr. Quillen Park took part of my five minutes. Uh, so just compliment the, uh, compliment the panel on the questions. Thank you. Okay, now it's working. Uh, again, thanks to the panel for bringing this informative discussion and this element to the uh, to our energy bill. That's very important to all of us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I want to thank Mr. Quillen for bringing that up. I think we we dropped the uh, discussion of alternative fuels and energy sources here in the early 80s, and I'd like to see us get back to it. But I do want to strongly support your amendment today as a vice chairman of the Northeast Midwest Coalition. I, we, we've just come through a vicious and uh, bitter winter. And um, the idea of a mini OPEC in the United States determining whether those out of the Northeast are going to shiver and freeze or whether we're going to prosper and grow is pretty troublesome to us. Um, and, you know, we, we just came through the savings and loan crisis where New Yorkers kept saying, but why do we have to keep paying? It's not us that's hurting. Uh, and we explained to them it was for the good of the order. Uh, and I, I certainly think that your amendment uh, follows along in that same line that we don't want to see one part of the country benefit, prosper, and grow because it is damaging severely the economy of another. 
thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you, Ms. Lawler. I think Mr. Shaw had yes. a brief May, comment. Uh, just a couple of comments. First, we have enormous support from utility uh, uh, commissioners around the country, all over the country. Uh, we have enormous support from industry, uh, corporations like Dow Chemical. There is an urgent need to protect the interests of the business community, including utilities, uh, to, uh, by, by offering them access to uh, natural gas at predictably reasonable and stable prices. Second, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we don't have any protection now. The Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Energy Regulation Commission, and the Department of uh, uh, Justice all say that the country at large is at the mercy of these uh, three uh, gas-producing states if they want to do things that could conceivably be against uh, the national interest. And let me say that, and, and I'm sorry that uh, uh, Martin Frost isn't here, there have been increases at the wellhead. In the last 60 days, 60 to 90 days, prices have gone up about 32 cents per 100,000 cubic feet at the wellhead. That's an increase in only, in less than three months, of about 27%. That is a very significant short-range, uh, short-term, uh, abrupt, unexpected, unpredictable increase in prices. And uh, the rest of the country needs to be able to uh, visit this question, and we're doing it through a very moderate uh, interlocutor, <coughs> the federal district court bench, who are going to be fair and, and respectful of states' rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Looking very good today, Mr. Chairman. Looking very good today. Donald Clyde Holloway, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to, to say, as Mr. Holloway is coming forward, that I look forward to his testimony. And I also wanted to Please, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's see if I can get it on here. Uh, after listening to that, I almost want to throw these away and talk about recession. Put it anyway. I won't let you tell you, uh, I won't use my full six minutes being a southerner, okay? I'll try to restrict mine to the five minute rule. But uh, my amendment is, is very simple, and actually, the uh, Ways and Means Committee has uh, the, the vote they had there to strike. Uh, the set aside amendment makes mine uh, to me even a little more important that, that we have an opportunity to come before you, not knowing exactly where we go, but uh, my amendment basically uh, provides that the set aside requirement apply only to imported or petroleum products, as was the case in H.R. 777, as originally introduced by Mr. Sharp. Uh, I'll be very brief to say because I at the close of debate or at the close of the hearing in our committee and subcommittee, I, I express I would offer this uh, amendment to strike the full set-aside provision. Uh, I think that's what should be done because this is going to be, if nothing else, and we look at it from no other standpoint, it's going to be an administrative nightmare. I think there's better ways of doing it, whether it be leasing or whatever. I think that those have to be worked out, and I think it's things we can do. I think it's very important that we continue this uh, strategic oil reserve system and, and continue to develop it. But I think there's better ways in taxing the people, and I think the president's absolutely committed to veto this bill if, if we allow this provision to stay in it. Uh, so I have to say I do favor the Ways and Means provision, but the purpose of strategic oil reserve is to, to relieve our dependents, our emergency on foreign oil. Uh, we only continue to create that. So I think if we offer it, offering this amendment that we strike uh, the provision on uh, domestic oil only uh, gives us a little incentive for domestic oil. And I think the argument we heard before uh, with the states that are energy dependent, we've been through terrible recessions. So I think just the fact that we can do anything to add a little bit to domestic production in this country, we're getting beat to death, our producers are. Uh, this amendment that I'm offering would simply uh, take the dependents or take the responsibility off our domestic producers and hopefully drill another well or two rather than keep hearing the nightmares we hear of drilling uh, rig counts going down, down, down in this country. So I hope you'll see my amendment uh, to be fit and one that can go to the floor for a full vote. 
Uh, I'll vote for the Ways and Means uh, Amendment when offered, and if that passes, I'm sure it would leave, relieve the, this amendment's uh, responsibility. But I do hope that you'll see this and, and allow me to offer it on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Mr. Butler. Mr. Quillen. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gordon. No questions. Just that you're glad to have you. Thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, just want to compliment you on this, Clyde, and say that I hope very much that we uh, uh, allow your amendment to be considered on the floor, and I want to say that I'll support strongly that effort. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Who does? Who does? He want to testify with me. Thank you very much. Who's next? Mr. Gordon, do you have any uh, questions? What? Are you said no. no questions. No questions. Oh, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, committee will recognize the Honorable Billy Tozan to be joined with by nobody. Okay. Mr. Tozer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a written statement I'll submit for the record. Let me summarize quickly for well, you. Well, objection the entire statement will appear on the record. First, let me disabuse the committee of several notions that have just uh, been proffered to you this morning. One is that Louisiana is somehow part and parcel of a cabal or some sort of energy coalition with Oklahoma and Texas to control that for one minute. natural gas prices. <laughs> if Louisiana uh, could do it all by themselves. And, well, <laughs> the truth is, Senator Bennett Johnston and I both oppose the use of pro-rationing to affect energy prices in America. We have so informed our state regulatory authorities, and Louisiana is not adopting that policy. We do, however, manage our, our oil and gas fields for conservation purposes and to ensure that adjacent owners are all treated fairly. And we would hope that whatever is done on the floor of the House, if an amendment is offered, does not interfere with the legitimate conservation efforts uh, executed by state authorities, ensuring that as much energy is produced out of a field as possible and that people are fairly treated who live adjacent to oil and gas fields. Uh, so let me quickly disabuse you of that notion. It's interesting that it's coming from members of the Northeast Midwest Coalition who had sponsored price controls here in Washington a similar artificial restraint on the free market. We oppose both. We don't think this Congress, the government ought to control prices in Washington, nor should the states control prices by managing production. And that's the that's position, as we know it, in the state of Louisiana. Uh, secondly, uh, Mr. Bart Garden did us the favor of reminding us that we just went to war over oil and gas to defend oil and gas fields somewhere else in this world because we weren't producing enough in America. Let me assure you, nothing in this energy bill, absent the alternative fuel section, does anything to cure that in terms of increasing production here in America. On the contrary, most of what's in this bill now, with the Interior and the Merchant Marine Committee language, would do more to discourage the production in America than to encourage one more drop of energy for our, for our own country. OTA predicts that by the year 2010, we will be importing not 50, but 70% of the oil and gas America needs. It's an incredible number. And the merchant marine and interior positions on this bill, if allowed to become language in this bill, would go far to discourage even any more production in America. Let me tell you how. The bills include massive new moratoriums on drilling. Unlike the car industry, unlike textiles, unlike any electronics industry, America is losing its oil and gas industry rapidly, not to lower costs or cheaper labor costs, but to the simple notion that America is driving the energy businesses away from our country. They're leaving in droves. They've lost 600,000 jobs in the last eight, 10 years. In, a, in Louisiana alone, we suffered 180,000 job losses in one state. Can you imagine that kind of a depression for 10 years? This bill, if we adopt the interior and merchant marine moratoria language, will only go further to push those companies away from America and a further dependence upon foreign oil. That doesn't make sense. You ought to seriously consider the chairman and the ranking committee members' position on energy and commerce not to allow the interior 
merchant marine language to be included as part of the original bill. Let them come on the floor and offer those amendments. Let's debate them. But let's not include that as part of the bill. We chose not to include those sections, indeed, because we saw them as counterproductive to the efforts of energy security. The merchant marine and interior uh, positions also included a strange provision. I'm going to ask you to allow me to offer an amendment to. The Merchant Marine and Interior Committee positions allow for the sharing of some of the money derived from offshore drilling back to the coastal states for energy impact suffered. But strangely, those committees would allow that money to be shared with states that have no impact. It would allow the money to be distributed to coastal states that either have no production at all or are under moratoria against production. And what a crazy thing to do. If the idea of providing part of that money back to the states for energy impact is to encourage the states that do allow some production and to cover some of their impacts, why on earth share that money to states that have no impacts? It would be like saying to the interior states, who have 50% of the federal money derived from interior production, you've got to share it with other interior states who have no such production. We don't do that. Why should we do it to the coastal states? I'm asking you to make an order and amendment to make sure the impact funds go to those states with impacts. Pretty logical. I hope you let us do it. Secondly, I'll be joining my colleague, Mr. Fields, in asking you for a real, sensible, logical amendment to the Interior and, ways, and Merchant Marine and Fisheries moratoriums. If energy dependence continues to rise, if all the good work we're doing here today, and hopefully on the floor, to encourage conservation and alternative fuels, use of other exotic and, and perhaps even uh, cleaner fuels for America, if all of that fails to stem this increasing dependence of foreign oil, so that we're forced again one day to vote to send our children to battle again over it, shouldn't we at least have a whole homeless in the bill somewhere that allows the President and the Congress to make some decisions on those moratoria where there are clearly hydrocarbon potentials with low environmental impacts? The moratoria in the Interior Bill, the Merchant Marine Fisheries Bill, applies to areas where there are clearly very little environmental impacts to worry about. High hydrocarbon potentials, and yet they're covered by the moratoria for one reason, Mr. Chairman, members, for one reason, politics. And if we're going to let politics say that we can't produce energy for America in times of need, shame on us. The Jack Fields Amendment I'm co-sponsoring, I'll ask you to make an order, simply says that when dependency continues to rise, if it does, the President can make an exception from the moratoria in those selected areas where hydrocarbon potentials are high and environmental impacts are low, taking into account those environmental impacts in every way possible. That ought to be, I think, the policy of the United States of America. Finally, let me join my colleagues who appeared you know, on energy and commerce, commerce before and urge you not to allow the nuclear licensing section of the Interior Committee into this bill. It is counterproductive. We stayed away from it in the Energy and Commerce Committee because it is so disruptive of, of the debate. More importantly, if you look at the in Interior Committee's bill, you will see that the in Interior Committee's bill will not only draw fire from the utility industries in America, but will also be opposed by the medical community <coughs> because of the below regulatory concern features of the Militex. Each one of the 50 states would be allowed to enact disparate radiological standards resulting in conflicting, contradictory state regulation covering practices involving radioactivity. This means chaos causes shutdown of nuclear medical facilities, food processing plants, and university nuclear research facilities. Let's not get into that kind of debate. Let me urge you to do what the chairman and ranking members of Energy and Commerce suggested, and that is not to include that language as original text to allow that debate to come in the form of an amendment on the floor. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your gracious time and thank for all Mr. of you Tozen. hearing me out this morning. Any questions of Mr. Tozen? Mr. Tozen, Mr. you make a very persuasive argument. Thank you, Mr. Derrick. Mr. Durant. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Excellent testimony, Mr. Tozen, and I uh, uh, want to say that I'm very sympathetic, uh, especially with the First Amendment that you raised as uh, coming from, I represent California, and it's I think would uh, have a, a very important effect on my state. Um, you said that you don't want the Interior Committee provisions uh, to uh, be incorporated here. What are your thoughts on the, uh, the Barton Clement uh, Amendment, uh, which many of us are supporting? I supported, in fact, authored those amendments at the markup in the Energy and Commerce <coughs> Committee years ago. 
Mm -hmm. We came within one vote of passing it. In fact, had it passed at one point, markups were delayed. We lost a couple of votes in the process. You know how that goes. We came back and lost it by one vote. So I'm very sympathetic to that position. But if we're going to debate that, we ought to debate it as a set of two alternatives on the floor. And let us see how the House decides that issue. Mm -hmm. It is, in fact, a very controversial issue. One, I simply say, should not be made of original text. Mm -hmm. but the choice ought to be to either loosen up regulations uh, in a way that makes sense, ought to tighten them in the way the uh, So the you're arguing that we should not have the interior uh, package in there, but should we or should we not allow the Barton Clement amendment? My, my argument is allow both on the floor. Let the amendment okay. and the substitute okay. come on the floor and let the House decide the issue. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Gordon. I want to thank Billy for his thoughtful and articulate presentation. Good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable uh, Joe Bach of Texas to be joined with Congressman Clement and Congressman Rudd. Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Clement is down in the dining room with your permission. I would defer until he could not do you know what course he's on? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we've sent someone to uh, to go get him. All right. Well, he'll be up here by the time. Isn't he? Well, since Mr. Barton is the the original on this, I think, isn't it? Unless you want to. I'll, the chairman I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll be happy to defer. Uh, well, Honorable John Rutherford. Well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your yielding. I just wanted to come and support what he and Mr. Clement are trying to do. I come from a coal producing area, and of course the key is we have to have clean air. Nuclear uh, production certainly helps us with coal production. The only place, if you look at this from a national security standpoint, that we've reduced the amount of oil we've used in the production of, of uh, any energy uh, resources, production of electricity, and specifically is uh, uh, in the area of electricity. As a matter of fact, it's almost be, be as you decrease the amount of oil that's used uh, uh, in uh, electricity, you've increased the amount of coal nuclear power in producing electricity. So it goes beyond. It goes beyond uh, uh, just uh, a parochial interest. I think it's a national security interest, and I think it's so important. Matter of fact, I can see that uh, if the Barton Clement Amendment were not made available and didn't pass, that uh, we wouldn't have any production of nuclear energy. And if, if the purpose of Congress is to reduce that, I think we ought to at least uh, have an opportunity to address it on the floor, to debate it. And I would ask that the, the committee make this amendment uh, available to be debated on the floor and let the House decide uh, which direction it wants to go. But I'm convinced if, if we don't have this amendment, uh, we won't have any nuclear facilities at all because since 1978 we haven't had any go forward. And I think we need this kind of change which allows it to go forward, allows the courts to intercede if necessary, but it'd be a real mistake uh, 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 if we didn't make it available and we didn't make this change in the law. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Any questions of the chairman? I have no questions. Well, I just wanted to uh, thank him for what is an excellent okay. statement. I'm glad to know that we have uh, bipartisan regional support for uh, what I think is going to be a very good package as we continue to try to pursue the goal of uh, domestic energy self-sufficiency. Well, I'll, I'll just add that uh, if on my rating scale, um, uh, nuclear energy is not high. But I think that uh, we have to look at all sources of revenue, all sources of, of production. We've got to look at all sources of conservation. And that not to go forward with this basically leaves it out of the mix. And I don't think that's a very uh, smart way to approach our energy needs. Mr. Derrick. Let, let me just add, Mr. Chairman, that I appreciate your testimony and the uh, the strength that goes behind it uh, to the amendment and I think it's something that we need desperately and I think that uh, we're looking at alternatives and we're going to have to look at alternatives to fossil fuel and, and others in the future and to deny the country uh, that uh, alternative would be a great mistake. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barton. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the Rules Committee. I've got a written statement. I'll submit it for the record. Without objection, the gentleman's and, uh, entire statement will be on summarized. Today, as we speak, uh, there are 111 operating nuclear power plants in this country. Uh, those plants produce 22% of our electricity needs. Uh, there has been no new plant uh, initiated in this country since the early 1970s. Uh, under current regulatory procedure, uh, the NRC several years ago uh, began to move towards a one-step licensing process. Uh, this one-step licensing process is done in conjunction with a pre-site selection procedure where you pre-certify the site. You also, they, they have uh, underway right now a situation where they are pre-certifying the reactor designs. Um, as a consequence of the NRC rulemaking, uh, the Senate in their energy bill has put in a one-step licensing reform provision that Congressman Bob Clement and myself have introduced in the House as H.R. 4488. Uh, the amendment is very straightforward. It says when you go to get a license to build a power plant, at the same time you get the license to operate that power plant. However, there are several avenues for the public input to come into the licensing procedure, and we're explicit that there is judicial review of any decision by the NRC. Uh, contrary to what some of our opponents have said, uh, our amendment in no way does away yeah. with the ability of the public to have input into the, uh, into the license procedure. Uh, our amendment uh, has got tremendous support. We have 153 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. I think every Republican on the Energy and Commerce Committee is a co-sponsor, except for perhaps one, and I think that gentleman may have co-sponsored uh, over the weekend. It's got bipartisan support. Congressman Bob Clement of Tennessee has, has done yeoman's work in uh, arranging for Democrat support for this amendment. What our preference would be, obviously, is that uh, uh, the, the Clement-Barton Amendment be made a part of the original text. Obviously, because of the controversial nature of nuclear power, it may not be possible for the Rules Committee to, to grant that request. At a minimum, we would request that we be made in order as an amendment on the floor, uh, uh, perhaps to Miller, uh, perhaps the Rules Committee will decide not to even allow Miller as, as an alternative, although I think you, you probably will. Um, uh, there were some questions when the chairman and the ranking Republican and the subcommittee chairman, ranking Republican, Congressman Moorhead of the subcommittee, about the history of, of our effort. Uh, I did offer this uh, as an amendment to the energy bill when it was being marked up in subcommittee. I withdrew before a vote on the amendment at the request of uh, the subcommittee chairman, Mr. Sharp, so we could work together to maybe get consensus on what to do at full committee. When we got to full committee, uh, the chairman and the ranking uh, Republican, Mr. Lent, wanted to do more of a least common denominator bill uh, and didn't want uh, any amendments offered that were uh, controversial in nature. Uh, I had an understanding that uh, my rights would be uh, uh, protected in order to come to the Rules Committee and, and make it in order on the, on the floor. And uh, the chairman uh, and, and Mr. Lent gave me that uh, support, and so I did not offer it at full committee. It was offered at subcommittee and then withdrawn. Mr. Bob Clements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Rules Committee. Pleasure to be here with you and my colleague Joe Barton concerning our amendment uh, in relation to the energy bill, which is critically important to this country. But I think also important is for uh, have an energy mix and an energy balance. We need all sources of energy, conservation, solar power, wind power, coal, oil, water power, alternate energy uh, fuels. But we also need nuclear. Uh, it, the hearings uh, were not held in the Energy and Commerce Committee. I think they really should have been. But we do have a consensus bill uh, in the United States Senate. Uh, we had an original bill uh, that, in our, my opinion, and uh, Joe's, uh, has been improved uh, with the uh, Senate language. Uh, we do have 153 co-sponsors, as mentioned. As we know, uh, nuclear uh, composes a 
approximately 22 percent of our uh, electrical needs of this country. I think all of us know that uh, we're going to have to have uh, more energy for the future. We want to move toward uh, being energy independent. We have 110 nuclear power plants uh, today in this country, but we also know since the 1970s there have been over 100 uh, nuclear plants uh, that have been canceled. Uh, Nuclear plants are just not going to be built in the future if uh, this n nuclear licensing reform uh, legislation is not adopted. Uh, that's why uh, Joe and I and uh, other co-sponsors feel so strongly about this legislation. We have not updated since 1954 with the uh, Atomic Energy Commission <laughs> when it relates to nuclear energy. Here we're going into the 21st century and we're not prepared. And uh, that's why we want an I I integrated mix. We want an energy uh, balance. We want to be diversified. We also want to, our energy to be safe. We want it to be economical. We ought to be able to build a nuclear plant in six years. Uh, the average building a nuclear plant today in this country is 14 years. At TVA, where I was a former TVA board member, we've got the Watts Bar nuclear plant, as uh, Congressman Quellen and Congressman Bart know. It's now been, been under construction for 20 years. Uh, we're wasting billions of dollars uh, for the ratepayer where they're, where they're having to pay out and hire utility bills that they ought not to uh, have to pay out. That's why it's so necessary to have a, some legislation that's environmentally safe, that uh, moves us toward being more economical, uh, that uh, where we could build nuclear plants in six years, not 14 years, and that's why we wish and ask that uh, our amendment uh, be in order where we can debate this on the floor of the House of Representatives. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any questions of the panel? Mr. Tarek. I don't have a question. Just let me uh, say that I thank you, gentlemen, both for your hard work uh, on this amendment and pushing it forward. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I commend both of you. As I recall, I might be a co-sponsor of your measure. And you I'm are. I'm invited to be. We know that we uh, not giving that should have more nuclear production. It's safe when it's handled properly. And we know in the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, jurisdiction that we wasted absolutely billions of dollars. One in my district, they spent almost a billion to get it open, and then they closed it. Ratepayers have to pay for it, so I think you're on the right track. And I commend you, and I didn't mean that to have any criticism against TVA. I think the starting up of the program could have been ill-conceived and rushed, and haste makes ways. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Gordon? Let me just add my congratulations to Congressman uh, Clement and Barton for the long time, the effort uh, and work they've put in to bringing forth what I think is a reasonable and balanced uh, approach. Uh, it's one of those things that is not going to please either side completely, but I think it is that balanced approach. And I think because of that, uh, we see that you have received the, the endorsement and co-sponsorship of many uh, fellow members. And so I think that speaks very highly of your legislation. Thanks. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, I too, want to congratulate uh, both of our colleagues and say that I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of the legislation. Now, tragically, uh, we uh, regularly talk about how great this country is. Earlier, we had an exchange between Mr. Bielenson and Mr. Solomon about the greatness of this country versus Europe. And it seems to me that when we look at this question, it takes virtually three times as long for us to get a nuclear power plant online than it does our friends in France. And uh, I think that, that trying to streamline this process so that we can bring about the cheapest, safest, most cost-efficient method of producing energy would be in the uh, national security interest of this nation. One of the problems that I see on the horizon is as we debate this question of uh, the use of Yucca Mountain in Nevada, 
as a uh, place for uh, the disposal of nuclear waste. How do you see us addressing the question long term if we are able to move in a more expeditious way to get plants online addressing this question of waste, which is going to be a, a difficult one for us here? Well, we, uh, uh, Congressman Dreyer, don't address the waste issue in this legislation because under a prior act of Congress uh, passed, I think, three or four years ago, uh, the Congress went on record that said that they wanted the, the one waste depository to be out uh, in uh, Nevada. Obviously, the Nevada delegation has serious uh, reservations about that piece of legislation, but we, uh, we simply did not address that, and it is not addressed in the Senate bill. So that's an issue that if there needs to be further consideration, we feel should be done, as Congressman uh, uh, Dingell indicated, as a separate piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. Congressman Dreyer, I might, uh, I might uh, also uh, comment about that. that. That concerns, well, okay, there you go. I, uh, I, when it relates to nuclear waste, it has to be addressed. Just like uh, Congressman Barton said, we did not address it in this particular piece of legislation. Uh, being a former TVA board member, it, it's my opinion that uh, in the years ahead we're going to find a way to recycle much of that nuclear waste to generate new electrical supply. Uh, I do have serious questions whether we should have a temporary uh, disposal site. Uh, I, I'd like to think we can finally uh, 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 determine that we need that uh, permanent depository site, which I think it would be in the best interest of this country. But it needs to be addressed and as soon as possible because uh, that's part of, of, uh, of a, a, a greater problem that uh, we all need to confront and, and move ahead with. Thank you very much. Could I make a, make a comment on one of the things that you said? Uh, when you talked about the French, uh, I'd like to point out to the committee that under construction right now in Japan is a power plant using one of these designs that is currently being certified by the NRC, uh, an advanced uh, boiling water reactor. The, the Japanese are using our technology. They're using American contractors. They're going to build a state-of-the-art power plant in, in five years. And as, as Congressman Clement said, we're still in a situation in this country where in some cases it takes up to 20 years. So the world is using our technology, they're using our workforce, they're using the, our hardware, uh, and it's, it, it seems to me absolutely uh, imperative that, that we join the rest of the world with proper consideration for for input from all interested parties uh, to make sure that all the the, cons the safety concerns and the operating concerns can be raised. And again, our amendment does uh, does take into account those concerns. And due to a, an overwhelming regulatory burden which emanates from this place, we are preventing the attainment of that goal. Right. I might also add Congressman Derrick, when he was here and, and talking to Congressman Sharp earlier, uh, made the statement that uh, we have 200, over 240 uh, members have pledged their support. We only have 153 co-sponsors. I don't want the committee to be under any misunderstanding about that, but we do have a, a, a preliminary whip count that indicates uh, substantially over 240 members are willing to vote for this on the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, gentlemen. The Honorable Ralph Hall of Texas. Mr. Chairman? Yes. May I, uh, before we proceed, uh, our colleague, Mr. Uh, McEwen, uh, couldn't be here today, and he has an amendment, and I would like to simply submit it and make the request that Without his amendment... Without objection, the gentleman from uh, Ohio... Could I just... It's just one, three lines here. Could I just read this? Uh -huh. Yes. just says, uh, this amendment to the rule would make an order and amendment to be offered by Representative McEwen, which would ensure a competitive site selection process for locating future federal facilities utilizing advanced uranium enrichment technology. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Ralph Hall of Texas to be joined by the Honorable Joe Biden of Texas. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I, I, too, am grateful for the <clears throat> opportunity to talk about an amendment that I've uh, proposed to H.R. 776. 
And being from East Texas, uh, I'm naturally inclined to be a strong supporter of the oil and gas industry. But today I want to discuss another energy issue of importance to my home state. That's the electric generation and transmission. And there's been much talk about energy policies. Of course we need an energy policy. Everyone that runs for everything from Cottonware to President says, <coughs> excuse me, that we need an energy policy. As we see it, the energy policy that we really need is incentive to look for it and some reward for finding it. Now, what we do not need are disincentives, as I think this uh, amendment is directed toward. Actually, I filed for this amendment on Friday because that was a deadline with the full belief that we'll be able to work it out. Uh, no one on the committee opposes this amendment. It passed 42 to 1 in the committee, but it passed with the understanding that if anyone had any problems with it, that we'd take a second look at it. One person had some problems with it, not on the committee, but a person for whom I have respect, an attorney on the minority staff, and whether that problem was with FERC or wherever that was, I've not been able to, to outline that, but I respect it. In abundance of caution, we ask for this amendment uh, with the full knowledge that almost the belief that we will be able to work it out with Chairman Dingell. Chairman uh, Ranking uh, Minority Lent uh, supports it. Now, let me just very briefly uh, state that the state of Texas generates approximately 8.4 tenths percent of the nation's electricity, and most of it within what we call the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT. And you'll hear the word ERCOT a lot, and that's, that's simply a handle for uh, the uh, entity that, that, that handles the generation of this power. Now, ERCOT is the only power pool in the nation that lies wholly within the boundaries of one state. Uh, so since interconnections between ERCOT utilities and those situated outside the state are virtually non-existent, as a matter of fact, there's only one connection, and that's with somewhere out in West Texas and just across the state line over into Oklahoma. And even that has been agreed to and, and, and uh, has been approved. Uh, actually, uh, uh, this unique situation has given uh, the Public Utility Commission of Texas an opportunity over the past de uh, decade to develop its own rules with respect to the development of an open and non-discriminatory power transmission system. They were forced to because there was no other system in the country and, and no other uh, uniqueness uh, uh, in the thrust uh, existed. And in many ways, the Texas PUC transmission rules have really served uh, as to go before the legislation that we're going to consider this week in that they encourage the development of non-utility power generation. And uh, we talk about wheeling and, and co-generators. Uh, simply uh, a common term that's used for carrying or transporting someone else's power is what we call wheeling. Uh, for example, 10% of the power currently produced within ERCOT comes from a so-called qualifying facilities or what they call co-generators. Uh, Texas state law and PUC guidelines require ERCOT utilities to wheel uh, this uh, co-generated power on a non-discriminatory basis as uh, just and reasonable prices. At, at those prices. So I, I think I need to point out that no other state, uh, PUC, has established comparable transmission rules since the utility networks in practically every other state are multi-state in nature and therefore under the regulatory authority of FERC. Of course, we this is not without precedent. We have some other states that have their own uh, uniqueness and, and those are states uh, such as Alaska or Hawaii where they can't uh, be in interstate commerce. The so water lines uh, prohibits it. Uh, this is a similar situation to that that they have. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, for example, uh, they have their own system because they can't be engaged in an interstate commerce. So in Texas, there's just one interconnection, and that's an open and shut situation out in West Texas that the law, the federal law, already allows for it. Uh, Almost everyone that has discussed this, that, that we've discussed it with, including uh, Chairman Dingell, agrees that, that ERCOT's a well-managed and incredibly uh, reliable uh, electricity network. It's been a model 
and uh, I've used the word unique many times. Unfortunately, unless H.R. 776 is amended, though, I think that the act will create some unintended consequences that could be devastating to Texas and to ERCOT. Uh, I guess my real concern is that a double regulation situation would develop in which some clever parties could uh, whipsaw or forum shop between the state regulations and the federal regulations in order to obtain the most advantageous uh, deal. And you might say, well, why not uh, have them uh, be, why not allow them to do that? Well, if no other state has rules in place, and that's the situation, as Texas has, and the PUC is not going to back away. They have rules in place, and you'd have double regulation. I think it would uh, certainly not be in the best interest of utility rate payers <coughs> excuse me, to uh, uh, have this uh, incredible legal and regulatory mess that this amendment can preclude. Uh, a lot of people have suggested that the answer to this problem is simply to give FERC the exclusive jurisdiction over all the power transmissions. Well, <clears throat> I'd have to ask again how many state regulators that you know of that are willing to give up the regulations that they already have in place. And we don't think that'll happen in Texas. Uh, if we pass this bill unamended, the Texas PUC uh, would continue to enforce its transmission rules. FERC will impose new guidelines, and the energy attorneys, uh, of course, will make a killing. Uh, consider this. If you take away the authority of the Texas PUC to govern transmission within ERCOT, then you punish the most progressive state regulatory authority in the country with respect to electric generation and transmission. Also, there are many contracts already in, in place under the PUC regulation. I won't bother to, to read to you the points that were raised in Energy and Commerce Committee's markup, but uh, uh, they are in my uh, total uh, statement here, and I ask that you consider uh, the entire statement for the record well, without that, me Texas, going through it. Texas is a higher record will be on the the real problem is, is during uh, discussions with Energy and Commerce Committee staff over the last several weeks, some concern was, was expressed, and uh, I think maybe there will be some concern from part of the members here, that a simple ERCOT amendment from FERC jurisdiction could eventually lead to a situation where Texas transmission rules could potentially be unequal to those exercised throughout the rest of the, of the country. Now, I think one reason that there's no opposition to this amendment, and there was none on, on the committee, and there is support by, <clears throat> by both the Republicans and, and Democrats on the committee. I think the major reason is that our amendment addresses concern by giving FERC the ability to review the Texas PUC's transmission guidelines every five years to determine if that state uh, rules might result in an open or non-discriminatory transmission system in Texas. So uh, actually, rather than an over-regulation, you'd have a sanctuary for relief. If an interested party could prove to FERC's satisfaction that the Texas Commission is not on par with the rest of the nation, then FERC can exercise its jurisdiction over ERCOT. Uh, in closing, let me just thank uh, Mr. Barton and others uh, who have supported this, and we've had total support from almost every member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, but when you make an agreement that it passes without uh, the full debate in the committee, that if there is any problem later with anyone, including members of the staff for whom we have high regard, they do most of the work here, uh, I pulled, agreed to pulling it down and coming to you and asking for the right to put it on on the floor. I think Chairman Dingell will accept it, but he has not at this time, and I couldn't take a chance on him not doing it. Have you talked to uh, Chairman Dingle lately, Ralph? Yes, sir. <coughs> Even uh, Mr. Wu, who's handling this for Chairman Dingle, said uh, when we finish here to come to his office and we'd see if we could work it out. They, they've been very gracious with their time. Uh, uh, Chairman Dingle, I want on my side. He's like fire and, and water, a wonderful friend and a fearful enemy, so I, I want to sell it to him, and I, I don't want to have to try to cram it down his throat. Uh, no one's done that since I've been on the Energy and Commerce Committee in the last 12 years. But, uh, so I accept the impossible and cooperate with the inevitable, and that's uh, trying to get along with Chairman Dingle. <laughs> Thank you. Donald Joe Biden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've got a very unusual situation here. Uh, Congressman Hall, uh, with full knowledge of the staff, uh, full knowledge of the members of the committee, uh, put together his amendment. Uh, it was adopted uh, at committee uh, with uh, uh, almost no opposition, quite frankly. But 
as a part of the agreement, Congressman Hall said if somebody later on has a concern, he would allow that concern to be addressed before the bill was brought to the floor. And because Ralph is a man uh, who keeps his word when certain concerns were raised, he has pulled his amendment. I think the, the Rules Committee needs to understand that, that the committee considered this amendment the staff on the Republican and Democratic side had a chance to look at this amendment. It was accepted. It was voted on as part of the in-block amendments. Congressman Hall ex explained the amendment to the committee members that were there during the markup. And so what he's really doing is coming before the Rules Committee and saying now that, that some concern has been raised, he wants it made in order to, to offer it on the floor or to have it considered in the bill because it was literally voted on in committee. So this is a very unusual situation. Now, the crux of the matter in terms of the policy is that the state of Texas has developed its own intrastate transmission electric system. Intrastate. It has the highest reliability rating of any system in the country. The highest. We are doing in Texas what the committee print that came out of Energy and Commerce is now going to dictate for the rest of the country in terms of interstate transmission. So we're already there. We have a public utility commission that regulates this. We have the ERCOT system, the Energy Reliability Council of Texas, that, that cooperates in wheeling power around the state. And as Congressman Hall indicated, there is no connection between any other state except one connection but out in West Texas uh, that goes up into Oklahoma. One connection. So what we're asking is that an amendment that was debated and researched and, and, uh, and uh, disseminated the committee and voted on and accepted be allowed to remain. Now, because of the concern that's been addressed at the FERC, Ralph has withdrawn this. And, and several versions of substitute language have been offered. And he is continuing to try to work this out uh, in, a, in a very good faith effort. Because of the, the concern in Texas, there has been some discussion in both the Republican and Democratic delegation that if this amendment is not made in order or not accepted in some fashion that's acceptable to Congressman Hall and Congressman Dingell and Congressman Lent, that we will encourage all the Texas delegation to vote against the bill on the floor. Now, that's how strongly this is, is viewed. Now, hopefully that shouldn't be necessary. It really should not. But I would strongly, strongly encourage the Rules Committee to make in order Congressman Hall's uh, request because he has done absolutely everything any member of Congress would ever do to try to, to, to work this kind of an issue out. And again, in my opinion, it is very unusual to come to the Rules Committee and say, please make in order an amendment that the committee accepted by vote. It is unusual. <laughs> unusual. Uh, Mr. Billinson. No question, sir. Thanks. It is unusual, though. You're right, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, were you here when the Chairman Dingle was here, testified? Yes, sir. You, you hear, heard how he felt about some of these amendments? Uh, yes, sir. I, to mine, I have not, obviously I've let Congressman Hall deal with the chairman. Uh, I have talked to Norm Lent and the, and the Republican side, and we're very supportive. I mean, as I understand it, the concern is that some folks at FERC think that someday in the future, uh, the PUC in Texas might do something intrastate Texas that they wouldn't like. And so while they're in the, in the process of, of assuming this authority over all interstate transmission access, they might as well come in and take authority over intrastate. And they don't say that strongly. They say sometime in the future there might be a problem. And because of that, Congressman Hall has amended his amendment to say, well, let's look at it for five years. And then at the end of that five-year period, whatever these amorphous concerns that are out there in the, in the cloud somewhere, we'll have, we will have time to, uh, to see if there's any substance to them. I mean, to me, this is an open and shut case. We ought to, we ought to support Congressman Hall and, and, and go on to more serious things that, uh, that have national implications. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I, think, I think there's some opposition perhaps from FERC uh, through the staff. Uh, I think this is low on uh, Mr. Dingell's priority. I really expect him to 
work my amendment into one of his that you all probably will authorize. Well, he's been the bill very itself. cooperative. He, we have worked out yes, about a six or seven amendments yes. with, uh, with Mr. Dingle, and this seems like an amendment that should be able to be worked out. Well, if it's not worked out, though, I'd like to have a shot at it on the floor because there's not a single member of the committee that opposes it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I don't think you want to recognize me. Like, I've heard some outlandish stories about staffers running this place, but <laughs> this, this, this takes the cake. Well, I think it's and, more and You know respect. what you can tell FERC to do, don't you? I'll more, tell them for yeah. you. Yeah, I'd like to tell them that, but uh, well, I'll will. tell them on the floor. But out of respect to staff and, and in keeping my word with someone that I gave my word to on a fairly loose moment, I won't do that again. But you give your word at this place, you have to keep it. Well, I just, uh, I know we, we don't want to take up the committee's time, but your amendment passed by what vote? It passed in the bill, yeah. 42 to 1. Yeah. And, and everybody was for it, and now some staffer is against it. I, I hope we make your amendment in order. I'd love to get on the floor and talk about this. But we'll do everything we can for you. The concern was that when Ralph offered the amendment, because it was, it was unique to Texas, he did offer, if there were concerns raised later on, he would try to address those concerns. And he's honoring that commitment. And the staffer is, is a very helpful person, uh, and an honorable person, who has a legitimate problem. Uh, we simply gave our word, and I guess you keep your word to staffers like you do to members. So, but, but the issue itself, in my opinion, and every member of the Texas delegation, every member of the, of the Energy and Commerce Committee is an open and shut case. We should do in some version what Congressman Hall's amendment did in the committee. I thank the gentleman. <coughs> Frost. Well, I appreciate both of you uh, appearing before the committee. I think we have uh, exhausted this particular subject, and I assume that we will make the make your amendment in order. Uh, I would, did want to mention to uh, Congressman Barton, because I was out of the room when he was testifying previously, that uh, uh, when Congressman Dingell was here and Congressman Sharp, of course, they uh, said they had no object objection to the uh, Clement Barton Amendment being made in order as an amendment on the floor. They did object uh, to it being made as original text, but that it, and it clearly, uh, since they aren't opposing it being made in order, I assume that this committee will make it in order. I don't think Mr. Dingell has any problem with this amendment being made in order, but he's not told me directly he will support it. I think he will. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, just want to uh, say we fight for the rights of every single member here to be able to offer an amendment on the floor. And it seems to me that if the committee reported out unanimously an amendment that we might consider <laughs> allowing it to be offered on the floor. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs> The Honorable uh, Bill Richardson, New Mexico. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, five of the amendments that uh, I am requesting to be uh, offered were passed in uh, two committees that I serve on, Interior and Energy and Commerce. And I'm just making sure under the rules that I'm protected depending on what the vehicle is, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first one deals with uh, energy policy between the United States and the Western Hemisphere. I'm also uh, proposing an amendment concerning uranium imports. One dealing a simple statement in support of development of tar sand deposits. Uh, fourth, I'm proposing with Mr. Sinar an amendment to encourage federal agencies to conserve energy. I believe that negotiations are taking place uh, between the committees on this issue, and, and, and I believe an amendment, an agreement will be worked out. Fifth, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment dealing with a specific case in New Mexico, the Monitored Retrievable Storage Program, M MRS, which is part of DOE. Uh, I, I will recognize that this amendment, Mr. Chairman, has not uh, been considered the whole issue of high-level nuclear waste. I, I heard the discussion before. And I recognize that uh, it may be that the Rules Committee and the Chairman decide to, to deal with this in separate legislation. But I did want to initiate this and mention it to this committee. Thank you. Any questions of the Honorable Bill Richardson? Sherry? 
Bill, you said you had five amendments. We have ten listed here. Uh, no, they're, they're really five, uh, Mr. Solomon. What they are is they're drafted according to what vehicle it is that you're going to be uh, considering. Okay. And there was one on an OHO line extension that I'm not offering. And for instance, uh, the first one on the Western Hemisphere is three separate amendments depending on what the vehicle is, but it's really one issue. Are, are, the, are the five uh, germane to the bill? Yes, the yes they are. And they were passed in committee. They were passed in committee? They were passed in either commerce or in interior. But since we don't know what the vehicle is, I don't know if they've been incorporated in yet. That's Okay, none of them were, were in the uh, in the uh, energy and commerce bill. Yes, yes. There were, there, there was there in 776? <coughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, Mr. Are you talking about uh, Congressman Tozan's bill? I mean, Tassin. Okay. Tassan's amendment. Tarsan's amendment. Yeah. That's the most agreeable text. Well, I got four others, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Slaughter, questions? David. Thank you very much, Mr. Richardson. All right. The Honorable Dante Fasalo, Florida, to Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee. I'll be very brief. Here you are, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, on the matters that have been referred uh, to the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, you might be happy to appreciate that we've worked all those out with other committees, and hopefully they will be made part of original text, and if not, they'll be included in whatever amendment or manner in which this committee decides uh, those matters should be dealt with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now on the second matter. You're most appreciative, uh, but not, not surprised. <laughs> Well, you're mighty kind. Now, with regard to the uh, question of um, one other matter, and that's on the uniform treatment to offshore oil and gas leases in South Florida, North Carolina, and Alaska, the Interior Committee and the Merchant Marine Committee have uh, agreed on language. Uh, they've agreed on language about 90%, as I understand it, of the legislation. Uh, with the rest of the legislation. I would hope that they would get it all done and that there would be uh, an agreement between those two committees on matters to be incorporated either as original text, which would be my preference for dealing with the matter, or if not as original text, as a separate amendment. In any event, I'm here to, to say that if that is not done, because uh, for whatever reason, that then I would like to protect the opportunity for myself to offer an amendment on which everybody's agreed. We, we're now under a moratorium, and we're talking now about buying back and canceling leases that are out there, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, they're under a 10-year moratorium. The only thing that's happening now is that the price is going higher and higher every day and it meets the criteria that uh, certainly the Energy Committee itself lays down and even those in oil producing states that uh, the, these matters do not have high potential production but they have high environmental possibility damaging and therefore meeting that criteria it seems to me the sensible thing to do at this point would be to do what the two committees have indicated they would like to do, which is to go on and cancel those leases and buy them back before the cost keeps running out of sight. Now, if we don't do that, the problem we face is uh, that one, the moratoriums can change if they're not legislated, if you don't actually take the step to cancel. Uh, and the other is you subject yourself to lawsuits. It's not fair to property owners who came in under uh, auspices that were legitimate as far as the federal government's uh, offer to them, and they put up the money. Then they find out they're either subject to a moratorium uh, and with no payback. 
and they're going to just sit there. Well, obviously, they're going to have to do something about that. The only right thing to do is, as the two committees have agreed, is to cancel those, cancel those leases. Now, it affects uh, Alaska, it affects Florida, it affects Carolina, I think, in those, in those three cases, where production, amount of production, does not justify, in everybody's opinion, uh, the kind of chance you'd have to take. But you sit there taking a man's property and not going to pay him back. And that's not fair either. And all we're doing is running up the cost. And so, therefore, we need to get this matter settled. Somebody has to bite the bullet. The administrations for the cancellation of the leases, they have some other idea. I don't know what that is about how it's going to be paid back. In other words, how, how the property owners are going to be paid back. Uh, but I think the authorization needs to be clearly stated. So here we have Interior and Merchant Marine and Fisheries agreed as a matter of principle. I would hope that it can be included as original text in this bill. If the committee does not agree to do that for whatever reason, then I would hope that we could at least offer this amendment and get this much of it out of the way as part of our energy policy. And that's basically where I am, and I thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Fussell. Mr. <coughs> So, <laughs> Danny, what you say makes a lot of sense, and uh, um, I understand it's not that far away from being resolved, uh, but let me just tell the members that I had the privilege of being with the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, this past weekend at a NATO uh, meeting, and uh, Danny Vassell gave one of the finest extemporaneous speeches that I've ever heard in all my years of being associated in foreign policy, and uh, uh, Danny, you're to be commended for it. Well, my, my friend, you're mighty kind, I want to tell you. I really appreciate Everybody that. Appreciate that was it. a good meeting, I, I must say. Sure. Ms. Lord. I just want to say that I certainly support the chairman's request for an amendment in case that my amendment is not working. Thank you. I hope the committees can work it out. I mean, the language is agreed to, the principle is agreed to. It's whether or not they can work out the other 10% of, of the bills between the two committees. And I hope they can. And, and even if they just agree on 90%, it would be smart to get that 90% out of the way and, and put it in as original text. And if the Rules Committee doesn't want to put it in as original text, at least allow them to go with that 90% of it. And if we can't do that, then, it, you know, protect little old me, if you can. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Fussell. Thank you very much. Testimony. Mr. Smith. Mr. Robert Smith, Oregon. We'd be delighted to hear from you and have you put your entire statement in the record and summarize if you care to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're trying to operate under the five-minute rule. All that'll be less than three minutes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that advice. Um, should Title 13 uh, be eliminated from this bill, Mr. Chairman, then my amendments will not apply. But should Title 13 uh, survive, then it's essential that I be granted an opportunity to offer uh, three amendments which uh, have to do with really grandfathering in hydroelectric projects uh, around the country that have already applied for a FERC license. Uh, as you know, this is a battle in these amendments between states' rights over water and federal rights over water, which you're very familiar with, as I am. I don't want to get into that battle. All I'm asking here is an opportunity to grandfather uh, some 93 projects that are before FERC now, and the grandfather date would be April 1st, 1992. Uh, those, uh, those applications under great cost from $500,000 to $10 million per application, some of them ongoing for years, to change the rules of the game in the middle of this thing would be terribly expensive and costly uh, to the ratepayers and to those who are working on these projects. I have one in Oregon that's been before uh, for licensing uh, before FERC and the state for over four years. Twenty million dollars has been spent, not one dime of federal money in the project, not one dollar, and yet to, to change the rules as Title 13 may. Uh, would be terribly onerous and expensive. So I wanted to mention to Mr. Moakley, there are five of these projects in Massachusetts. I thought I'd catch his attention. I don't know how many in your districts, uh, but I'm seeking that out. But anyway, 93. So what we're suggesting is grandfathering those prior to April 1st, 1992, and then if you want to change the law with respect to states' rights versus the federal government, that's, uh, that's up to the uh, Congress. 
That's all I have. No questions. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, for your excellent testimony. Is uh, Mr. Conyers in the room? Mr. Horton? Mike Sinar. Yeah, I saw Mike. Congressman Sinar from Oklahoma. We'd be delighted to have you and have uh, Mr. Uh, Klinger testify with you and uh, be pleased to have you put your entire statement on the record and summarize if you care to do so. We're, we're trying to... We'll be very brief and we are here on behalf of the Government Operations Committee which reported uh, six amendments uh, to the H.R. Uh, 776 to Title I. Uh, four of those amendments uh, were unanimous, and there are only two amendments that are in disagreement uh, that we're offering today. Uh, these uh, are presented to you with modifications uh, that have been uh, made in order to try to secure the uh, consensus between energy and commerce and public works. You heard earlier from John Paul Hammersmith and Bob Roke concerning jurisdictional uh, problems that they felt existed. I'd like to call on Bill to take uh, the first half of our little presentation on with respect to the uh, procedural issues, and then I'll get into the substantive issues. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was here when uh, Chairman Rowe and, and John Paul Hammersmith testified with regard to the amendments which we are uh, here to discuss, uh, and I serve in the Public Works Committee as well as in Government Operations, and uh, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the, they have felt in the past that uh, particularly appropriations is intruded into the jurisdiction of the committee. I don't think that this really is, is applicable in this particular instance. Uh, in the first uh, place, I just want to make two points. Every committee, except one, I believe, went beyond uh, the, and this is sequential referral, went beyond their uh, signed jurisdiction. There, and we understand from talking with uh, staff uh, in the parliamentarian's office that uh, due to the time frame, the sequential referrals were, were certainly not exacting or very scientific and were seen more as guidelines than anything else. And in fact, Public Works uh, uh, did uh, look at uh, Title III, which is under the jurisdiction of government operations. So I think that in terms of, uh, of whether or not we were entitled to deal with this, uh, clearly uh, we were. The other uh, issue that was raised by um, Chairman Rowe and Mr. Hammersmith was the indication that uh, the General Services Administration would have severe objections uh, to including the contracting out provision, which uh, we are uh, advocating here this afternoon. Uh, actually, when GSA testified before our committee in government operations in March of this year, the specific question was asked of Mr. Walker, who is the Assistant Commissioner of GSA, uh, asked uh, by uh, Chairman Siner as to whether or not they would have objections to this, and he said, we don't have any problem with shared uh, savings or with performance contracting as long as it's non, not mandated for use. And our amendment does not mandate it for use. It is, uh, it is uh, an optional uh, availability and would not mandate it. So I think that uh, in terms of the GSA's objection, it really does not exist uh, and therefore should not be, uh, be considered. So I think what this, uh, what our two committee amendments in, uh, do, they specifically address procurement, contracting, and financial issues, uh, which clearly, uh, Mr. Chairman, fall within the jurisdiction of our committee, and we would hope that they would be uh, made in order. Or, and we are still, I might say, negotiating with the Public Works Committee in hopes that we can resolve this uh, contrary Tom before uh, before we actually get to the floor. But what we do, and just to take a couple of seconds on the substance of it, is is that the federal government, as you all are aware, is the largest energy consumer in, in the world. Uh, we consume about $10 billion a year, and that's about 2% of the whole energy use. It's our belief in government ops, and I think most members of Congress, that the federal government has a responsibility to lead on energy conservation, and if we don't, it's going to be very tough for us to give the private sector the orders to do that. The amendments are intended, very simply, to tear down the financial barriers of the conservation investment that we need to make in the federal government. It does it two ways. First of all, it expands the authorization of energy services contracts to the private sector. And these amendments would expand what is existing authority for the federal agencies to enter into contracts with the private sector. There's over 1,500 of these type of contracts already being exercised on the state and local level. We think it's if it's good enough for that kind of uh, government, it should be good enough for the federal government. 
The other thing it does is that it sets up an energy conservation revolving fund to pay for it. And the fund would simply be capitalized by transfers from the agencies from appropriated funds. They would then withdraw those funds to use for energy conservation. When they meet the levels that we would expect to, to be set by the Secretary of Energy, then they would get those funds back. This is a simple way to literally uh, make the cheapest investment in an energy bill. Uh, it gives the federal government an opportunity to take a leadership role. And as Mr. Klinger says, we think it's well within the, the jurisdiction of uh, what we were trying to do. And I would hate to think, and I'll close with this, that we would lose this opportunity. It would be years before we got back here. Uh, just on the basis of a jurisdictional dispute because I think it's an excellent opportunity for us to save billions, and I mean billions of dollars each and every year. Mr. Chairman, I would just ask that a statement by Mr. Horton with a letter to uh, uh, be entered in the record. If there's one thing we ought to be interested in that is saving billions and billions every year, I'm for you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, both very much for your testimony. The committee will now hear from Mr. Honorable Craig Thomas, Wyoming. Mr. Thomas, we'd be glad to put your entire statement on the record and have you summarize if you care to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I shall I shall do that, and I appreciate the opportunity and appreciate the task. You We're guys delighted delighted to have you have before the committee. You. I am doing a couple of things, I guess. One is um, I'm interested in asking for your support and the efforts of Chairman Dingle to eliminate Title Eight of the Interior Committee uh, uh, com committee's markup. It's the oil and gas and coal uh, section. It goes far beyond the original intent of Energy and Commerce uh, Committee. Does nothing to increase or enhance the supply of energy contains materials far better uh, developed in separate legislation. And I think you've heard from Chairman Dingell. I, number one, wish to support his request that that be done. Failing in that, Mrs. Bukanovich and I have an amendment, number 99, which essentially does the same thing and deals with Section 8. So that would be the second part. Then third, alternatively, I would hope one of those two things happens, but uh, we also have a, an amendment, number 98, which strikes subtitle Title C of, of this Title VIII, and that deals with the um, it deals with the abandoned mine land tax. Uh, two aspects of it. One uh, is it extends it until uh, I think 2010, which we think is in, inappropriate at this at this time. It costs about four billion dollars to do that. No real uh, evidence that that needs to be done at this time. Secondly, it rakes off 50 million dollars a year to go to a non-existent private retirement benefits uh, operation. Uh, neither of which needs to be done because the court has assured that those folks who are entitled to some health care will, will receive it. Finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, on Amendment Number 98, Mr. Orton of Utah and I have uh, brought forth an amendment asking the Secretary of Energy to issue federal loan guarantees to a project, some project, in the Intermountain region of Wyoming, Utah, and Idaho to demonstrate the productivity of MTB in a hydro skimming operation uh, that is very efficient, we think. Uh, would be good for this country and would provide uh, the kind of additives needed for gasoline in the Salt Lake market to help with the air quality. That's about it, sir. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Thomas. If you'd make yourself available for question, uh, Mr. Hall. Mm -hmm. Mr. Solomon. Appreciate you coming, Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. The committee will now hear from the Honorable Peter Hoagland. Mr. Hoagland, we'll be glad to hear from you and be glad to put your entire statement in the record, and I ask you to summarize if you care to do so. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will do that. I'm here on behalf of uh, Congressman B. Ryder and Barrett from Nebraska as well. Do they have statements that you would they, like to put in the record? They do, and I have them all here. They will be in the record without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the Act provides for grants of up to $100,000 to state regulatory agencies for energy conservation funds. Now, we in Nebraska have public power. We're the only state with public power. It's a reform led by Senator George Norris. So we don't have a state regulatory agency in Nebraska. As far as we know, we're the only state that doesn't have a state regulatory agency. Instead, we have a state energy office that customarily administers federal grant funds. So we have a small amendment here that would allow the state of Nebraska to apply for and receive funds through the state energy office so that we can apply for and receive funds like the rest of the states can. That's all the amendment does. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Hoagland. Uh, Mr. Solomon, do you have questions? No. Understand it. The chair has none. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me see. I see Mr. Rhodes. I'll call on you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John J. Rhodes, representative of Arizona. Delighted to have you. Mr. Rhodes' father was a distinguished member of this committee for many years. Was here when I arrived. Delighted Mr. to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, like uh, others who have appeared before you, uh, there are certain provisions in the uh, Interior Committee uh, version of this bill which I would earnestly hope are not made original text. Um, but if they are, then I have uh, submitted amendments which would allow me to move to strike those provisions on the floor. Uh, the first one, of course, is, is the Title I nuclear licensing provision that you've heard about before. I am a co-sponsor and, and strong supporter of the Barton Clement approach. Uh, it would be my hope that uh, Title I of the Interior version would not be part of the original text, that uh, both of them would be made in order as amendments on the floor so we can debate those issues directly. But if uh, the Rules Committee chooses to put Title I into the original text, then I've requested uh, uh, the authority to offer an amendment to strike that title. The same is true of Title II, Title, title III, and Title XIV. Uh, title II deals with uh, issues related to uh, uh, below regulatory concern radioactivity disposal. Title III deals with some uh, high-level nuclear waste uh, standards, and Title XIV deals with uh, Class C and other uh, low-level waste issues. Uh, these are not energy-related. Uh, they will produce no energy. Uh, they are uh, provisions that have had little or no attention in the Interior Committee in terms of hearings. Uh, they are pu public policy issues. Uh, they are specific changes in public policy as it relates to certain uh, nuclear activities. Uh, they should not be included in this bill to begin with. They certainly should not be brought to the floor for consideration without consideration in, in the appropriate committee of jurisdiction. Uh, the, the committee should know that um, the interior version of the energy bill was brought to the full committee for markup with no subcommittee hearings. Uh, it was not uh, shared with, nor was it uh, the, the product of cooperation with the minority. In fact, we saw the, the, the committee mark uh, the morning we began the markup. Uh, so not only are these provisions that, uh, that I'm talking about of, 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 of importance uh, and public policy issues, but also there are things that have not been given full consideration by the appropriate committees of jurisdiction and don't belong in this bill or don't belong on the floor at this time. I have another amendment which I am proposing to offer, and this relates to the high-level nuclear depository at Yucca, at Yucca Mountain. As you know, this is uh, uh, a, an issue of, of extreme concern uh, and not, no little controversy. Uh, in 1988, the Congress, rightly or wrongly, designated Yucca Mountain as the single high-level waste depository in the country and directed the Department of Energy to begin site characterization to determine if it is the appropriate place. Uh, we've had nothing but trouble in getting uh, the appropriate uh, permits out of the state of Nevada uh, and have reached the point where we have uh, the Department of Energy has has been in court with Nevada on numerous occasions. Uh, all court decisions have been decided in favor of the, of the Department of Energy and uh, the uh, but the state of Nevada has stated over and over and over again through its governor, through its senators, through its uh, um, members of the delegation that they intend to do what they can to prevent the depository being built at Yucca Mountain and that they will use their permit authority uh, to delay and, and hopefully in their mind to kill the project. This has caused some in the Congress to say that uh, it will be necessary for the United States Congress in order to carry out the national purpose of providing a nuclear, a high-level nuclear waste depository to preempt Nevada's laws and Nevada's authorities. I think most of us are very, very reluctant to do something like that. Now, it is true that Nevada has now issued the necessary permits for the preliminary site characterization work to proceed, and that work is proceeding. 
It is also true that the state of Nevada has, subject to court order, said that future licenses that will be required will be processed by the state of Nevada in the regular order as any other license would be processed. It is also true that there are some who are skeptical about Nevada's uh, uh, resolve in, in, in that regard. Uh, the Department of Energy will not need another license or permit for another two to three years. It's my judgment that it is not necessary now for us to take the very draconian step of preempting the laws of one of our sovereign states. We have the permits, we are proceeding, we have their word that they will, um, that they will deal with us in, as I say, the regular order when we need the next licenses. However, my amendment uh, takes into consideration the possibility that we get to that point in two to three years from now and we find that Nevada's resolve is not as strong as, as it is now, that they do begin to obstruct us again. Uh, we're leading the Department of Energy either back into Congress for relief or into court, uh, delaying the project further, possibly causing it to, to have to cease while either a court or the Congress straightens out what needs to be done. And so my, my amendment is sort of in the nature of a preemptory strike. Uh, it would require the department and the state to negotiate a schedule for the issuance of all 15 remaining licenses that will need to be issued over the course of the uh, site characterization of the project. And if Nevada is, does not adhere to the schedule and does not provide uh, reason to Congress that, is, that convinces Congress that there's a reasonable reason for not adhering to the schedule, then the, the department would have the authority to, uh, to go through Nevada's own process and issue those licenses and permits itself. It also gives ne the, the amendment, gives Nevada re recourse to the court uh, if they believe that uh, uh, either their failure to adhere to the time schedule is, is, uh, is there's good cause and good reason for it or if they feel that uh, the Department of Energy is not proceeding under the terms of the license and is not proceeding uh, under the ter terms and conditions of Nevada's environmental uh, laws and regulations. It's, uh, it's a mid-ground between preemption and, and just simply hope. Uh, and it, uh, it would give us and the department a vehicle to use uh, three or so years from now or ten or so years from now if Nevada once again uh, resorts to its tactics of trying to obstruct uh, the process. But it does not uh, take, as I mentioned or, or as I characterized it, the very, very drastic and draconian step of this Congress just simply preempting the, the laws of the state of Nevada on the assumption that Nevada is not, is not going to assist us later on. So I would hope that you you would uh, consider that amendment and make it in order as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Rose. Does your uh, amendment number 48, does it do away with the linkage between the MRS and Thank the uh, and the uh, permanent repository? Thank you very much for mentioning that. that uh, well, you know. It does. And that's a very important part of the amendment. And I'm sorry I, I, I neglected to mention it. Yes, it does delink uh, the uh, the start of construction on the on the repository and uh, proceeding with the MRS. I, th I think that uh, the work on the repository has been delayed so long that uh, we are not going to be able to fulfill our obligations to accept for the United States to accept high-level waste at, a, at an MRS by 1998. Uh, if, if we do not delink that and allow the uh, Department of Energy to proceed to designate a site for an MRS and, and to actually construct one. So yes, the amendment does take away that, that linkage. Well, I, I regret that very much since I was the one who wrote the language uh, in the bill. Well, I understand. Uh, and I will tell you why I did it. You know, uh, <clears throat> my district probably has as much, if not more, nuclear than any other district in the United States. And waste. We have uh, about... Uh, 40,000 gallons, I think, of very highly radioactive toxic waste in the districts and a number of reactors and whatnot. And the reason I put that in there is because I do not support MRSs. I have seen and watched this problem for 25 years. MRSs, in my opinion, are merely another excuse 
to put off dealing with the final answer to the problem, and that is some sort of permanent repository. And if we allow the Department of Energy or, or others to build MRS, as it is my opinion, that that will just put off the, uh, the permanent repository problem uh, that much longer. You know, the reason we have this tremendous waste problem of nuclear waste in this country today, in my opinion, is that of the nuclear cycle, <clears throat> the tail end of it, the waste portion is the portion that we as a, as a, as a government uh, have failed uh, to deal with. We took all the benefits of nuclear for 50 years, but we refused to deal uh, with the waste. And, uh, you know, I've spent a large part of my legislative career, frankly, uh, trying to keep pressure on private industry as well as the Department of Energy and others to move ahead with this waste problem uh, with some little success, but not near as much success as I had hoped. Could I respond? Yes, sir. I remember very well the, the, the debate uh, when we put together the bill that uh, designated Yucca Mountain, and I remember very well your concerns, and I think your concerns at that time and now are, are very well taken. Uh, I think there's a different situation now. When we were debating that bill, when we were putting it together and brought it to the floor, as you know, the Department of Energy was had been had been dithering for years about uh, reducing the number of sites that they were going to look at and so forth. And finally, I think Congress just uh, threw its hands up in despair and said, we're going to take that away from you. We're going to, to decide. Now, that was unfortunate for us to have to do that. Uh, but we did it. And, and it's done. Uh, at that time, uh, not a shovel full of dirt had been turned and even trying to figure out if a site was appropriate. A lot of work has been done at Yucca Mountain. Uh, I'm one of very few members of the House who's actually set foot on Yucca Mountain. Uh, and a lot of work has been done. A lot of money has been spent. We have appropriated a lot of money. We have now got at least the first hurdles, uh, regulatory hurdles from the state of Nevada out of the way. I think the, the Congress and the Department are focused on the absolute necessity that we do what we have to do about, about high-level waste. And so I'm satisfied that the process we could not see being done four plus years ago when we passed this bill is now in process. It, it is being done. And we are providing the money, and the Department of Energy is providing the, the, uh, the energy to get the job done. I think now it is time for us to focus on what we will do uh, with these very large quantities of high-level waste in the, in the meantime until Yucca Mountain is ready to accept permanent, uh, accept its status as a permanent repository. Uh, if, if Yucca Mountain were not proceeding as satisfactorily as I think it is, I, I would still agree with you, and I would still think we should maintain the linkage. But we do have a statutory obligation to, for the United States to begin to accept this waste in 1998, and we've got to have some place to put it, and Yucca Mountain certainly is not going to be ready in 1998. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mr. Rhodes, um, you know, this isn't the first time that we've, uh, we've had members come before the committee and, uh, and talk about some problems in the Interior Committee. Uh, and it's yours, with this situation of bypassing subcommittees again, uh, leads to uh, some other horror stories that we're hearing here today. Staffers pulling amendments that have overwhelmingly passed committees and have disappeared. Uh, uh, I want to point out to you that on uh, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, tomorrow and the next day, we, this committee is going to be holding hearings on the uh, hamilton Gratison congressional reform. Uh, the members are going to testify the next day on Thursday. But um, it really would be nice if you could come and just talk about some of these problems uh, because, you know, it's the crux of the problem that we have here today. It's why this Congress is not working the way it was meant to be. And if we followed the rules and uh, stuck to germaneness, I think we could be a lot more successful than we are and be held in much higher esteem by the American people. So if you find time, why don't you come by and see us and just uh, mention some of these problems. It I'd would be, be helpful. I'd be happy. Thank to you thank for coming. You, Mr. Mr. Hall. Thank you very much, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Let me see. Uh, Mr. Ray Hall, I think, is, uh, is uh, who is next up? Uh, Mr. Lewis. 
Mr. Gadenson, we'll be hey, delighted to Mr. hear from you. Mr. Chairman, I'll be Distinguished brief. member from Connecticut, we'd be glad to have you put your statement on the record put, and summarize. I'll put my entire statement on the record. I'm only going to speak about uh, amendment number three. It's a very simple amendment and what is, you know, um, a frightening, I think, in a way, development. I'm in favor of hydropower. I've always been a proponent of hydropower, but it's got to have some rational basis. And what we find now is that FERC is giving licenses to develop hydropower at park sites where the amount of power, you know, can barely run a light bulb year round. So what I have in my district at two locations, and I can't even figure out the end game here, is that companies have gone to FERC to get license for a one megawatt hydro project that would run about three quarters of the year if they're lucky. Uh, and this had happened at a historic site called Indian Leap in Norwich, and there's another one, another part of this. But it seems to me that what we should do is uh, we should at least give the states and the local governments the ability to protect their core park. So we're not the West. We don't have tens or hundreds of thousands of acres for our people to roam around in. We have some isolated facilities of particular historic or scenic beauty, and we're finding that FERC is saying, we don't care if the state and the town are against this. I've got one very small town in my district that's already spent $50,000 of their taxpayer money because a company wants to put a hydro park right in the middle uh, of, of, of their town in, in, in what is a very scenic and historic site. And it seems to me we ought to at least give the people a chance to say, in our community, for one megawatt of power, less than that, I guess if you average over the year, it's three quarters of a megawatt of power, uh, to put this facility in what is a very small, the, the spot they're going to put it on uh, is basically, you know, the size of this room. It's a very small, narrow falls, and putting plumbing all through it is going to destroy it. It's called Indian Leap in Norwich, but it's not even the specifics of my district. It's just giving communities a chance to have some uh, fight. So I hope the committee give me the ability to bring this to the floor and to make sure that it's clear that when FERC looks at these things, that state and local governments, if they've taken an action to make an area of significant beauty and history uh, a site that they ought to be um, able to protect that. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Mr. Hall? No, Mr. Sullivan? Thank you, Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Vakanovich, delighted to hear from you. General lady from Nevada, Thank glad you, to have Chairman. you put your entire statement on the record and summarize if you care to do so. Thank you very much. I'll do that with uh, some prov some provisions at least to talk about Yucca Mountain. Um, I'm asking that you craft a rule today that would make in order an amendment concerning high-level nuclear waste that I seek to protect the interests of Nevadans and others concerned about federal preemption of state jurisdiction. Furthermore, as ranking member of the Subcommittee on Mining and Natural Resources, I seek an amendment to strike the coal, oil, and gas title adopted by the Interior and Insular Affairs Committee. I will address these amendments in that order. Um, you have an historic opportunity today to defend one of the most important and basic principles of this country, a principle that recognizes the rights of individual states. In this case, Mr. Chairman, it's the right of individual states to exercise primary, primary jurisdiction under the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts and other federal and state environmental laws. But there is more at stake here today than even that important right. At issue is whether the federal government can arbitrarily steal that authority and that responsibility away from a state. We're talking about permitting authority as it relates to a site characterization at Yucca Mountain in Nevada's 2nd Congressional District for the permanent underground storage of nuclear waste. That issue profoundly affects my district and the lives of my constituents. Tomorrow, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we could discuss an issue that affects the daily lives of your constituents. We're setting a precedent here today, and that precedent might very well determine how this committee rules on similar issues in the future. Would this committee allow the federal government to steal permitting authority from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, or perhaps the states of South Carolina, New York, Tennessee, or the other states whose representatives sit here today on this committee? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, to protect the issue of states' rights and the vital interests of Nevada's residents, I ask today that you permit the introduction of an amendment to strike Title VIII from the Energy and Commerce Committee's bill that will be debated in the House. The DOE now has all the federal and state environmental permits necessary to go forward with site characterization in earnest. Furthermore, the General Accounting Office found the DOE was not prepared to begin site disturbing activities until February 1991 because the Satisfactory Quality Assurance Plan had not been approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. In other words, the longer delay was of DOE's own making, not the state of Nevada. Further, Title VIII would remove the current limitation in law that a repository be designed to store no more than 70,000 metric tons of high-level waste. The Energy and Commerce Committee apparently wants to put all the spent fuel from the entire nation under Yucca Mountain so that the problem of siting a second repository can be avoided. This provision is ill-advised and would compound the folly of the 1987 amendments wherein Congress limited the number of sites to be studied to just one in order to save money. Mr. Chairman, at the Interior Committee markup of April 8th, I offered an amendment to strike Title VIII from the Energy and Commerce Committee reported bill. It was adopted unanimously because our members from both sides of the aisle were persuaded that such action would be an extremely dangerous precedent in federal and state re re relations. It was a vote for states' rights, not a vote against nuclear power. Site characterization of Yucca Mountain will continue without enactment of preemption language. Indeed, I believe enactment of Title VIII would actually hinder the effort to find solutions to the nation's nuclear waste problems. Public trust and confidence will be even more seriously eroded if the Congress chooses to steamroll Nevada a second time. You must not allow hardball politics to smother legitimate concerns that the DOE's site characterization efforts be environmentally sound. Please make in order my amendment to strike this title. I note that Congressman Jim Bilbray, my colleague from Nevada, will testify later and strongly joins me in this request. I will also ask that uh, should the oil, gas, or, and coal title of the Interior Committee amendments be made original text, that my other amendment to strike, and that is number 55, be made in order. My understanding is that the Energy and Commerce Committee opposes the inclusion of most sections from Interior's Title VIII. I concur and add that the provisions are largely counterproductive to the sound national energy policy we seek in this bill. And I will ask to have the balance of my statement put in the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Convich. Uh, I won't bore you with, uh, you were here when, when I was speaking to Mr. Rhodes. And as I said then, you know, I think that I probably have as much uh, high-level waste as any district in the country, and more than, maybe more than any, I, I'm not sure. And the reason, uh, one of the primary reasons I have it is that there is a cardinal rule when it comes to nuclear waste, and that is that once it is put there temporarily, it never moves. And I've not had anyone be able to prove me uh, otherwise. And the fact that we have never dealt with in this country, seriously, in my opinion, the, uh, the long-term uh, waste problem. You know, I know you don't want that stuff out in Nevada, but no one else wants it either. I know that and, well. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and I know it puts you in, and I certainly have deep feeling for the position it puts you in. But, you know, uh, you know, beginning with the Commerce Clause, I guess, of the Constitution, they were the, the country has decided from time to time there are times that, that we have to do things like this. And um, that's... You know, well, I hear you, Mr. Chairman, but I think the important issue that I'm, I'm emphasizing here is the state's preemption. And I think um, uh, our state has complied uh, with the requests for the licensing, and I think they're willing to do that. But I don't think that the federal government should come in and take their rights away. That's Thank simple. You, uh, Mr. S uh, I beg your Mr. Uh, Frost. Yeah, no problem. Mr. Sullivan. <coughs> Virginia, as a states writer, I certainly, I certainly share your view and we'll do what we can to help you. Uh, let me just understand, uh, 65, uh, your, your, your amendment 65 deals only with the energy and commerce uh, reported version of the bill? 
Well, it's Title VIII, which, yes, it's Title VIII, and that includes also um, limiting or raising the cap, taking the cap off, and also an MRS provision in okay. there. But, but the, that... that um, is, Yes, that There's is not, the, you, you aren't looking to strike anything in any of the other versions, just that one on that that's, issue. That's right. And then, and then on your other resol your other amendment, um, that deals only with the Interior Committee. Right. Okay. And that's just a striking amendment as well. Right. Okay. Appreciate okay. you coming. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. There's a number of members of my committee that are that are here, and I assume that they will they'll be called on, and I and I will stay to. Uh, I do, Mr. Chairman, if I can include the uh, the record and thank the members of the committee for the time and appreciate and tell you that I appreciate the struggle that you're going through to see if we can get a a workable rule for a. Uh, uh, not only a difficult bill, but a very difficult uh, topic, as we all know, for this country and this Congress to to address. I think that uh, the work that was done by the uh, by the Interior Committee is comprehensive uh, in scope within the jurisdiction of that committee. We spent some 12 hours marking that bill up, letting every member of the committee offer any amendment that, that he or she desired to offer under a complete open process, recognizing that if, in fact, we were going to deal with the national energy policy, we had to let people offer those amendments that they thought were important. What emerged was a, a bill with uh, uh, with bipartisan support on, on numerous amendments and for the final work product of the uh, uh, of the committee. This was according to the, uh, hello Mr. Chairman, uh, this was according to the script that we had discussed over over the preceding year uh, with the leadership that, that Energy and Commerce Committee would take the lead on the development of the uh, of the energy bill and when they were done the other committees of jurisdiction would be given time and the freedom to work their will on those components of, uh, of energy uh, uh, legislation that was within their jurisdiction as they saw fit to make a contribution to this uh, to this national comprehensive energy bill. The other seven committees of, of, uh, of jurisdiction did as the Interior Committee did, reported their bills and did it within the time frame and under the constraints suggested by the, uh, by the leadership. And I think it's essential that the work product of those committees be uh, be made part of the original floor vehicle for consideration by the uh, by the full house. That was the understanding when uh, when we had the various chairmen's meetings with the leadership. It's been under discussion since the time the committees have reported their bill, and I think it reflects the dignity of each of those committees. The Interior Committee, entitled uh, uh, the Energy Development Environmental Protection Act, reflects exactly that: that our committee not only has jurisdiction over much, most of the public resources of this uh, of this country but we also have jurisdiction over the environmental laws of, uh, of this country and recognize that energy must be twofold it must not only seek to produce additional energy but it must seek to do so in an environmentally sound manner and in a sustainable manner absent that we're not going to be able to pass the kind of energy policy or are we going to be able to support it over a long period of time should we pass it we believed in the committee and that's why I offered every member of that committee the opportunity to offer any amendment they wanted, that this had to be a publicly debated subject matter. Because we have seen that a number of uh, uh, industries, if you will, or components of our national energy strategy have fallen on hard times, where the public feels they have been shut out from the decision-making process, where the public feels that they have not been able to participate. And we get into the questions of NIMBY and blocking the flow, be it of energy product and or energy, energy waste and we believe that by by making sure that the, that the, that process is open to the public that uh, that in fact we can have a sustainable comprehensive energy policy I think that this committee has taken a good initial first cut when it with the uh, with the draft documents suggesting the the basic starting points for the floor debate on the uh, on the energy bill but I also think that that uh, that draft document can be improved by making in order the following energy committee titles of the for the original text for the purposes of amendment and I have those listed in my in the copy of my testimony that I believe you have 
These are items that are within the committee jurisdiction uh, of the Interior Committee. These are items where we have chosen to legislate, again, on a bipartisan basis. Other committees have chosen not to legislate, and we believe, as again, as, as, as was discussed over numerous meetings with the leadership, that these should be made a part of the original text. Having said that, I also think that members ought to, ought to have the right to motion to strike because there are people who disagree with what the Interior Committee has done, or to offer a substitute amendment to what our committee or other committees have done. That way, we will play out a real debate over comprehensive energy policy in this, uh, in this country. This is what our committee has chosen to do. It doesn't mean it's written in stone. It doesn't mean it's, it's, it's right on every point. And so we certainly recognize that the Rules Committee has got to preserve the rights of other committees to, uh, to offer a motion, or, or other members to offer a motion to strike or to come up with a substitute and a, your wisdom to make those in order or not. And I think that that can be done and we can still uh, uh, have a, a, uh, a, a good debate and also I think a, 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 uh, a, an expeditious debate of this matter over the coming couple of, uh, of days. Let me, let me try and clarify uh, some discussion that has taken place I believe earlier this morning with, with the uh, members of the Energy and Commerce Committee with respect to our Title I, which deals with the questions of, of, of nuclear licensing. And that is, that there has been under discussion some proposals that we would drop our provisions uh, and then we would simply go to conference with current law versus what uh, Senator Johnston and the Senate have, have, have deemed in their wisdom to put into their, uh, to their bill. Uh, I am very amenable to that uh, to that discussion, but it was also part of those discussions that the uh, the Barton Clement Amendment would then not be offered because simply one. We would, we would not be in the bill with it, with those provisions that have, that have caused so much controversy. And secondly, that amendment uh, has received no committee consideration by any of the committees of, uh, of jurisdiction. If that, if that continues to, uh, to be under discussion, we certainly are amenable to that and willing to discuss that. Should that not happen? then I would, as, as I insist with the rest of the titles, uh, that you make in order our Title I, and if there's a motion to strike, or if there's a, an amendment as in the means, in the, in the, uh, by virtue of a substitute offered by Mr. Uh, Barton and Clement or somebody else, that's fine too. But if, if, if that's going to be the case, then we would ask the Title I be made part of the original document, as we believe uh, we are entitled to as a committee of, of jurisdiction. And, uh, I, you know, obviously, uh, you have to exercise your your judgment about the the questions of uh, of waiving the points of order and germaneness and so forth that you uh, uh, that you ordinarily do in this uh, uh, in this committee. I would say that uh, there's also been a suggestion that somehow some of the topics that we deal with are not energy related issues. Uh, the, the suggestion was made of the coal, oil, and gas uh, suggestions to uh, uh, that they should not be included, and yet we find that the congressional Budget Office estimates that this title would increase federal revenues by more than $200 million in 96 and 97 by encouraging oil and gas leasing, providing incentives for coal mining under the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. We think that's an important part of the energy package. And finally, let me say again, we deal with some issues of waste. It's hard to believe that you're going to have the revitalization of the nuclear power industry in this country if we don't deal with the issues of waste. We all know that it's the end of the debate that is stymieing the first steps forward to a new policy with respect to nuclear policy in this country. People say if you can't deal with waste, we don't even want to talk about a new generation of, of facilities. And so those two must be combined if we are in fact having a real uh, uh, comprehensive policy. We must deal both with the public's desires and their concerns. They desire to see us more energy uh, sufficient. They desire to see more production. They have concerns about the environmental impacts, about the impacts on their neighborhoods, their communities, and their, uh, uh, their states, as we see witnessed in, in a whole series of amendments independent of this bill about preserving the rights of states to have a veto, to have more say in what happens to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, the leftovers, if you will, from, uh, from energy development in this country. I also think that with respect to the couple of the titles uh, dealing with the Outer Continental Shelf, that we've basically reached an agreement with Merchant Marine uh, uh, and, uh, Committee uh, and Public Works Committee 
and also uh, the questions of transportation of, uh, uh, of nuclear materials, we would assume that we would reach agreement there with the, uh, with the other committees where we have overlapping jurisdiction. So in fact, what we bring you is a bill that uh, may be controversial, but not in conflict with the jurisdictions and the preservations of jurisdictions of the other committees or our own committee. And we were assured by the leadership that if we follow this schedule, if we follow this arrangement, that uh, while clearly uh, Mr. Dingle would be the maestro of the orchestra, that all of the other, uh, all of the other parts would be included in the symphony. And we would be co-equals and jurisdictions would not be uh, uh, harmed in any fashion one way or another because we didn't all act in a simultaneous fashion. And I think that the, uh, the progress that this committee has made over the last couple of days in trying to sort these materials out, in fact, provides uh, holding harmless those committees that share jurisdiction where there's no conflict, committees that have sole jurisdiction, and other committees have chosen not to act. And in fact, what we will have is, I think, a good debate. We will have motions to strike, and some will prevail and some won't. And when we're done, I think we will have a, a vehicle that will have continued bipartisan support, and we will go to conference with the Senate. And I think everybody a party to this debate on both sides of the aisle is determined that we get a, a comprehensive national energy bill that we can send to the president, the president will sign. That's the goal. And uh, down the road, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of pressure on people on different issues to, to, to amend their provisions or to drop their provisions or what have you as we seek uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of energy legislation. And I believe that the, uh, the, the Interior Committee uh, bill is consistent with that. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for listening uh, to me and I have other members of my subcommittee chairman and members of the committee who are here to testify I would be more than happy just to sit aside and if you have questions later or now however you'd like to proceed uh, why don't we, uh, bring up the Honorable right out. thank you mr. chairman okay. mr. chair we have Peter oh. the other subcommittee uh, uh, chairman with, with the controversy. And then we have members who have amendments in the bill or seat. Might might be better if we could have the two chair two chairmen, subcommittee chairmen uh, and have Mr. in the two rankings and have Mr. Miller available. Uh, and I think we could expedite it a lot faster. That's all right. No one the ranking members here? Uh, I don't think this is yeah. uh, they're, they're all not right. Right. Yes, I mean, They're with us on all this, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> 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 okay, Mr. Chairman, uh, Barbara Vukanovich, my ranking minority member on uh, mining, already testified on other provisions of the bill, as, as Jerry knows. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, okay, Barbara, please. okay, thank you. Uh, th this is a bill vitally important to our national security and energy independence in this country. Many committees, many members, many staff members have put in countless hours, days, and months in preparation for this bill that you and your wisdom will decide uh, what will be the ultimate vehicle that will travel the course of the House of Representatives later this week. I do have uh, a lengthy statement that I would like to be made part of the record which does explain the provisions in Title VIII in its entirety. Well, it, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Title VIII, which I do commend to you, uh, is the portion of the Interior Committee bill involving coal, oil, and gas. As it relates to this title of the Interior Committee bill, it's my understanding that there is disagreement with the other committees on two provisions. At least I must say, Mr. Chairman, that had been my understanding until this morning uh, when I believe the Energy and Commerce Committee renewed its concerns over Title VIII, despite earlier uh, assurances and commitments that were given. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the uh, provisions of this title have despite earlier uh, assurances and commitments that were given. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the uh, provisions of this title have as much to do with energy as anything reported by the Energy and Commerce Committee. We are, of course, here dealing with federal coal, oil, and gas leasing. Amendments to the SMACRA Act of 1977, uh, the Surface Mining Act, uh, also are involved, as Chairman Miller uh, mentioned in his statement. And we are dealing with the justifiable concerns of coal-filled residents of the Appalachian region. These matters are not within the jurisdiction of any committee other than the Interior Committee. 
Moreover, these items represent important aspects of what we should, what we believe should be a part of any national energy strategy. So I would ask this committee, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, to allow these matters to per proceed in the base text of the bill as reported by the Interior Committee. My written statement does go into uh, two matters in Title VIII where we are experiencing some difference of opinion with the Armed Services Committee and with the Science Committee. One item in contention involves our proposal to extend the federal mineral leasing laws to two naval oil shell reserves in western Colorado. It is my understanding that the Armed Services Committee maintains that the Interior Committee was not acting within its jurisdiction on this matter. With all due respect, Mr. Chairman, and with all due respect to uh, the Armed Services Committee, we cannot agree with that. The second item in dispute involves the geothermal energy provisions of the Interior Committee's bill. These provisions pertain to the U.S. Geological Survey, whose programs are under the Interior Committee's jurisdiction. Mr. Chairman, that, includes my, that concludes rather my brief summary of the bill, and I would, at the proper time, I'd be glad to respond to questions in detail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll try to do this very briefly. I know you've been here all morning and have a lot more time to go in the afternoon. I have seven uh, quick points I'd like to make. All involve provisions which I'd like you to include in the underlying vehicle. The first is the bill introduced uh, by uh, Congressman Miller, the BRC bill, Below Regulatory Control. What it says very simply is if the NRC deregulates below regulatory control and allows contaminated substances to be placed in ordinary landfills, that the states would then, and only then, have the right to enact stricter standards. That's number one. Number two, uh, we'd like you to allow the provision which is in the bill, which directs the EPA to establish standards for the cleanup of contaminated sites, that is, sites contaminated by radioactivity. There are no standards under current law we think there ought to be. Number three, uh, if a state designates a river in that state as protected under the wild, state wild and scenic provisions, uh, this provision would prohibit FERC from licensing a hydropower dam or project on that state protected river, which they can do under current law and overrule a state. Secondly, uh, in my own district in Pennsylvania, uh, FERC provided a license to a private party to build an, a hydroelectric project on a, on, a, on a river, and the private party was then allowed to condemn state parkland through which that river flowed. We would change that, not allow <coughs> private parties to condemn state parkland after giving a, getting a FERC license. Number four, uh, the Vice President's Council on Competitiveness. This amendment which I offered, which is in the bill, would require the Vice President's Council to operate under the Administrative Practices Act so that all of their activities would be fully, completely, and totally open to the public, not conducted in secret as they are now. Uh, number five, uh, depending on what you decide to do with the situation with Nevada and the so-called screw Nevada language and the Yucca Mountain matter, I would like to have the right to offer on the floor a, a, a compromise. There is, as you know, a, a provision which the people of Nevada feel is damaging to them in the Energy and Commerce Bill, but not in the Interior Bill. My provision is a compromise uh, which would uh, not allow the federal government to overrule the state of Nevada, but would simply give the federal government, mainly DOE, exp expedited procedure in federal courts if the state of Nevada continues to delay, as I think they have. Last, I think, Mr. Chairman, number seven, and most important, is the one-step nuclear licensing. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly prepared not to offer uh, the language uh, which I offered and which is in the Interior Bill if the Clement Barton language is not offered. Uh, and I hope we can get that side to agree not to offer their language. I won't offer my language, and we can go back to existing law. Very briefly, Mr. Chairman, uh, the NRC promulgated a rule on licensing. Uh, they were sued by the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, and the NRC was upheld on all but one point. The one point they weren't upheld on said that if you complete construction of a plant, you've got to have a hearing before you allow the plant to operate if there is new information which comes to light. The NRC gets the gets the right to decide if there is new information which comes to light. That's the existing law. Clement Barton would overturn that and give them virtually everything they want. We're willing not to offer our language. We'd just like to stick with existing law. Uh, that concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to have taken as much time as I did. Thank you very much. Any questions of Chairman What's for a vote? as I understand it, uh, as far as Clement and Barton is concerned and your uh, nuclear licensing provision, that you would withdraw your uh, uh, nuclear licensing provision provided the committee did not make an order or an amendment of Clement Barton. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. 
and if we do, then you would ask that we also make yours uh, in order as well. I would, sir. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Miller is still here, too, and uh, so I will say to, uh, to the chairman and his two subcommittee chairmen, you know, what we, we all want is, a, is an energy bill, and I know we're all striving <laughs> that direction. But uh, before you came in, I uh, submitted the administration's official position, which you probably have by now. But uh, they sum up by saying that the administration has proposed and the Senate has adopted legislation that would achieve this critical balance. Uh, they go on to say that the President encourages the House of Representatives to follow the Senate's lead uh, and pass a balanced energy uh, legislation. Uh, and then they cite uh, certain provisions which would not be acceptable, uh, in which case it would draw a veto. And, uh, I think that's what we're, we're all a little worried about here, that we don't uh, uh, get ourselves into a position where we come back with a veto and it's sustained and we have nothing and all this work goes over to the next Congress, which it probably will since there's only, uh, what, 33 or four or five days left of legislative uh, work days before we hopefully adjourn. Uh, because of that and because the nuclear issue is so uh, uh, controversial, uh, it seems to me that because uh, Chairman Dingell and the Energy and Commerce Committee did not choose to, to deal with the nuclear issue, therefore it's not really a part of you know, their bill, and they, have, they are the lead, lead committee, it just seems to me that so that this issue could be, and George, I know you're in favor of, uh, of a uh, wide open debate on the issues and let the chips fall the way they may. Always try to support the minority on those. Well, I know you do, and uh, we appreciate that. Never and, vote uh, to cut off debate. Uh, in this case, we have a lot of uh, majority on our side. Uh, <laughs> but um, it just seems to me that we ought to take your nuclear provisions uh, that you are proposing and uh, in the form of an in block amendment or however we work it out, and uh, let you try to attach that to the, uh, to the bill. Now that would give us a clean, open debate. Uh, doing it the other way around, uh, making it an original part of the text, as you know, Chairman Dingell objects to that, a lot of other people object to it, and it's going to, it really does cloud the issue. Uh, well, if I respond just sure. qu quickly. Uh, this is clearly within the jurisdiction of the Interior Committee, and I, I hate arguing jurisdiction uh, as opposed to substance. And, and my committee, on a bipartisan basis, chose to legislate in this area. We actually had two provisions. One was dealing with nuclear licensing, and the other with relicensing of existing plants. And the other w amendment went down the committee. It went down because I let a member of the committee come back 30 minutes after the vote by unanimous consent, change his vote, they changed the outcome, and I lost. And, and many members of the minority and others on my committee prevailed. But my committee felt it was important that we address these issues, and Mr. Kosmeyer's subcommittee had been working on these over the years. And our committee, this is within our jurisdiction. We have jurisdiction over, over the NRC. We're entitled to the dignity of that. We are not in conflict with any other committee because nobody else chose to legislate here. We think we should be made part of the original text and if, if you want to offer the, the Barton Clement substitute or a motion to strike, that's fine. But we're entitled to the dignity of our work product, just as the Judiciary Committee is, and Merchant Marine, and, and Public Works, and these other committees are, of their work product. That was the agreement when we set out down this road. Otherwise, if I thought that whoever reported first was the vehicle, I would have run ahead last year. He's been working on these issues now for, for better than two years. We've had numerous debates and discussions in our committee. So I'm just saying that these committees, this isn't where like Ways and Means and, and Energy and Commerce and Interior, we all have different views on, on, the, uh, on uranium enrichment. I happen to be together with Mr. Dingle on that, opposed to the Ways and Means provision. There you're in direct conflict. That's more difficult for you. But here every other committee is silent. And where they're silent, I think our work product is entitled to be put in the basic product. It, 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 it delays the debate no longer than if we had to offer an amendment, maybe less so, because then you have, you know, you, you're just, you're offering to the base document. And, and I think it's just a question of the, of, of the, of the shared dignity of the, uh, of the committees. If I could just briefly add, sure. Clement Barton wasn't referred to Energy and Commerce. It was only referred to Interior. Yeah, we have that jurisdiction. never referred to that. I, I serve on both committees. It was never referred to Energy and Commerce. It was referred only to the Interior Committee by the House Parliamentarian. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, and I understand and we're what, mindful, you're, what you're saying. And I, let me reiterate what I said in my testimony. We're mindful that we want a bill. 
but let's let the legislative process work. And I appreciate the, what the President and the Secretary of Energy and others have said, and that's, we're going to be cognizant of that, obviously, through the whole process. But let's, let's let the legislative process work. In that vein, uh, uh, Congressman Kostner has, has, has said, look, I'll withdraw this. And we can forego this whole debate until we get to conference. I mean, until we get to conference committee, where you have really substantial changes by by the senator from Louisiana and the, and the Senate, and we will have to argue existing law or some variation in between. So we're working in the vein of getting a bill. I mean, we're 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 heading down that road. Well, I, know it's I, out I of certainly character. don't uh, I know don't, it's out of character, don't question Jerry, your <laughs> sincerity at all, and I know exactly what you're trying to do, and and uh, I would not try to block you. I mean, even though I'm probably on the other side of being pro nuclear, but but uh, the, the point is that you, know, you, you, you made a cogent argument on behalf of, uh, of uh, what I think ought to be done here because uh, you mentioned that the amendment did go down in your committee. You let the fellow come no, back, he no, changed no, his not vote. This, not this one. Hmm? No, that no, amendment we're not no. seeking. What I'm saying, in other words, you see, when that happens, though, in other words, then you ought to have the right to come, or that member ought to be able to have the right to have his amendment made in order to offer it on the floor. Uh, because you are not the, uh, the committee of jurisdiction, even though you deal with this aspect, you ought to still have that right, if it's a germane amendment, to offer that to the legislation, to this bill. And, and that's what, uh, if we follow the normal legislative process, that's what would happen. We're sort of doing Doing this different because we're taking your committee um, and uh, and we're, we're putting your bill into this bill and that is not what the original but, but let me let me suggest <laughs> that was clearly the, the parameters that were outlined in the chairman's meeting about how we would proceed in those meetings and no chairman was told during those meetings that that their committee work would be second-class citizenship compared to the Energy and Commerce Committee we would work within our areas of jurisdiction keep our nose out of the other committees of jurisdiction and we would assemble the package in the rules committee and that was the understanding that we would come here assemble those where there was controversy where you had shared jurisdictions as we did with merchant marine and commission we would try to work those out we worked out our, our differences with merchant marine and with with public works and i don't know what's going on with ways and means and energy but that's over my that's you know that's mm. like guys who can dunk the basketball it's over my head yeah. but <laughs> it just uh, i won't take up any more of the time because we so, won't I mean, we'll expedite it. but you know we're going to be faced with a similar situation when we have the defense authorization bill coming up next week or the week after we we have a foreign affairs uh, situation, and uh, are we going to be asked then to incorporate that in as, as original text the, the foreign aid part of it, foreign affairs part of it? Uh, we're setting a bad precedent, really, to make well, the House but, work. But we recognize that this is what it says, that energy, energy jurisdiction is all over the Congress, tragically, tragically. And these different committees have had to work, and now your ungodly task is to put this thing together in a package. We just asked to have the same dignity and we're not trying to shield ourselves from votes or from substitutes. You uh, you mentioned tragically, and I agree with you. You know, back in 1980, I think some of you may have been on the same committee with uh, Jerry Patterson, was it? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I served on that committee. We at that time tried to create a committee on energy. Uh, we failed miserably at that time, and uh, now we have Hamilton Gratison coming up uh, next to tomorrow. As a matter of fact, you two gentlemen ought to come and testify on Thursday uh, as to how tragic this is, and let's see if we can rewrite the reforms in this house. Thanks for coming. Thank you, sir. Mr. Quillen, no question. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you. Good luck in your deliberations, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Joel Hefley. Okay. The Honorable Bruce Vento. Uh, Bruce is not coming. Mr. Bento is not coming, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Nor is Mr. DeLugo. Okay. The Honorable Wayne Owens of Utah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have a statement which I ask you would print the record in full if you would. I'll try to summarize it briefly. In, if the uh, if the committee does follow Chairman Miller's request and puts the text of the energy portions of this bill, which are passed by the Interior Committee and reported out of the Interior Committee, then the first two uh, amendments that I am dealing with will be in that text and therefore should be ignored in the unlikely, I hope, event that the uh, 
interior text is not included, then I ask permission to offer two amendments which have been passed uh, in the interior committee which I offered. One of these would authorize $310 million as a federal contribution for cleanup of 60 million tons of radioactive uranium mill tailings located in seven states that pose ongoing risks to public health and the environment. This is a very important amendment and I think is basic, uh, is, uh, is I think quite broadly supported as, as an, an essential, as essential. And, but if the interior text is not incorporated in the bill, it would need to be offered as an amendment separately and I would request that permission. My other amendment in that category, Mr. Chairman, would strike the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's authority to turn uranium mill tailing sites into radioactive waste dumps unless the governor of the appropriate, appropriate state agrees to allow these sites to be used for such disposal. Utah has four uranium mill tailing sites which under the regulation the NRC has proposed would be automatically uh, uh, classified as dump sites for other uh, uh, radioactive waste. They, these four sites, Mr. Chairman, are located in places where the uranium was, not where safety or any good sense dictates. And the idea of using them as they lay, two of them lay on the drainage into the Colorado River, for example, the idea of using them to store other, radioact uh, other uh, radioactive or hazardous waste is really contrary to any good sense. And that's why the committee accepted this uh, amendment if, as I say, you don't give us the chance to have our text incorporated as uh, primary text, then I would ask permission to submit that amendment as well. Now, there are four additional floor amendments which I will go through very fast, two of which involve the issue of a state's right to restrict the importation of out-of-state waste. These were not accepted by the committee. Uh, one of my amendments would authorize the states to say no to imports of low-level radioactive waste. And another would give the governor of the state the authority to prohibit use of federal public lands within the state for disposal of radioactive or hazardous waste, and also places restrictions on use of these lands for electric energy purposes. Uh, the Interior Committee has already, as Chairman uh, uh, Kosmar explained, adopted an amendment which would codify the principle, uh, this principle as regards below regulatory concern waste. My amendment would uh, simply broaden that to allow governors to prohibit radioactive waste imports using language virtually identical to the first language dealing with the next level up of waste, that is low level radioactive uh, waste. Second, uh, uh, the amendment would uh, grant the state the authority to, to say no to out of state weights, waste. Uh, restricting the use of federal public lands for waste disposal or electrical energy purposes. I have submitted two versions of this uh, amendment to the committee. The original ver version would uh, deal with public lands for disposal or handling of both radioactive waste and hazardous waste. If your committee decides for committee jurisdiction reasons not to allow that amendment, then the alternative version applies only to radioactive wastes, which are clearly within the Interior Committee uh, jurisdiction and doesn't raise issues dealing uh, that might be considered uh, jurisdictional. The third of these amendments uh, is uh, aimed at promoting energy conservation through water conservation. Conservation of water would also conserve energy because vast amounts of energy are, as you know, are used to, in the West, particularly to lift water and heat and treat it, uh, uh, treat the, uh, the clean water and the wastewater as well. It, this amendment would establish incentives for states to adopt water meeting, metering requirements for public water systems receiving water from the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, it is not believed to be word, uh, burdensome, and it would be uh, it would conflict. It would, it would uh, provide for genuine water saving in the West. Water is, of course, the most valuable of all resources. My last amendment uh, uh, deals with uh, providing uh, the opportunity for review by the Secretary of the Interior and for public participation before rights of ways through public lands are granted for oil and gas pipelines. This approval now, Mr. Chairman, is provided to FERC 
which is responsible for building a pipeline uh, and should not, in my view, and does have a conflict with deciding whether, in fact, there are severe environmental implications. The Secretary of the Interior has the trust responsibility for protecting the public lands, and the Secretary of the Interior should have the right uh, to deal with the issues of whether there is a significant degradation of a natural resource before a pipeline is put through. This is particularly important to me, Mr. Chairman, because uh, in the last two years there's been a gas pipeline built through an area of exceedingly importance uh, from an environmental standpoint with immense damage done, no public input, and no opportunity for the Secretary of the Interior, who was the custodian of most of those lands, and the protector of their additional values other than for energy production, and the Secretary of the Interior did not have an opportunity to participate, nor did the public in that process, and this amendment would, in essence, uh, change that to permit that kind of uh, participation. I appreciate very much the committee's time. Be delighted to respond to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Joel Hefley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm asking for permission to offer an amendment which would strike a, um, a section uh, in the bill. Um, subsection paren D and its proposed uh, amendment to section 135 of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 uh, would abrogate existing contracts between the Department of Energy and various nuclear utilities also contracts with several university research institutes and a number of foreign countries. In the latter case, these contracts would have the force of treaties. There are serious questions as to the legality of Section 2311 paren D, and the Interior Council conceded the section had unresolved questions of constitutionality. Numerous court decisions have established the fact that while Congress may pass laws that affect contract rights, Congress cannot pass a statute that alters or repudiates the substance of its own contracts. It is the opinion of the Department of Energy that Section 2311 paren D would have the effect of abrogating treaties, which we can't do. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, there is enough question and concern of whether or not this is legal, uh, even for us to be doing this, that I think it's something we should debate on the floor and have the opportunity to present uh, that side of the case. And I, I see uh, Congressman Allard has just joined me. At, uh, uh, the concern arose originally from a, a power plant in his district who has a contract with DOE. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask Congressman Allard if you'd like to. Would you like to have you put your full statement the record and have you summarize? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a brief comment. I'm here in full support of Congressman Hefley and his uh, efforts to move forward with the amendment. There's actually three of us from Colorado that had this amendment in mind. You've got all three of those before you, and through mutual agreement, uh, ask that Congressman Hefley and myself be listed as uh, sponsors on that, and, I, and that uh, Congressman Skaggs, who's the third person, uh, didn't want his name listed, but is supportive of what we're trying to do. And uh, this is a very serious abrogation, I think, of a contract that's occurred between a federal contractor and the federal government, and for uh, the Congress to go in after both parties have assumed uh, the conditions of a contract made way back in 1965 to change all those conditions uh, creates a real serious problem, both for, uh, especially for my state and in my district where I have a nuclear power plant that now is having to store that nuclear waste within the district without the, uh, the, uh, the quality and the standards that where it was originally designed to be placed. And so, uh, uh, I, and everybody's been operating on the assumption that uh, this facility in Idaho would be there and available for that disposal. Now the nuclear power plant has been converted over to a natural gas plant, but you still have the nuclear waste problem. What are you going to do with that? So I would ask the chairman's support, allowing us to bring this amendment forward onto the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dorland. No questions. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, want to say to, to both my friends from Colorado that I wholeheartedly support your request, and we will do everything that we possibly can to ensure that it's allowed for consideration on the floor, and I thank you for your fine work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to uh, summarize my remarks and then submit a statement uh, in an attempt to be brief. Thank and you. Uh, to the members of the committee, thank you very much for letting me uh, be here. It's timely that I come after my two colleagues from Colorado. The uh, amendment that they wish to bring before the, uh, the full house is uh, a provision that I added uh, to the interior bill. It's uh, section um, 2311D. That provision allows for states to have veto power over the acceptance of interim nuclear waste from uh, commercial nuclear waste uh, facilities. The reason that I uh, put this vehicle forward and this provision forward, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, is because the Nuclear Waste Policy Act fully intended for states and Indian tribes to be involved in the process of accepting commercial nuclear waste. That uh, legislation was passed in 1982. The primary jurisdiction was with the Interior Committee, so I think it was entirely appropriate that I added this amendment to the uh, committee mark, and then we fully debated this in full committee. I uh, had the amendment uh, added because I won in the committee. Uh, Mr. Hepley and Mr. Allard were there in full committee and uh, attempted to delete this provision uh, at that time and failed. I think that it would be in the best interest uh, of the debate here to deny the request from the three Coloradans and let this move forward in the bill and, uh, and let it go to conference. I want to say that, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that this is not a NIMBY issue. Idaho has accepted more waste than any state in the United States. We want to open up the WIP sites so that we can start moving waste out of Idaho and into the site at Carlsbad, where the federal government has spent $1 billion. So this is not a NIMBY issue. But the problem is, members of the committee and Mr. Chairman, is that this is interim nuclear storage. And the people of Idaho would like to know when interim really means interim and when the Department of Energy is going to be sincere about opening up the, um, the storage facility at Carlsbad and the WIP facility. I think that the, uh, it would be in the best interest of the people of Idaho, and I'm supported by my colleague, uh, Congressman Stallings, to say that the Idaho National Engineering Laboratory is not equipped to accept nuclear waste. It sits on top of the Snake River Aquifer. The facility that my colleagues just mentioned in Colorado is a Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensed facility for the storage of the spent fuel rods that they have there. It is licensed to do that, and the INEL is not. I will not take up any more time with the committee, but I would uh, respectfully request that um, my colleagues from Colorado be denied and that we, uh, on their request for the amendment, and that we go to the conference with this provision, which was added by the Interior Committee, which has jurisdiction over the Nuclear Waste Policy Act amendments, which my amendment did, and uh, I think it's fair, and uh, I think that the Nuclear Waste Policy Act wanted the states involved. We want the states involved, and it's not an MB issue, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your testimony. Let me uh, just take an opportunity comment on that and try to answer one of your questions about uh, there is nothing, uh, there is not a an animal that can be defined as temporary nuclear waste. Once nuclear waste is put someplace, it stays there uh, forever as far as, as we're concerned. And, and I, I, I couldn't agree with you more that we, uh, you know, it is my opinion that uh, the one part of the uh, nuclear cycle that has not been dealt with is the waste at the end. We've, we've had the benefits of nuclear for some 50 years, but we've refused to deal on a national basis uh, with, with the waste part of it. And one of the reasons is, and one of the reasons that, uh, that, that, that I've always opposed multiple retrievable storage, and, and because there's always been someone who could come up with an idea that this we, we, we don't really have to do it now. We can put it here temporarily and, and puts off the decision and, and, and reaching some sort of decision on a final uh, storage. And, and I, uh, for 25 years, have, have tried to exert as much pressure as I could to see that we did have uh, a permanent storage. I, I might add with not a whole lot of success, but I've tried it. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may just close by saying that uh, this is interim storage, 
and the people of Idaho have been doing a lot of research uh, at the Idaho National there is, Engineering. There's nothing, uh, there is no interim storage, Mr. Rocco. I can tell you it does not exist. Well, not interim storage of nuclear waste, it does. Then I think that we ought to get this to be a licensed facility because it's sitting on top of the Snake River Aquifer. Well, and, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Rocco, I have 40 thousand gallons of very highly radioactive toxic waste sitting on top of the Tuscaloosa aquifer which is the uh, primary uh, 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 aquifer that supplies fresh water for the southeastern United States Florida Georgia and South Carolina and Florida so I know of what you speak thank you mr. chairman I appreciate the Right. Time. Well, wait a minute. Uh, do you have a? I concur with your your most recent statement. And, uh, uh, I too have a concern that uh, that our policy ought to be defined a permanent repository and not to have a temporary um, so-called repository. It's you know temporary is a state of mind when you have a the the, the nuclear waste that could very well have half life of a thousand years or more. Then temporary could mean a hundred years. Uh, in you know in, in temporary storage that 's not what we would consider temporary, and I think it 's a double double expenditure well, many members of the uh, idaho new uh, New Mexico and Colorado delegation have been working hard to open up that website and, and I hope that we get that problem solved because okay. if we don 't start testing that facility and, and moving it in as a pilot project then we 're never going to reach the permanent yeah. state and um, I thank again the committee for your consideration thank you very much for your excellent testimony okay. mr. Johns distinguished member from Indiana thank you mr. chairman i 'm joined by mr. Ewing of Illinois Fine. If I mr. Ewing we'd be delighted to, to uh, have you and so we'll have, uh, be delighted to have you both with you, any statements that you have in the record and uh, to uh, summarize. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Let me say uh, at the beginning that I want to endorse the previous request made uh, of this committee by Chairman Miller and Chairman Kostmeyer with regard to uh, uh, provisions uh, relating to the low regulatory concern uh, waste and its transportation and also uh, the decommissioning and decontaminating of uh, uranium enrichment plants. But uh, the reason that Mr. Ewing and I are here uh, this afternoon is to uh, request a favorable consideration of an amendment that we uh, would like to offer um, to address the, the issue of uh, octane replacement uh, as a part of this comprehensive energy bill that uh, is under consideration. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as, as you know, uh, there were some important provisions in the Clean Air Act relating to oxygenated fuels and reformulated gasoline um, that uh, hold forth uh, some promise as far as the use of renewable fuels. But, there, uh, but the issue before us today is the question of uh, energy security and uh, self-sufficiency in our country. And we believe that renewable fuels also have a very important part to play in those uh, other markets that are not affected by the Clean Air Act. The proposal that Mr. Ewing and I and a number of our colleagues uh, bring to you today would require the Secretary of Energy to implement a program to replace uh, octane uh, over a period of uh, some 12 years beginning in 1994 so that at the beginning one half point of all the octane uh, in, in gasoline sold nationally in, in uh, markets where there was no conflict with the Clean Air Act uh, and by the year 2006 uh, two octane points would come from domestically produced renewable uh, fuels, which would be ethanol. Uh, basically, uh, several years ago when the oil companies had to decide uh, what to put into gasoline to take the place of lead uh, to provide octane, uh, they chose uh, to use uh, various petrochemicals such as benzene, xylene, toluene, what have you. Uh, they uh, could have chosen, and in fact some oil companies did choose, to market gasoline with ethanol, which provides the octane, and does so in a less toxic manner, and does so with the material which is domestically produced. 
uh, helps uh, the taxpayers by reducing the need for farm program payments, uh, helps the rural economies, uh, helps American workers have jobs producing ethanol. Uh, in fact, there are some companies out there now, uh, and I think that uh, uh, Marathon uh, is likely one of them, and, and, and Clark will, uh, would be another, that are already meeting the requirements that we, we would put forward in our, our amendment. Uh, but there is enormous potential for the use of ethanol as octane replacement. Uh, it is uh, uh, a program which uh, would uh, have enormous implications for energy self-sufficiency because initially what would result is some 80 million barrels of, of crude oil uh, coming into this country that are now being used to produce these uh, petrochemicals for octane enhancers that would be replaced by renewable fuels and that oil uh, could be used for other purposes and by the year 2006 we would replace some 300 million barrels of, uh, of petroleum. So from a standpoint of energy self-sufficiency, a standpoint of the environment, uh, the well-being of uh, the domestic economy, this is a proposal which makes a lot of sense. Uh, the Congress has never dealt with the octane issue in this way before. This is a new proposal. It is not an alternative fuels proposal. It does not conflict with what's in the bill already. It is a separate proposal to replace a portion of the octane in gasoline that now comes from these petrochemicals with uh, the, the renewable domestically produced ethanol. I thank the Chairman for his consideration. It's good to have you up here, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I'd like to uh, associate myself with the comments of my colleague, uh, Congressman Johns, and I am pleased to be a co-sponsor of, of a piece of legislation, H.R. 5178, which uh, we're here today to ask this committee to consider as an amendment to the energy legislation which you're considering, 77-6. And I would just say very quickly that I believe that the provisions of the bill that we've introduced that we're offering as an amendment today meet the goals of the comprehensive energy legislation which this Congress will be considering. And number one, that is, of course, energy security by decreasing our dependence on foreign imports. And number two, environmentally progressive. And I think that we would meet and help in that way considerably by decreasing the use of the aromatic hydrocarbons which Congressman John spoke of, which have been added to gasoline to obtain the octane level that has been required. We believe that this can be done from a more environmentally friendly with alcohol and we certainly would encourage the consideration of our amendment. There's no doubt that the bill that or the amendment we offer is good for U.S. farm economies. But I think more importantly, it does address a very important part of our clean air problem and would be a very important addition to working towards the attainment of the goals that we share in this Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, forgive me, as you know, we've had a change of three chairmen in the past moment or so. May I ask you a question which may have been asked prior to my, my arriving here just a moment or two ago with respect to your proposal. Has it been before the committees before, or is this uh, sort of de novo? I mean, do they well, know about it? It, it, it? I have discussed the matter with, with Mr. Sharp of the Energy uh, Subcommittee, and uh, it was not before his committee. They, they have a an alternate fuels provision. Right. Yeah, we discussed but, it earlier this morning. But this is, this is different. This is octane replacement. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, I tell you how this comes to, to how, how I came with Mr. Ewing to, to bring this issue forward. We, we, we got involved uh, uh, with this issue as a consequence of a field hearing that the Agriculture Committee had, uh, which raised the issue about the use of ethanol as an octane replacement. And uh, had, had the Agriculture Committee taken up the energy bill, we would have offered the proposal then, but 
uh, as you know, the Agriculture Committee did not, and so we had no opportunity to to offer the amendment in in that in that venue. But I have consulted with Mr. Sharp about it, and uh, there are no technical problems uh, with it. And he and others have confirmed that it it, it uh, does not interfere in any way with the provisions of the Clean Air Act. We've explicitly put in the amendment uh, a language uh, uh, which. Uh, uh, Makes that uh, makes that uh, uh, clear um, on page three. Nothing in this section shall be construed to amend or affect the application of the Clean Air Act, and it would complement the Clean Air Act from the standpoint of did would he, address if, other markets. If I may ask, sure. Did he speak kindly of your amendment? He to spoke you? kindly of it. <laughs> um, I, I know that he he. I, I know that Mr. Sharp and all the sub, other sub, all the other committee chairmen. Uh, uh, by and large, take a position that they sure. don't want amendments right. up that are. Well, that's not. understandable, and that's the that's the sure. usual position, and, and to a great extent, that makes a certain amount of sense. But there may well be some, including perhaps your own, which does not, as you suggest, or the two of you suggest, not conflict with what they're proposing to do, and which might not offend them all that much. So not we'll that. we'll make inquiries of him too. If we I may. appreciate I, that. I just thought I'd get a self a self serving statement from yourself that he didn't seem to mind it too much. I have discussed it with him, and and he understands the purpose of it and sees no conflict with what he has done. Thank you. We thank the two of you both very thank much. You. Well, excuse me, Mr. Gordon, I'm sorry. I want to thank uh, uh, Jim and his colleague for, uh, for the testimony today. As always, it's been interesting, and you, I think you're going to make this a better bill. Thanks. Thank you both very much. Mr. Abercrombie, I think you're next, sir. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Bielinson. I'm. I saw your quotation in the whatever it was the other was the New York Times. It must have been the New York Times. I expect uh, who we'd be voting for, for right president for if they ever turned it over to us. Oh, right. <laughs> I didn't see that. I think part. you're probably right. I Go thought, ahead. I thought they were you were might be referring to roll call where I was trying no. to emulate Adu Abu Tai, who was a river unto his people. That's what I no, want to be. No, some of us don't read roll call, but most of us do. <laughs> Actually, it was in the New York Times, I think. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't seen that, but. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, let Sir. me say that I hope they do not see uh, the tragedy that's been referred to uh, by several members of the Rules Committee already today. This had to do with jurisdictional disputes, perhaps obscuring the substance of an issue. And in this instance, we're dealing with plutonium. Other members of the committee this morning have indicated, uh, or th this afternoon rather, have indicated that, uh, in fact, Mr. Derrick just uh, a moment or two ago stated that there's nothing temporary about nuclear waste. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm certain that, uh, that he would agree there's nothing temporary about uh, leakage of uh, plutonium. And uh, with respect to that jurisdiction and substance then, uh, I want to indicate that virtually every committee that could have had uh, jurisdiction, uh, uh, no matter how peripheral it might seem, has in fact dealt with the, the amendment that I have, uh, uh, am seeking to have uh, approved. The Interior Committee, the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee, the uh, 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 Foreign Affairs Committee all have, have come to grips with this issue in one form or another. Uh, the uh, uh, chair of the Interior Committee uh, is uh, uh, quite at ease with the language of the Merchant Marine uh, Committee, uh, which is part of the bill that's before you uh, moving forward. Let me say in essence what this is, is, uh, is about then, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I cannot conceive that any member of the Rules Committee, let alone any of the members of the committees which with dealt with this, this question of shipment of plutonium, would want anything other than the maximum amount of safety. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have just received in my office a statement response from the uh, State Department to questions that I put to them with respect to the issue of safety. And you will be astounded to find out that, that they are unable to answer with any certainty as to whether or not the casks in which the plutonium is, is to be shipped on the high seas are safe. They cannot assert with any degree of certainty whether or not any of our ports would be at risk if there was a leakage of plutonium, if there was an accident on the high seas. 
I won't quote directly. I have page after page of, of, of ostensible answers from the State Department. Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee, I think it's absolutely imperative uh, that the language uh, utilized by the Merchant Marine Committee, which refers to international law uh, specifically, uh, with respect to the shipment of the plutonium be applicable in this bill and brought and brought to the floor. I simply cannot imagine anyone opposing it. It has nothing to do, I want to assure all members of the committee, uh, has nothing to do with uh, internal policies with respect to alternative energy use of nuclear energy in, in Japan or in South Korea or in France or, or in any other nation. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, military purposes. It has nothing to do even with the waste question per se. That is to say storage, permanent, uh, temporary or otherwise. It has everything to do with the shipment of plutonium on the high seas and the possibility that there could be an accident or an emergency which would require that the ship carrying the plutonium have to enter the territorial waters of the United States or for that matter uh, any other uh, region of the world, Mr. Chairman. We do have uh, agreements uh, with the uh, uh, Japanese government uh, in this respect. Um, this, this is an amendment, Neil, forgive me for interrupting, sure. that, that was reported by By Interior. Interior and by Merchant Marine and Fisheries and mentioned in the uh, report language of the Foreign Affairs Committee as well. And I assume either outside the jurisdiction or not having been acted well, upon it, by Energy and Commerce? Or? Uh, it, no, it, the issue, I, I believe, came up after Energy and Commerce had done its work. Okay, the, sure. the Energy and Commerce is silent about it, I think, as a result of the logistics of the uh, uh, knowledge of, of, of the shipment taken taking place, not because there was a lack of interest. Gotcha. Um, as I say, all committees have expressed an interest. Some have different language uh, proposals, but I think the most comprehensive one happens to be the merchant marine uh, 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 language, because that refers to the international law. Well, others are re they're referring to, just very quickly, very quickly. It, is a, a protocol relating to intervention on the high seas in cases of marine pollution by a substance other than oil. I guess we could agree that plutonium is a substance other than oil. And uh, the other is an agreement between the United States uh, and Japan specifically called the Agreement for Cooperation Between the Government of the United States of America and the Government of Japan Concerning Peaceful Uses of Nuclear Energy. The reason this is pertinent, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that the original nuclear fuel uh, came from the United States to Japan. This has now been reprocessed in France and is going to be shipped back to Japan. This agreement calls for the establishment of safety standards by the United States because the fuel originated here. That's the reason for it. It is strictly a question of safety on the high seas. The amendment does not address foreign policy, does not address the, uh, as I say, the efficacy uh, uh, of, uh, or, or the advisability of using nuclear energy in Japan or, or elsewhere, uh, in the United States for that matter. Gotcha. So it's extremely important then that we opt for safety on the high seas. So that should there be an accident, I'll conclude with this, should there be an accident and plutonium uh, be at question with respect to any ship, that, that our people can be reasonably assured that a ship having to enter a port of the United States under emergency circumstances would have the maximum possibility of having that plutonium under safe circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Amakrami. Any questions? Bob? Let me just say to Neil that uh, I appreciate his uh, his thoughtful testimony, as usual, he brings a passion to to all issues that he brings before the Rules Committee. He did it again today, and uh, I hope that you'll have a chance to. We'll hear your committee. I'll hear your amendment on the floor. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Quillen. One question. Thank you very much. The Honorable Jack Fields of Texas. Thank you for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman. All right, Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I would ask that my entire statement be placed in the record. Without objection, the gentleman in Texas, his entire statement would be placed in the record. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify in strong support of an amendment. Uh, Mr. Tozan of Louisiana and myself would like to offer uh, to H.R. 776. Uh, during the last four years, 
uh, our dependence has has increased from 27 to over 45 percent of our energy needs. Unless we find new oil and gas resources, our foreign dependence will grow 60 to 70 percent of our petroleum requirements by the year 2000, and we can't allow this to occur. And I'd like to ask the members of this committee to consider the following. Number one, production from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, which now provides 25 percent of our energy, is falling, and this decline will rapidly accelerate during the next 10 years. Number two, by the year 2010, the United States is expected to produce about 7.8 million barrels per day, while we will consume 22.6 million barrels per day, and that represents a staggering shortfall of 14.8 million barrels of oil per day. The domestic oil industry regularization rate is now at its lowest point in history. In fact, even in the Gulf of Mexico, which is one of the few areas not entirely covered by moratoria, the utilization rate is a paltry 41 percent. As recently as five years ago, our domestic energy industry invested nearly 70 percent of its capital here in the United States, and today more than half of that capital is spent abroad because the oil industry is being forced out by leasing moratoria, drilling bans, and other punitive actions. In fact, in Houston, the big joke is it's easier to drill in Russia than it is to drill in the United States. Uh, the Department of the Interior just conducted an OCS lease sale in the central Gulf of Mexico. At that sale, it received the second lowest number of leasing bids in its history. Further, the number of drilling plans being filed is down 26 percent. And according to the Department of Energy, the United States spends about $120 million each and every day to buy imported oil. It's the single largest component of our trade deficit. In 1991, we spent $56 billion to acquire imported crude oil, and that represented nearly one half of our total trade deficit. So, Mr. Chairman, we have an energy crisis in this country. We may not have the long gasoline lines, but this crisis is here, and it's going to become more dangerous. Uh, as an example, in my state, there's been a depression in the oil industry. Domestic employment and oil and gas extra extraction fell from 770,000 jobs in 1982 to about 390,000 jobs today. And some people may think, well, that doesn't affect my state. Well, it affects all of, all of the states in our country because those are jobs that will not come back. Uh, people who uh, knew how to go out and manufacture and fabricate and explore and produce. And while there are several amendments I'd like to offer today, I respectfully ask uh, that you make my peril point amendment in order under the rule. This is a bipartisan amendment, and it's a straightforward attempt to deal with the serious problem of our growing dependence on foreign crude oil. If enacted, it would allow the president to lease certain OCS moratoria areas if several stringent conditions were met. And let me say and stress that it gives the president discretion. This is not mandatory. But the conditions that must be met is, number one, the level of oil imports must exceed 50 percent for more than four consecutive months, as determined by the Energy Information Agency. Number two, the president can only lease those OCS planning areas that have undergone sufficient environmental review to fully comply with the National Environmental Policy Act. In other words, we're not asking that any of the environmental regulations be weighed. And number three, the Minerals Management Service must certify that a proposed planning area has significant quantities of oil or gas resources. And furthermore, under the Phil's Tozan Amendment, the president is required to submit an annual report containing a forecast of both oil production and domestic consumption and the steps he will take to reduce our dependence to less than 50 percent. And one last point that I'd like to summarize, Mr. Chairman, and then I'll be glad to take any questions. In regard to environmental safety, of the 60 major spills that we've had in our nation's waters, 59 have been uh, ships primarily carrying foreign oil uh, to our coastline. In the past 15 years, nearly 5 billion barrels of oil have been produced from the Federal Outer Continental Shelf, and less than 900 barrels have been spilled. And indeed, urban runoff dumps more oil into the ocean than do offshore rigs. So I consider this to be a uh, very important amendment, a very substantive amendment. I think it uh, enhances the debate that we will have on the floor, and I think it's a question that should be placed before the House. Thank you very much, Mr. Fields. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I want to congratulate the gentleman from Texas for the substance of his amendment. I think it's a good one. Uh, in, in regard to the number of barrels spilled, 
that you consider the Alaskan spill? Of course, now, you know, that was a ship. That was not from uh, offshore exploration or production. We have had one major spill in our nation's waters, uh, and that was in Santa Barbara in 1968. And uh, one of the, the statistics that uh, I always like to give to people, there are more fish being caught in uh, Santa Barbara today than there were prior to the spill. That's interesting. I think you've got a good amount. Thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jack, you and I had a chance to discuss this amendment on the floor uh, a couple of weeks ago. And as a representative from California, you know that there is a sensitivity to it. I'm happy to know that more fish are being caught in the Santa Barbara Channel than there were before the spill. But nevertheless, it is still uh, of concern uh, to many. But I will say this, uh, I will do everything that I possibly can in this committee to ensure that you have the right to offer the amendment on the floor. I well, I appreciate you. that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Well, Chairman. Jack. I'd like to uh, remind the, uh, the, the witnesses that we have to report this to the floor pretty quickly, so I wish they'd adhere to the, uh, at least the five-minute rule. At most the five-minute rule, Mr. Traffic Act. Mr. Chairman, this is the Buy American Amendment. Uh, the amendment reminds everybody we have a law passed in 1933. This goes a step further. The Rules Committee would have to personally go out and enforce any violators and inflict corporal punishment. Good to see you back, Chairman. Nice to see you. Most importantly, though, the amendment has a fraudulent label section that under this bill, if someone has and receives a contract and affixes a label that says made in America, it must be made in America or they lose their eligibility for further procurement under the bill. It's very good. It's accepted by all. Part of it is already included in the energy R&D section. And I asked the chairman upon his return to in fact find favor with the amendment. I think it's good and it strengthens the bill. And with that, I'll take just my one minute and let you be about your leave, chairman. Thank you very much. Any questions? <clears throat> it sounds like another good bill, Jim. It's, uh, is this any problem with germaneness? No, it is not. It's, uh, it's been approved. It's been accepted. Part of it is already in the bill in the R&D. So the labeling would only be in those areas yes. that we're concerned about this? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, made in America, we all should have heard of that. Forget a minute. I call you all the time. Appreciate that, Chairman. There was a contract down in Florence, Kentucky that had a Made in America from a Japanese subsidiary, and it turned out it was made in Japan. It's the subject of a great lawsuit now that's developed, and it was this amendment the Rules Committee had allowed to help to do that. And if they're saying it's made in America, fine. If it's not made in America, it might qualify anyway. Just don't lie to us. I didn't have my light on. I I would hate to repeat what I said, but I want those who are viewing to know that I support you. Made in America is a good phrase for me and a realistic one. Appreciate that, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. The Honorable George Brown of California. He's on the floor again. Oh, he's not. Oh, he's not. What's that? No, he's not. Uh, Mrs. Lloyd is the subcommittee chairman. I think she's going to speak uh, for him. <clears throat> Mr. Weiss, do you have a time problem? No, okay. I'm a little bit later on the program. Uh, okay. Oh, all right. Well, we can call you when we should. All right, no, sure. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the Rules Committee as you deliberate the rules on this very important energy bill. And considering the research, development, demonstration aspects of, of this legislation, we've identified a variety of technologies that we can provide, that can provide a lot of solutions to our nation's energy problems. We've also supported technologies to clean up our civilian energy laboratories. And in this context, I do support the amendment offered by my chairman, George Brown. Our national laboratories have a tremendous problem. We do need more money to look at research and development for our cleanup activities. I'd also like to uh, uh, 
off for my opposition to amendments number 40 and 39 that will be offered by Mr. Miller or have been offered by Mr. Miller. One is to delete the Advanced Reactor Research and Development Program. This program is clearly within the sole jurisdiction of the Science Committee. In addition to the jurisdictional concerns, the Science Committee has supported the development of advanced reactor technologies as an important component of our nation's future energy options. Secondly, I'd like to oppose the amendment which um, would, uh, that addresses high-level radioactive waste research and development programs. The Science Committee thoughtfully deliberated this amendment. There is an ongoing program under this title, but we believe the Department of Energy is not addressing the mission of this program. This is not in the jurisdiction of the Interior Committee, and unlike that chairman, the Science Committee wants to solve some of these problems. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I have reviewed a copy of the proposed text on the Uranium Enrichment Corporation. I believe it is moving in the right direction. I would like to reserve my right to offer an amendment on uranium enrichment until I receive an assurance that the recent revisions to this text are indeed the ones that will be sent to the floor for consideration. Thank and you. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the, uh, the uh, Congresswoman's uh, statement will appear on the record. Any questions, Ms. Lloyd? I had one question for Ms. Lloyd. I, I, you said you opposed the Miller Amendment 139. What was the other num what was the number? What was the number of the other one? Amendment uh, 40, 140. 40, so 139 That's and 140. That's amendment 39 and 40, Mr. Gordon. 139 or 39? 39. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. 39, 39 and 40. And 40, okay. Uh, one would delete the Advanced Reactor Research and Development Program. This is a, a program of tremendous benefit to our nation that we certainly we must keep in place. And let me say also, I know that you have spent months and hours and hours of uh, committee time working on these matters, and uh, I, I think we're going to have a better energy policy because of all your work and the, and, and the leadership you provided for your committee. This, this bill is very important to the Science Committee. We have put in place a five-year program that is goal-driven. It's a good bill, and certainly we know that we have a lot to do in research and development to solve our energy problems. I thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam, I congratulate you. I know your dedication and expertise is excellent. You represent. Let me repeat. Uh, somehow I forget to turn this on, and I want the people. Anyway, that should be repeated. I, I want the people of this country to know the high regard I hold for you and that your dedication and expertise is the greatest. You represent uh, Oak Ridge Laboratories where they made the first uh, ingredients for the atomic bomb and now it's a great institution and continuing so I you're, you have a great feel for these things and I appreciate your being here today. I thank you, Mr. Quillen. You know, I don't think that energy policy should be a partisan issue. It should be the pinnacle of our legislative careers to know that we're developing energy policy to not only make our country energy independent, but also it can go a long way to enrich our country and uh, enrich the, the wealth of our nation and do a lot to uh, turn around our balance of payments problems, Mr. Moakley. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh Honorable Robert Walker, Paul Henry, Sam Johnson. Mr. Weiser. Yeah, he's next. Mr. Wise, you're on the Interior Committee. I'm on the uh, Government Operations Committee. Oh, Government Ops. Okay. Okay, I think it's... Mr. Mr. Brown, we just uh, called your name. You may, you may have a seat. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd ask that my statement be made a part of the record in its Without entirety, objection. and I'll Tell summarize. Um, I would like uh, the Rules Committee's leave to offer an amendment pertaining to alternative fuel use 
in non-road forms of transportation. There are a number of sections, very worthwhile sections in the bill dealing with on-road, automobiles, trucks, and so on. But here I'd like to deal with non-road forms of transportation such as railroad locomotives and marine vessels. These vessels and these vehicles consume vast amounts of diesel oil. Railroad industry, for instance, consumes 75, uh, 75 billion or, or 75 million gallons a day, 3 billion gallons a, a year of diesel oil, amounting to 2.5% of our total U.S. oil imports. The conversion of non-road vehicles from diesel oil to alternative fuels such as natural gas and electricity would go a long way toward enhancing U.S. energy security and reducing environmental pollution. My amendment would be added to an existing section of the energy bill as reported by the Energy and Commerce Committee. The amendment would complement the other provisions of that section and help to pr promote alternative fuel as a non-road vehicle use. The amendment specifically authorizes the Secretary of Energy to guarantee loans for the conversion of non-road vehicles and engines to alternative fuels. The recipient of the loan guarantees, and I want to stress guarantees, not loans. The recipient of the loan guarantees would be required to demonstrate how the conversion to alternative fuels would result in cost savings sufficient to service the terms of the loan. My amendment would not only help to enhance energy security and environmental quality, but reduce transportation costs as well. This amendment would not authorize a program of actual loans, but only loan guarantees. And the Congressional Budget Office has told me that the budgetary effect of my amendment is that it would not affect direct spending or receipts and would not be subject to the pay-as-you-go requirements of the 1990 Budget Act. My amendment also does not include an authorization for any appropriations because no such authorization is required for a loan guarantee. The House Energy and Commerce Committee was referred sole jurisdiction over the title of the energy bill to which my amendment would be attached. Our staff, my staff has been working with the staffs of the Energy and Commerce Committee. I have informed interested members of my intention to offer the amendment and it is my understanding that the chairman of the committee and his staff have not expressed any opposition. We've also checked with the minority of the staff and I'm not aware, uh, minority staff and I'm not aware of any opposition on the committee, uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee from the leadership, minority leadership. My amendment enjoys the support of the railroad industry and railroad labor organizations have also expressed no objections to the amendment. Um, Mr. Chairman, for the reasons outlined, I would request that the Rules Committee make the non-road alternative fuels amendment in order as part of the rule for House consideration of the Comprehensive National Energy Policy Act and would also ask that any points of order be waived in the consideration of this amendment. I'd be happy to answer any questions on this. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you. I just, in, in closing, I'd just like to say to the committee that this is um, something that was not initially considered by the Energy and Commerce Committee. We've worked extensively with them. It's not a, just something that's popping up out of the blue. Uh, and I want to assure you of that. Thank you. Uh, as everybody knows, this committee's been working uh, since uh, this morning. It's the intention of the chair to to uh, four o'clock close the hearing down and in, in caucus in order that we can come up with some kind of resolve. So I would hope the witnesses and the members of the committee would take this in, to mind when they're testifying and also answering questions. <clears throat> Mr. Brown. May we uh, ask Mr. And Walker. Mr. Walker, because he's the ranking minority. Huh? Thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Chairman, and may I uh, ask unanimous consent that my... Without objection, the gentleman's entire statement will be on the record. The record uh, this microphone. Mr. Put your microphone on. Very high tech you're getting to be here. That's not me. As you know, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, this is a complex bill with nine different committees reporting uh, portions of it, and uh, I, I want to say that I am extremely pleased with the cooperation that uh, our committee has received from the Energy and Commerce Committee and from Mr. Sharp, the chairman of the subcommittee, and the ranking minority members. Uh, most of our problems have been resolved where there were differences, and uh, if there are some minor ones remaining, they may, they may be resolved also. I want to say a word or two about the thrust of what we're doing. We're adding a research and development section to the long-term energy bill, the energy strategy bill. And in, in accordance with that, our research and development provisions call for a five-year 
research and development program with specific goals as to what we're trying to achieve in terms of uh, uh, energy security and a number of other things which are set forth in our bill. And we have tailored the authorization numbers to support the goals. In other words, our, our section is a goal-driven section of, of the bill aimed at uh, ensuring that at the end of five years we will have made substantial progress in reducing our dependence on oil, in developing alternative energy sources, in doing a number of other things, protecting the environment and so forth, which have to be a part of any long-term energy strategy. And so I, I think our bill contributes to that. Second point I wish to make. The Department of Energy is a major department with a budget that's approaching $20 billion a year. About two-thirds of that is authorized by the Armed Services Committee because it contributes to national defense. About a third of that budget should be authorized by the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. But for the last 10 years, we have not had an authorization bill. We're very unhappy about that, and we have tried to write provisions into here which will assert our responsibility for maintaining certain quality control, certain policy directions uh, for the civilian programs of the Department of Energy, which are already being done for the military programs uh, by uh, the Armed Services Committee. Uh, we think that uh, the system's out of balance when we can go for 10 years without an authorization for a major program such as the future civilian energy needs of this country. And we are highly gratified that this bill gives us the opportunity to finally assert that uh, authorizing jurisdiction. Now, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know you want to get to the bottom line as quickly as possible. There are uh, some uh, uh, minor problems here which uh, we have not uh, reached uh, agreement with the uh, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee and in accordance with that I am asking that the rule make in order uh, uh, one or two amendments which uh, we think are necessary in order to have the House determine what the final disposition would be. Uh, the first one that I would mention is Brown Amendment number 142 to restore uh, language which was in our original uh, committee bill which uh, it, it, we were not able to agree to a compromise on and, and that uh, provision uh, has to do with uh, the uh, allocation of uh, 10 to 15 percent of the funding for the environmental restoration and waste management functions of the department for research and development. We have not been able to reach agreement on that and we would want to offer an amendment that would uh, allow the House to make that decision. So, uh, on the more uh, happy note, uh, we have reached agreement regarding sections 20 2120A and 2121, and there will be no need for the rule to make in order my amendments number 141 and 143, and uh, we would be glad to uh, scrap those. Uh, we also had some problems with the language on the uranium enrichment provisions, which was of particular interest to Mrs. Lloyd, who has already appeared before you, as I understand it. We think we're possibly close to some agreement there, but I would like to support the right of Mrs. Lloyd to offer an amendment dealing with that portion of the bill in the event that we haven't reached a, a final agreement on that matter. Now, uh, Mr. Walker has a couple of amendments uh, which uh, he will probably want to describe. Uh, one of them uh, is deals with a 15% investment tax credit, which we feel is not within the jurisdiction of our committee, even though I would support the amendment in principle. And I'll leave that to be worked out between uh, Mr. Walker and Mr. Ostrakowski. Uh, 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 we also have a Walker Amendment, uh, which we're currently uh, discussing, negotiating, which would be a substitute for a major part of, of the bill. And basically, it has to do with the bottom line on numbers. Now, we are very close to reaching agreement on that bottom line. Uh, and if we do so, if we do reach agreement, Mr. Walker and I will offer a 
joint amendment reflecting that agreement, and we would like to have the rule provide for a joint Brown-Walker amendment dealing with the uh, total amount of the authorization set forth in our portion of the bill. Um, in the event that we are unable to reach agreement, I would ask that the rule make in order a modified Brown Amendment number 30, which deals with the numbers which Mr. Johnson of Texas uh, proposes to offer in his amendment, and uh, I would ask that I uh, be made in order to offer a substitute or an amendment to Mr. Johnson's amendment. Uh, now, there's only one additional amendment uh, that I want to comment on. Uh, Mr. Henry has uh, offered an amendment, uh, which he also offered in the full committee. Uh, it is an amendment with which I agree in principle, but it basically deals with uh, immigration and education policy rather than, than uh, energy policy. And it sets forth certain requirements with regard to how we can use non-citizens in the, in the laboratories. And uh, I think that any matter of that sort should be applicable across the board to all government agencies, not merely to the Department of Energy. And unfortunately, therefore, I am going to reluctantly ask that Mr. Henry's amendment not be made in order uh, on this particular bill. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as Chairman Brown has indicated to you, I have two amendments uh, pending before the Rules Committee, and I'd ask that they, they be made in order. Uh, both of them. Uh, Attorney Mike. No. Uh, both amendments um, embody uh, what was uh, offered in committee as an Energy Technology Growth Act, um, and um, that particular um, uh, bill was offered in committee as a substitute. It failed by just two votes, and uh, the bill was then reported with 16 Republicans dissenting. We divided that into, into two different uh, packages here, uh, in part because of the um, uh, question mentioned by Mr. Uh, by Mr. Brown, uh, that being the relevance of the one provision to our committee versus versus Ways and Means. The First Amendment is the one that I that uh, certainly I, I would hope that we could uh, make an order which is entirely within the jurisdiction of our committee. It authorizes the Department of Energy R&D uh, uh, accounts consistent with the National Energy Strategy and within the limits of the budget agreement and the House passed budget resolution. It then provides for up to $5 billion in increased R&D over the next 10 years through a statutory uh, transfer authority. This enhances the energy technology in a responsible way by requiring the budget trade-offs from the non-energy related uh, DOE programs. Um. What I would ask on, on this particular uh, amendment is that I be permitted to, to offer it and also be permitted the, the, the ability to revise it consistent with the agreement that we think we're going to be able to work out. Uh, I do believe that we are very close to having an agreement on this and that at that point uh, Chairman Brown and I will be able to offer a joint amendment here uh, and uh, uh, we will thereby uh, save the House any kind of, of controversy over this particular uh, section. The second amendment I have addresses what I think is a void in the House bill and that is the promotion of private sector technology development. Uh, I would have a 15% investment tax credit to spur increased use of oil and gas enhanced recovery and exploration equipment. Uh, the private sector spending on equipment to increase accessibility and use of natural gas would also earn the credit, as would clean coal technology equipment uh, and renewable and nuclear uh, generating equipment and equipment used to make alternative fueled engines. Uh, finally, the credit could be earned uh, for increased energy efficiency and manufacturing manufactured products. Uh, and uh, I think that this would uh, enhance the bill. I understand that there are some jurisdictional questions on it, but uh, it seems to me it's something that the House uh, really ought to uh, make a decision on if we are going to uh, really look at what we do need to do for our energy future. Finally, uh, Mr. Johnson of our committee uh, ha also has an amendment to address the $5 billion of increased spending in the Science Committee titles. Uh, Mr. Johnson offered this amendment in the committee, and he got 20 votes in our committee for his amendment. Mr. Johnson's amendment would limit the overall spending to a level provided for in the House passed budget resolution with inflationary growth in the out years. As I understand it, uh, the chairman has no objection to this amendment being offered. I certainly would urge you to offer it. And in fact, the chairman would have a substitute amendment, which he's described before, uh, should this amendment be on, uh, offered on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Mr. Davidson? Mr. Falls? I mean, Mr. Salt, excuse me. It's okay. Uh, 
I was sorry to come in late and uh, uh, tell me what happened with the uh, with the overfunding that was involved, Mr. Walker. I think you were. Is this something that's been that's, negotiated? That's what we're trying to negotiate uh, right now uh, between the two of us. That's the amendment I, I talked about. Uh, uh, if if in fact you allow that amendment to be revised, I, I do believe that Chairman Brown and I are very close uh, to uh, having an agreement, uh, and uh, uh, it's matter right now of basically working out some matters within individual accounts rather than the overall figures. I think we've we've arrived at an agreement there. Mm -hmm. We just need to figure out some things in the overall or in the, in the individual titles. Uh, once that done, we will have a combined amendment, which I think will okay. relieve some controversy. You realize we're going to try to wrap up this hearing around 4 o'clock, which is about 20 minutes from now, and uh, there'll be a recess and uh, before we put the rule together, so uh, uh, expediency is what you need. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, want to congratulate my friends again and say that uh, as the two leaders of the Open Rule Caucus here, uh, we uh, look forward to another bill that you'll bring forward calling for that. Gentlemen, thank you very much. The Honorable Bed Cadden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask unanimous consent that my entire record uh, be part of the record. Gentlemen's entire record will appear. On, the statement will appear on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've asked the uh, Rules Committee for an amendment to be made in order that would strike the alternative minimum tax provisions uh, as it relates to oil and gas industry, uh, as uh, recommended by the Ways and Means Committee. That that amendment be made in order, and I appreciate this opportunity uh, to present my argument to the committee. I would also like to make part of your record a letter from. Uh, uh, five of my colleagues, in addition to me, uh, supporting this request, Congressman Rangel, Congressman Moody, Congressman Stark, Donnelly, and Pease. The AMT provisions that were included in the Ways and Means uh, report are not energy-related issues. They're tax relief issues. They deal with providing certain tax relief to oil and gas con uh, uh, companies. The need for relief on the alternative minimum tax is not restricted to the oil and gas industries. In fact, the bill that was passed by the Congress and vetoed by the President did provide AMT relief generally for certain industries. There is need to address this issue, but I take exception and believe it's wrong to single out one industry and to do it in an energy bill, and particularly to use the revenue that are totally unrelated to energy issues. Uh, in 1990, this Congress provided about one $1.2 billion of relief to oil and gas industry through the AMT. This bill would provide another $841 million of relief over the next five years. But Mr. Chairman, it's funded in the most unusual way as it relates to energy. It's funded by using three revenue provisions, Section 2034 extends disclosure of certain tax information to the Department of Veteran Affairs. Section 2035 expands the 45-day interest-free period for certain tax refunds. And Section 2036 re re requires reporting of tax payer identification numbers and seller finance mortgage transactions. This last uh, provision raises about a half a billion dollars. The Coalition of Real Estate Development Groups have expressed their opposition to it because they believe that that this revenue should be used to provide the relief against passive losses to the real estate industry in which a majority of members of Congress uh, have supported providing some relief. I, I don't object to providing relief on AMT to oil and gas. It should be done in conjunction with as we provide relief to all industries. We shouldn't be using the funding of these provisions to finance those particular changes. Mr. Chairman, this amendment is not part of the finance package that came out of the Ways and Means Committee. In fact, the Ways and Means Committee originally rejected this amendment. It was reconsidered and passed by one vote. I would urge the committee to allow the House to make the decision on this since it is totally severable from the other issues. This is a matter that should be determined by the full House. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Any questions? I have no questions. Mr. Frost. Mr. Cardin, I understand your testimony, but of course it is an energy matter, 
I mean, the question is, are we going to take steps to become more energy self-sufficient in this country? And uh, you've got to provide some tax relief for domestic oil producers in order to accomplish that. This is appropriate, uh, appropriate piece of uh, uh, legislation uh, to be in this bill. Now, you may question the wisdom of it in terms of its tax revenue sources. Uh, I, quite frankly, have heard from people on both sides, both my friends in the oil and gas business and my friends in the real estate business. And I understand the issue that you're making, but this is certainly an appropriate provision to be in an energy bill. It's, 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 I don't know where else you would put it if you didn't put it in an energy bill. I should go in a tax bill, the, if I may take exception. But you have a Ways and Means uh, section to this bill. It's not like right, this is the only thing energy. that came out. Well, this is directly related to energy also. No, it's related. The alternative minimum tax is an alternative way of taxing corporations who otherwise would not pay as much taxes. The, the way that it is calculated and the use of the oil percentage uh, drilling, intangible drilling costs and oil uh, depletion allowance, percentage depletion allowance, is not at all related to the energy issues that you're trying to get at. It is a simplification on the use of AMT uh, to make it easier for oil and gas companies and to reduce some of their tax burden. But it's not related to the issues you're trying to get at energy. It is general tax relief. Wow. I have no objection to it, but it's the same problems that oil and gas are facing in regards to so many of their companies being subject to the AMT rather than the normal tax rate is the same problem that just about every industry in this nation is facing. It's not an energy problem. Well, I guess we're having trouble with the English language because this, this, these provisions are incentives for people to go drill more oil and gas wells. And I, I don't understand how they don't belong in an energy bill, but I don't want to prolong well, this think, debate. Because, I don't think that the AMT they are, changes will impact at all the oil development in this country. Well, that's not what people in the oil and gas business in my state of course, of they, want tell me. they want $800 million uh, worth of relief. Not, it, I don't know. I don't, it seems to me that it is an appropriate measure in energy bill. That's all I'll say. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to ask my friend, how, how much energy does the existence of the alternative minimum tax produce? Pardon? How much energy does the existence of the alternative minimum tax actually produce? I don't quite understand your question. But well, I mean, we, we are, as Mr. Frost said here, debating uh, consideration of an energy bill itself. And I just wondered, I mean, does the alternative minimum tax actually help us attain this goal of domestic energy self-sufficiency, which we're pursuing? No, I don't think the I don't think okay. alternative minimum tax laws impact the the decisions that we're trying to deal with in the energy bill. Yeah. What it does, it collects revenues based upon certain tax preference items. That so in other words, the goal of, of creating that self sufficiency is not enhanced by the alternative minimum tax, nor is it hurt. Boy, I, I you know I'd beg to differ, and I'd associate myself with the, which I always do, with the remarks of the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Frost. Well, I, I, to the extent that our tax code causes problems for industries, as it does for all industries, then it impacts on their activities. My point though, on the alternative minimum tax is that the oil and gas industry does not have a unique problem here. Too many corporations are having to pay their taxes based upon an AMT calculation rather than their normal tax calculations. It was for that reason that the Ways and Means Committee and the House approved the change in the AMT as it related to a general change in the AMT law. And that was included in the bill that was passed by Congress and vetoed by the President. What we're doing here is singling out one industry to make uh, to, to provide simplification in the AMT and less taxes collected under the AMT when that and using revenues that was used in the prior bill to finance general relief to, to more industries. I find that a matter that I think the whole House should make a determination on. It is not part of the other matters that came out of the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Thank you. The Honorable John Kasich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, want to take a short time. I know you have a lot of members. Uh, what I'm bringing before the committee is a, another effort that I'm making in the area of what we call performance of these budgets. Uh, this is the way in which we measure performance of the way in which government offers. I'm going to turn your microphone so that everyone will be able to get 
Oh, okay. I, I'm not intending it to be brilliant testimony. I just want to make it short and sweet and hopefully get it through the Rules Committee. What I'm trying to say is, is that throughout the federal government, we have a lot of programs that have a lot of lofty goals. And what I think we ought to start doing with the federal budget is measuring whether these goals are met and whether the programs work. Whether they're in the Department of Defense, where I've just attached performance-based budgeting to a $70 billion program, or whether it's the programs, the poverty programs, uh, that we need to measure and see which things particularly work. In the energy program, we have a, um, a grant program that allows the Secretary of Energy to award grants to federal agencies for them to figure out how to be more energy efficient. The only thing I'm requiring in this amendment is that when we give the grant to the uh, federal agency, that the federal agency be required to come back in a report to the secretary telling us whether the savings were realized and if they were not realized, why they weren't realized and what, it, what can be done to make uh, things more efficient again. So in other words, those technologies or efforts or means that are used in order to save energy uh, that aren't working ought not to be tried in any of the other agencies or departments of the federal government. Those things that do work ought to be the things that we support, fund, and enhance. It's a very simple, non-controversial idea, but something that I think will allow us to make good judgments, not just on, en on energy programs, but if designed the right way, can be used to make judgments on all programs of the federal government. Just to give you an example for one quick second, I mentioned the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense wants to change the way in which they run their accounting system and it will impact over $70 billion in Pentagon spending. What we have done is we have forced the Pentagon to demonstrate that those goals, which are noble and lofty and right, uh, that those goals that they say they're going to meet, we're not going to just take the word for it and say, oh, well, you say you're going to meet these goals, go, we're with you all the way, more efficiency and everything else. We're saying to them, we're going to, we've established milestones and we've established reporting requirements, so they got to prove what they say. And that's the way it ought to be throughout the federal government. If we take a look at the debate going on in the country right now uh, involving uh, the poverty programs, I happen to support programs that give poor people a chance to not be poor. The basic problem that most taxpayers have with the programs is many of these programs don't yield what we want them to yield. So we've got to figure out how to measure them so that those programs that help the poor that work can be enhanced. Those programs that don't work can be eliminated so we're not squandering resources. And I want to try to attach a, a part of performance-based budgeting to every bill in which I have a chance so that this basic concept can be used. Now, I've talked to Mr. Bielinson about this, and in fact, when you folks had your squabble here a couple weeks ago on one bill, uh, Mr. Bielinson said he was going to support having the performance-based budgeting put in the bill, but things got uh, got fouled up up here, and you know I'm not casting a uh, you know. Gentlemen, I don't recall us having a squabble. Oh, okay. Well, it was just rumors that floated down through the grapevine. Well, you know, uh, you shouldn't uh, be paying attention to rumors like that. Things like that don't happen up here. I I appreciate that advice, Mr. Derek. It, it may seem that way. I guess from the outside, you know the way it is. When the Red Sox lose a few games, there's all kind of rumors that, that circulate. But anyway, I'd like to get this. Uh, we, we have most in the game lately that I'm aware of. The Red Sox? No, no, the Rouge Committee. Oh, no. I... <laughs> anyway, I hope you'll take a look at this amendment included. It's non-controversial. I've mentioned it to Mr. Dingle. I think he's in support of this, and uh, i just like to enhance this concept. I think it's good for the taxpayers of the country, and it's good for good public policy. So Perfect. thanks, Mr. Chairman. Wait till the November draft. <laughs> Okay. Do you want to? Eleven minutes to go. Eleven minutes to go. <laughs> Vic Fazio, Bob McEwen, Howard Wolpe, Richard, uh, Tom Delay. It's going to be very quick. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, I, I deeply regret, in fact, I resent having to come before you today uh, to propose an amendment which deletes what I think is an inane and unrelated provision to the energy bill. Most of you know that a mischievous amendment was attached to this bill in the Interior Committee uh, by a member who made no bones about his mischievous intent. 
this member set out to emasculate President Bush's Council on Competitiveness, a cabinet-level policy uh, shaping body. Uh, he drafted language that would place all the council's uh, debate, correspondence, and deliberation over uh, policy direction, however preliminary, in the fishbowl of congressional scrutiny and public opinion. And I feel very strongly that this would not only eviscerate the crucial mechanism of policy review in the administration, but would trample constitutionally protected boundaries between executive and legislative branches, and would, as I'm sure the pre the uh, chairman has been informed, force a veto of the energy bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm not going to waste your time by, by debating the merits of a provision that makes an unprecedented attempt to legislate the manner in which the President of the United States makes policy determinations and which further calls for unprecedented disclosure of cabinet-level debate and deliberation over policy. I just simply ask that you recognize politically, constitutionally, and sub substantively how important it is that this debate takes place. If this provision is left in the bill, we must have a debate uh, on such an important uh, attack, and I, I, I want to say political attack, on the privileges of separation of the two, two uh, branches. And I know the Chairman Dingell has offered the same kind of amendment as I have. Whether I carry the amendment or Chairman Dingell carries the amendment, I, I think it's imperative that this rule committee allow, allow that debate to happen. So I ask that you make either Mr. Dingell or my amendment uh, in order. Thank you very much. Well, we, we, he's asked questions, or we go on to the next question. Mm -hmm. No, I just want to tell the gentleman I, uh, I wholeheartedly support uh, your position as I do I, Chairman Dingell's. Uh, I think it's outrageous that it's even in the bill, and certainly we ought to be able to strike it out or have that debate on whether or not to strike it out. I appreciate your coming. I just wanted to ask, was this part of the, oh, I'm sorry. This is not part of the energy and commerce bill. No, sir. It, well, it's part of the interior part portion of the, of the interior bill, portion. Uh, but it has nothing to do with energy or anything in relationship to this energy bill and should be stricken. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Sir. Chairman. I'd be glad to yield to the chairman from California. Well, I take my credit for yielding. Uh, I just wanted to ask, this is not part of the uh, actual committee print. This is the amendment uh, package that came from them? As far as I understand, it is. Kind of, that came from the interior committee. Well, I certainly support the gentleman's right to offer this and hope we'll be able to include it. Thank you. The Honorable Richard Durbin Thank of you. Illinois. Chet, do you want the same amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand you've been sitting here and listening to the testimony for a long time, and I'll be very brief. Congressman Jim Johnson of Indiana is going to ask permission of the Rules Committee to offer an amendment to this bill relating to the subject of ethanol. Much of this energy bill uh, is concerned with alternative forms of fuel and energy, uh, which uh, may be useful in the future, uh, and I, I think could be of great value to our nation. But what Congressman Johnson is going to propose is that we include a provision in this bill that will mandate the requirement of uh, using a certain amount of ethanol in the United States and increase that requirement by uh, each year. I think it's a valuable amendment. There have been uh, upheavals in America's cities during the last several weeks. They reflect problems in our nation. They reflect economic problems. I would hope that this Rules Committee is sensitive to the fact that there are many similar problems in rural and small town America that may not be evidenced by burning and uh, violent activity. But the people in rural America need a helping hand. Congressman Johnson is making an effort through his amendment to encourage the ethanol industry, which I think has great value. A few years ago, I proposed a similar bill, and we were told by the Congressional Research Service that it would result in the creation of many new jobs in rural America to build ethanol facilities. It would lessen our dependence on foreign fuel, and it would improve the air quality in America. Congressman Johnson is trying to take this a step further. I think it's a valuable addition, and I hope that this Rules Committee will consider allowing his amendment and making it an order for consideration on the floor. It's very important not only for America's energy picture, but certainly for rural America. And I stand in support of his amendment. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? I have no questions. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.
The Honourable Chet Atkins of Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I come before you today to ask you to make in order Amendment Number 140 is amendment which I have offered together with Representatives Bill Rackus and Owens, which would establish standards for newly manufactured plumbing products to conserve both energy and water. Uh, this amendment is a follow-on to an existing Department of Energy program that uh, regulates standards for the energy efficiency of electric appliances. It's a program that's had enormous success. It will save um, a substantial amount of electricity. It will save even more water. It will save federal costs. And Mr. Chairman, in your own district, will save uh, tens of millions of dollars in Boston Harbor and costs of processing wastewater there in Boston. And Harbor. It has, the amendment has been endorsed by um, the Plumbers Union, the United Association of Journeymen and Apprentice Plumbers, by the American Supply Association, which represents most of the wholesale plumbing products people, by all of the major organizations in the environmental community, by the American Water Works Association, and I could go on. The, the only group that doesn't support it, uh, the Plumbing Product, um, Plumbing Manufacturing uh, Institute, and unfortunately, they're in a, a situation where the country and people are adopting these standards. Uh, all over the country in separate jurisdictions. And without this amendment, we'll face a situation where there's no uniformity in the standards for a manufacturer of plumbing appliances. Thank you very much. Let me say, Chad, I know you put a lot of time and effort into this amendment. I think it's a good amendment and needs to be a part of this bill. Thank you very much. We've got two minutes left. James Bilbright. Get under the wire. It's apropos, this is probably the most important amendment that you'll face today. That's why we saved it to last. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, amendment is to is amendment number 82, which is offered by myself and Congressman Volkanovich to strike those provisions in section 802 of the uh, of the bill. This is the section that provides for preempting the state of Nevada from uh, from their own laws in regard to the de Department of Energy, meaning the Department of Energy can basically do anything they want. They don't need permitting on water, air, and so forth in, in the jurisdiction. Uh, I have a long testimony, not long testimony, but I'd like to s summarize it very quickly so maybe the next person can get in. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this Congress has taken, in uh, previous Congresses, has been strong in affirmative in their action that the state's laws protecting their environment should be, you know, should be kept in order. And the government agency should not be able to violate those laws and should go through the permitting process. This, this particular act is unprecedented. It sets standards to preempt the state from giving those acts, uh, giving those permits, and, and going, making the, uh, the Department of Energy cross their T's, dot their I's, and do the things that are necessary to get those permits. The Department of Energy, in arguing before the Energy Committee, argued the fact that the state of Nevada had been dragging their feet and not giving them their permits. The uh, uh, GAO, though, in their report on this uh, particular uh, transaction and what's going on at Yucca Mountain, uh, stated in their report on page 7 that nothing the state of Nevada did uh, stopped the uh, Department of Energy from moving forward. In fact, it was their own fault and their own delays and their own unscientific uh, research by hiring unqualified people to do research that has slowed down the process. And as long as those permits were, not, were issued by March of 1992, and they were issued long before then, that nothing would slow them down. State of Nevada has certainly made them cross their T's, dot their I's, and do the things the right way. But to take this sort of action to preempt a state from uh, enforcing their laws is going to be bad precedent. It's going to be bad precedent across the board for other states that want to make sure that their laws are protected when government agencies, we just uh, uh, passed the uh, through this house the federal compliance uh, law, uh, bill in which we re reinstated in that bill that uh, the, the federal government agency should comply with the laws of the localities and the states. And I think it's very, very 
dangerous legislation and uh, I think that uh, we had over 40 members that sent a letter to the speaker asking this uh, from both sides of the aisle uh, asking that uh, that this language not be included the interior committee struck out this this uh, particular language and we had asked that uh, from on page 456 from uh, uh, line 22 through uh, page 458 line 18 that this language be taken out and that uh, if the committee decides not to take it out on their own which I presume they will not that they give us an opportunity to go to the floor because we think it's one that all the environmental groups in the country the Sierra Club the conservation uh, people the Wilderness Society all the groups are strongly in favor of, of removing this language and many business groups also and we understand that uh, even the, some of the nuclear companies are afraid of this kind of language that's going to cause problems for them in the future so we'd ask that uh, this be passed and Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman this is my birthday and it would be a great favor to put this in on my birthday. <laughs> Can you be quick, uh, Bill? Who wants to lead the Hello. song, Happy Birthday? <laughs> Hello. Just pass it Hello. in, Hello. Do you leave a complete statement with the uh, clerk? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have a statement I'll leave with the clerk as well. I just... Without objection. Um, I uh, uh, would like to urge the committee to uh, rule in order my amendment, uh, which would deal with the uh, implementation of energy standards, energy efficiency standards in homes being built around the country. I believe this is both a state's rights issue and an economic issue. Uh, traditionally, it has been left to the states to determine building codes to state and local governments. Um, states are in a better position to uh, uh, consider the differences in energy energy costs, weather, construction uh, markets, etc. Um, Utah, in fact, is one of only a handful of states which have adopted such uh, energy efficiency standards in their code. Um, so my appearing here has nothing to do with parochial interests. I just believe that it is a bad precedent for us to continue to uh, usurp the state and local uh, authorities uh, in mandating uh, specific standards. If it does make any sense for a mandated standard, I believe that it makes sense for uh, federally assisted housing. Therefore, the amendment that I propose would narrow the scope of the mandated implementation of the Model Energy Code specifically to federally assisted housing. Uh, also, a, a natural addendum uh, to uh, my amendment would delete the uh, call for a study by the Department of Energy for the feasibility of denying federally, uh, federal mortgage assistance to homes that don't achieve those energy efficiency ratings. There are also economic considerations. In addition to the state's rights perspective, uh, there is no clear-cut case that a mandate similar to the one required here is actually economically efficient. Even if uh, there are potential energy efficiency gains, the affordability question comes into play. Uh, there are studies that show a federal mandate of this type would increase the average cost of new homes by roughly $2,347 per home. That could have the impact of forcing people out of the housing market. Some studies show that could be as many as a quarter of a million people who could be forced out of the housing market uh, uh, through those increased costs. So I would um, urge the committee to consider or to allow this amendment to be considered on the floor of the House. Um, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay. All witnesses being heard, the committee uh, will be in recess subject to the call of the chair. Let's see if we can put something together. Members did not complete work on the measure. H.R. 776, the National Energy Bill, is expected to be taken up on the House floor later this week. Members will have the customary one hour of debate on the rule established for the bill and then a prescribed length on general debate.
C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are privately funded 